All right. Merry Christmas. Oh, Crumbo. That's right, everyone. Merry Mer Christmas jingle. to all. Yay. All a good night. Oh, look, Santa. Nothing was stirring. Not even a rimpin the rat. M Merry Chrysler. Oh, wait. That just got cut off. You don't know about rimpin the rat. Dang. Well, I think most people know about him. He's pretty famous and cool. <laughs> oh, okay. We were before the, before we started. We were talking about Rimpin, who is of course a rat. Yeah, he's like and a he was the cool cuddly dude. He was Things not, he, despite being a creature on this night in particular. Nothing, including him, was stirring. He mm -hmm. was not stirring. He's he's like he's chill a... with the whole Christmas stuff too. He, he doesn't like eat your presents or anything. He's just, oh, oh no no no. It, Rimpin knows that when the people have their little festivities and get-togethers, there's always going to be excess food that's left out and around. And or maybe he's just like the pet rat of the family. He's not just an unpaying tenant. Mm -hmm. He's just he he just lives in the house and he walks around and he just you know sort of eats with the family. It's Mel, Mel comes home, puts his shoes away and his coat, and then Rimpin is like, "Hey man, you see the new see the new Andor series." And yeah, and Rippin like, has his opinions, yeah. um, which is pretty neat, right? Like, it's not just a rat. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you, you, you have, like, a friend that can talk to you about all kinds of media. I wish I had a Star Wars rat friend. Exactly. Not Salacious Crumb, not him. He, uh, he, would, he would very quickly wear out his welcome because he'd always be going, Meh. How do you, well, yeah, you know, do it? Yeah. He most likely <laughs>, laughs when people are suffering too. So, mm -hmm. oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, because uh, this is our job, and we have to talk about um, things, modern media on a live format that extends for like a third of the day. There would be a great deal of suffering in my household, and there he'd be laughing yep. as we discussed how terrible Star Wars has become. Asterisk. He would be. Salacious Crumb himself. You'd be laughing whenever laughing. you switch on the newest Marvel movie, and you're like, "I haven't even seen the opening credits," and he's just still laughing. And you're like, "What?" I don't understand. You how keep doing he, that. How does he know? Stop it. Salacious and I, we <clears throat> would sit down together on the couch as we do, and it was his turn to pick the show. And of course, the little, the little rat bastard decided to pick Star Wars as he always does. I had mm -hmm. always kept up hope that one day he would choose something else to view, but uh, he said no. He said no. This will all be obviously be in his voice. You'll have to imagine that at home. This is the theater of the mind section of the EFAP episode. Yes. Uh, Salacius would look up to me with his ugly rat face, and oh. he would say, and he would say, let's watch this new Star Wars show that came out. That sounds it's called just like Andor. Him. Yeah, yeah. Well, you have to you have to imagine. No, this, I don't mean this, we all know like, the, the the dialogue. Like that just sounds like something he would say. He'd say it so blankly, and he'd have like a little would, smirk. He does have the smirk because he's sitting here going, "Ah, oh, yes, new Disney Star Wars. This will be terrible, awful, no good, very bad, disgusting." And well, I, mean, little... you know, I think that by bringing him up, you should probably explain like this has been going on for some time. You and Salacious watching Star Wars like this goes all the way back to when the OT came out, right? You guys were sitting there on the sofa and out it came. I really, and, I know yeah. it sounds a little cruel, but I kind of wish I didn't pick him up on the side of the road and nurse him back to health. Um, yeah, he's kind, of, he's kind of a menace. Uh, you, you know how bad he was with Jabba. Can you imagine in this post Jabba world? How mm. just off the chain he is, so well, to see, speak. But that was the most interesting time, right? When you guys were watching Return of the Jedi, and, and he was showing you his, because uh, that was obviously a documentary. And he it was, was a documentary like... about his lifestyle, uh, or or his. He, he's he's quite young in the film. He had a lot to learn. He got involved with some bad people. There was some money was needed. It was it, fun it, at it, first. Long story. It was fun. It was fun at first, but then it became. Well, he got tasered. He he got in too deep. He got in too deep. And he got out he of there. The, and he did. He did get out of there. That's what um, he unless to do he next, was, but... unless it was he on the barge when it exploded. But oh, I guess it doesn't matter there, because so like... was Max Rebo. Yeah, he Rebo's got out. out of there as well. Yeah, he's okay. I've seen him around. He's fine. Um, but yeah, you know, there must be some serious moral implications, I guess. Of like, was it? You know, what? How moral was it to turn the gun? On the barge and shoot it, you know, like all it, the people there who are just patrons, or is yeah, because I bet a lot of them were just like people, and there was like a party and everything. I suppose they're um, they're supporting a horrible system. Though. Or were they told that the people getting executed had broken the law to a very significant degree, and they were horrible, terrible, terrible people? And so really, you know, it's just the law of the land being executed. It's not exactly 
too fascist. I don't see Max, like, if we take Max Rebo as the example, right? Or the weird uh, snoot mouth lady, um, mm -hmm. or the weird, um, the, the brown one, um, wow. the, the, the CGI brown one, because his fur is brown colored, mm -hmm. which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that That's to fine. be, to have your fur be brown colored um, metal. So they, they were probably fine people. You know, they were probably just there to make a buck. You know, their music was good, recurring gig, nice and safe. Go to the Jabba's Palace house, play some music, sing your songs. But Maybe yeah, there'll be someone dropped in the Rancor, but it won't be you. Knowing much of anything about the context. I guess you'd know yeah. that Jabba is kind of a... Audrey you dude. probably would. You'd be an absolute fool to not know. You'd have to have just landed on the planet. But I guess, yeah, then. when you accept the job of going there to play music, you should know that some rebels might explode the place and you could die. So there's, I guess it's on them to a degree. There's an understanding that someone might get dropped into a Rancor pit. And as long as it's not you, which it's very unlikely to be, then carry on. Yeah, as long as you're playing your music nice and chill. Play your music, sing your songs, um... Watch just the goings on of Jabba's palace back in its heyday, those halcyon days. Um, not this madness that we get with what? What was that show? The Book of Boba Fett. Well, I was gonna say not you're that, jumping around the history, shit. right? So you and Crumb were watching the OT. The OT was pretty oh, yeah. solid and fun and cool. And yeah, this, yeah. It kind of kicked off a whole franchise. I don't know if anyone remembers it. It's Old Star Wars. It, it's Star Wars, yeah. Like yeah, sci fi fantasy uh, space pretty, opera. Yeah, that's pretty niche, though. You shouldn't expect everybody to know yeah. that. Is. Well, hence the science, intro. You have right? to be into science yeah, and right, fiction. Exactly. The it's, Venn diagram um, for that is pretty. Dude, wait until weird. people find out about the Y Wing. They're going to be going nuts. Why would we talk about a Y Wing? They would be saying. Because nobody knows what a Y Wing is. <laughs> so. OT's pretty neat, uh, you know, as, as stories go, it's it's uh, considered a classic uh, yeah. in more yeah, ways than right. just, you know, it, it as a thing itself in, in culture is a classic, but it tells a classic story, right? What, what a lot of people call the hero's journey, standard journey for a guy who's like, oh my god, uh, I'm unfulfilled, and then he gets called to action, and eventually at the end he goes through all kinds of tribulation, reaches himself a new, a new man, and... and uh, simultaneously, you know, the world is defended from an evil fascist government that, you know, it's something that everyone can feel pretty good about. It's um, and and it and it, it was phenomenal to say the least. It got like a huge amount of attention for not only breaking all kinds of records in terms of box office and engagement, but it's uh, it did a bunch of things technologically that impressed. It wowed people. Uh, rags and salacious wow. when they watched it on this little sofa they were like whoa this is amazing but on our it's not, a, it's 4K. not a little sofa it's a pretty normal size sofa no it's a little one uh, to me because I'm big to you yeah sorry okay I guess but it's just Always normal relative. size no it's small sorry. so all it sofas are small. small you not just say this mine was... isn't small <laughs> you're gonna distinguish this sofa not compared to other sofas but to yourself it's uh yeah I'm sorry it's a little sofa it's a little cute little sofa alright Okay, it is cute it. though. Uh, yeah, well, one one of us is cute, so oh. he's just is is staggeringly oh. ugly. Actually, oh, Rimpin oh, is there as well, right? He's quite foul. I've woken up in the middle of the night and seen his shadow uh, <laughs> creeping against the wall. <laughs> and let me tell you, his profile it 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 legitimately terrifies me. Oh, um, well, I should probably start locking the cage. Yeah, yeah, I, when I, I've I've woken up and seen him sometimes. He gets around. He's uh, he's busy at night, I guess. He does get um, around. Turns out he's nocturnal. Um, yes. Yeah, he didn't want to go um, out into the sun in Return of the Jedi, but that's why he liked being inside the palace because it's like it's always night there. They're always just having a great, you know, mm -hmm. nighttime. It's dark. Um. So and you, you get that landscape. It's all good. It's all great. There's all these different movies coming out, but Star Wars is this cool guy, and uh, they made three movies, and they were like, okay, that's good. And then uh, sometime later, the the creator of it, Mr. Lucas himself, was like, I'm gonna make three more. Fuck it, here I go. And uh, I was did. like, whoa, calm down, Mister. And for you, those you who don't even know, too much. We, we've covered uh, Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith uh, across EFAP's long, long history. Two differing yeah. results. We had different formats for them, and my God. Uh, what history? What history lay there? Oh my goodness! Uh, prequels. Oh, that was... oh right, I remember. They were they were interesting. They 
they did what you could easily call they could they expanded Star Wars, and I think they would have uh, increased its overall fan base. But they were I also think so. a little bit cringe. Mm. A little, little bit they were cringe, a little cringe. bit cringe. Oh, no. They were they Cringe. were all bad films as it but seems to be there was a uh, fun to them and there was a heart to them yeah just that, uh, and and so loads of things would spawn off and be generated they were like a catalyst for star wars content and adoration kind of interesting especially here in the generation of um a lot of the common sort of media commentators the prequels came out when they were in uh, more formative years and so they they hold a position of being discussed with some form of reverence, if not inspiration, for different stories as well as just foundationally, hey, it kicked Star Wars onward. It kept going. It Delicious did. It was, was sitting overall, there with you, still laughing a little bit though. He was laughing at it. He was like, yeah, yeah, he was. He was laughing. But here's the thing: we were both laughing. The prequels. That was the high point mm -hmm. of our. I don't want to say relationship. His continued <laughs> presence <laughs> in my own. Uh, but that that was a high point of whatever we have going. It is not fraternal nor sexual i rather despise him but that was the peak because we were laughing together oh we both know it's that's that's the thing right we all know it's bad right we both know i know and he knows but we both appreciate that look at this fun show look at him oh he said hi there oh my gosh there's dexter jetster wow that is wow incredible we had a yeah. good time laughing together we were united for a few moments and the third one ends, and it, it sits up right next to the beginning of New Hope. It almost, like, slap bang just is like, look, there you go. You don't need any more. And you're like, oh, okay. But, of course, Star Wars fans out there, including Salacious, were like, well, could we, could we maybe get some more? I don't know. You know, post-OT, pre-OT, post-prequels, pre-prequels. Maybe even during the OT and during the prequels. Why not, right? The Star Wars is pretty big. We could have more stuff. I want to see more Jedi going, vroom, vroom. I want to see more spaceships going, whoa. And, and then hyperspace and blasters and so it's like oh, more do more right and then along came a hero known as disney they were like you know what it, i we think you guys you, you need more star wars and evil old lucas is is only making that clone wars tv show we need him to make more movies right and like yeah and then they bought it and everyone yeah disney yeah Woo, disney. go disney so did, along did, came did, didn't they? The Force Awakens, which I still remember when that trailer came out. I was like, oh my god, this looks no, interesting and good. It's Star War. Can you was... believe that there's a stormtrooper and he took his helmet off and he's a guy? Dude. Oh my gosh, that might be a, a character. Oh, They're yes. going to do something with that. That could be really cool what they do with that idea. Dude, wow. Even and that opening, right? Chick? A shell-shocked stormtrooper? Holy shit, this is super mm -hmm. interesting. We should, uh, we should definitely develop all of that, yeah. And then... Like a heroic pilot who's captured but tortured by this new guy who is familiarly collect connected to Han and Leia, but... I, I like uh, how you said captured but tortured. <laughs> well, you know, captured can be good for some people, <clears throat> depending on... That's the true. I wish someone would capture Salacious Crumb off of my couch. <laughs> I, well, so I learned, it was so weird, learned, right? Because you uh, were like, you were chill with The Force Awakens, but he was cackling. You, you were like, Here's oh, the wait, thing. What? I found out why his last name is Crumb. Oh. He is a crummy guy. He leaves. Crumbs. He he just he crumbs everywhere. Well, um, don't don't ask me how I found out that his name was why his name was Salacious as well. Mm -hmm. Go for the dictionary for that one. But you see, we, we we got a position of like, oh that that was neat. Well done. I can't wait to see how this story unfolds. But like I said, there was Salacious laughing his ass off, and I remember you just being like, why are you laughing so hard? And it's like. We didn't know. We didn't know what was happening. Didn't know. You know, two years later, they're like, hey, want to try out this new thing we got right here? Like, what is this? Like, they call it this? the, um, the, 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 the final Jedi. Like, what? It was like, you know, like the last one. It was kind of like the sequel. I remember one of the initial thoughts everyone had about The Last Jedi that pissed them off was that it was a really bad sequel to The Force Awakens, that it fucked up loads of The Force Awakens. But then it was like, well, it fucked up loads of the OT. Well, it fucked up everything. Mm. It just fucks everything up. And at, at this point, Salacious Crumb is just losing it, laughing on your sofa. He's nuts. Absolutely I'm glad that he... I mean, I, I wish we all kind of were aware of the joke, or that we could get so much joy from this movie, which I guess we did, very indirectly. Mm. But, um, yeah. And it's getting weird. It's like, 
thought this Star Wars thing was cool, but I'm not sure if it is anymore. And so, um, you know, that's when, that's when uh, the Avengers assembled and we made a little podcast here talking about that thing. I wanted to know, you know, what is this going on with this Star Wars guy? You know, and we talked about a whole bunch of them. And, like, you know, Disney might not, might not be directing it in the best of directions, honestly. It's the, this, this Lost Jedi guy, he's not cool. Not a fan. And then they were like, well, we're making another one. Hmm. Okay. But Why? that won't come out before we get a little bonus one in the middle. Like, what is this? Solo. A solo story. And it was like, oof. Ouch. And at this point, I think uh, Crumb was like coughing with laughter. Right? He was just... He was... I, I was... My f fingers crossed. I hoped he died. Yeah. Um, yep. But... He wasn't laughing that, um, that much. So it's like, what does that mean? Well, um, the, the, the stories were getting really shit. Uh, and, and, and it was, it had gone beyond a joke almost. Like, this is, uh, getting really bad. And those sticky fingers were getting everywhere. It's like, man, you just, you just went both before and after the OT of fucking it up now. So what's going on here? You know, this is getting weird. Rise of Skywalker comes out, and because of the oh, dynamic, yeah, that movie, the atmosphere, yeah. it's just like, well, most people thought it was gonna be a joke anyway. And the thing is, it pissed off general OT Star Wars fans. It pissed off Rise of Skywalker, uh, like, like, uh, sorry, uh, Force Awakens fans, PLJ fans, and and just it didn't really have many fans of itself. Raylo fans liked it right up until the last few minutes. They were upset some... that the two so, got separated. Just... <laughs> Just to make it's, sure it's we're all on the same page. Is what it is. is like that's the rise of Skywalker is uh, what one would consider a clown movie. Nobody liked it. Everybody agrees it was terrible. Oh, Nobody remembers. Clown movie. I feel like all three of them were clown movies. <laughs> uh, I think that I think that the way to des describe it would be that for a while, The Force Awakens was not a clown movie. People thought, oh, you know what? That's pretty good actually. It's a return to form. It took a little while. Yeah, but we're in twenty twenty two now, so. Yeah, we're at the point now where I think people accept it's a clown movie. TLJ I, can't, I don't was find like anybody who likes that movie right? anymore. Yeah. Well, I guess TLJ is the 50-50 split. 50% 50 of people think it's a clown movie, maybe a little bit more. But then the other 50 call it like, art. <laughs> it's not a clown movie. It's brilliance is what it is. It's profound, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, don't get too upset about the continuity or whatever. I mean, this is a space wizard-like thing. You know, it's goofy. And yet I'll children, children yeah. really. Uh, or children. Things that they had to do to justify that this, the coping is what, the, the cope is unreal. Yeah. And there was no cope, though, for the rise of Skywalker. That was just, nobody liked it. Well, yeah, and, and it was but funny because I think the angriest people were the TLJ fans. They were like, you've destroyed everything. Well, yeah, and we yeah, were all like sitting the there like, how does it feel, uh, man? You listen to oh, the audience geez. or whatever, and this is what you get. And it's like, look, the audience didn't write that clown movie, okay? <laughs> like, it's not, Oh, yeah, I saw people saying it. I was to blame uh, for at least <laughs> the yes. for Oh, Star I didn't movie. realize that you were a co-writer on, uh, on the <laughs> Yeah, he knew what would movie. happen. He knew what would happen. But then it's kind of interesting because um, the, the absolute sort of decimation of, of the film side of... Uh, of, of Disney Star Wars coincided with the beginning of the uh, of the streaming side of Disney the Star Wars, which is now the prominence. The Ultimate Mandalorian season one episode came out. Was it a day before Rise of Skywalker? Yes, a because it had two, the yeah. it had the Force healing um, to coincide with. Yeah, uh, so that it probably set it up. And, it. You know, we understood yeah. it to be completely. Because that's in what canon. it means to set something up. That's how it works. One yeah. day before the film comes out, I genuinely think that was um, got to be up dampen, on the lore. Dampen the blow of being like, we're going to introduce a whole ass new force power mm. that changes everything. It's like cool. The thing is, is you know that the new era of like streaming for Disney Star Wars was received a lot more favorably. Um. You know, people people thought Mando well, was yeah, pretty we, good. If we think back to those times, Mando season one, uh, we we were not happy, and uh, a lot of other people, dare I say, most other people were like, "So you guys have got that issue, then, have you?" And we're like, "What?" And it's like, "You guys are just gonna hate whatever they put out in order to try and benefit from that sort of dynamic." Which you're is, not um, you're not being really, honest. You're just trying to bank on hating. Really it's awkward. Like, no, no, it's, it's just yeah, bad. Actually, <laughs> well, I mean. It's, I mean, the, 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 the thing with The Mandalorian was the first couple of episodes we were all right with for a time. 
Um, I watched them again. And the longer that it went, well, yeah, because now the, we the whole turned thing pretty quick. Yeah. Bad. But I mean, it was by the time we hit episode four, it's like, uh oh. We'll oh, yeah. Up. Four was we're back to the first time on our first viewing of the season one of The Mandalorian, the show by the Disney. Um, mm -hmm. We thought episode one was good or pretty good. Episode two was it's fine. Uh, not as good. Episode three. Uh oh, we're getting really shaky Ooh, here. And yeah. episode four was yeah, I was done. Pledge. I was done oh, after back. three, but I remember me and Rags like absolutely despised four. Thought it was a complete four disaster. Was god awful. Mm. And then we watched it again about it to see if we were sane. Um, yeah. Just to be clear, it it's bad from the beginning. It's always been bad. Yeah, episode one's really, really bad too. It's just it, that yeah. it. Mm. Yeah. Sort of slink by, I guess. I think uh, it's really fine because we were just of a new thing. And I think something that was really lame for me with The Mandalorian was something that I've wanted from Star Wars for a long time is to get some stories. Now, of course, they exist elsewhere, right? Like a video game. <laughs> to get some never... stories. I, stories. I wanted, I wanted, just ended yeah. you. I wanted some of these bigger stories to actually, like, move away from the main line story of, like, Skywalkers and Palpatines and and the solos, like that main storyline, and to focus on this massive universe's other stories with characters who don't really have much to do with that mainline story and Jedi or anything. And The Mandalorian seemed like that was that had the potential to be that, right? It's about a bounty hunter traveling around the galaxy, doing jobs for people, coming into contact with all sorts of different groups, going to different planets. That that would be the promise of that uh that show. That's not what I got <laughs> at all. Nope. Well, yeah, um, and, and I just want to let everyone know. It was like the, the the that was felt as though it was the finally a step in the right direction, finally saving Star Wars. When we were like, so this is just empty, and it's mainly appealing to like things you know. Um, when we were we were almost on books, we were like, this is going to be more substantive, right? They're showing yeah. the Empire struggling. They're showing. Um, you know, there's characters who exist in this world beyond the grandest struggle. They're just trying to get on with whatever the hell they're getting on with. And it's like, that could be interesting. But Manda 1 has the same problem as Season 2 with the the efforts of trying to sort of uh, get through the time code while convincing you a story is happening when it's not really. Yeah, because they don't really mm. have much to say. Like, who is the Mandalorian, really, after two a big two problem seasons? with it. He's, uh, and a few episodes in Book of Boba Fett. Most characterization we got was he's bigoted toward droids. Um, Until he was wasn't. Extremely inconsistent. Then was gone. Wasn't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like, it's not even, it's not even something that I describe as much of a character trait as it is like the way that it's used. It's just like a fun fact that gets removed. Kind of. It's a fun fact that they sort of forget about. Um, and I remember, being like, Holy remember shit, at the end. It's because the droid, like the separatist droids would have attacked and killed his parents. That's, that's great. Okay, that's something. That's There's something. a lot, more, yeah, that's a lot something. more for us to use there too, and it's referencing something we're familiar with and generally have a liking toward, right? The, it's, it, and that was, by the way, one of the earlier examples of oh, the prequels. We're not we're not shitting all over the prequels anymore. We're actually using them. Oh, okay, we're good, acknowledging cool. them. Yeah, we're well, acknowledging which, which their existence. Much, uh, just that's that's indicative of of. Uh... How far, how far Disney Star Wars? Well, at the it, beginning, they wanted nothing to do with it. They in a better were world, very, very much avoiding it. In a better world, it may have been considered respect and sort of repairing. Meanwhile, but in this case, it just seemed like it was pilfering. It was like, what can we yeah. use? Yeah, because yeah, they didn't like really the was more than what we made. It. They actually like the proof was more than what we made, so we should probably leverage that. Yeah, and it's it's definitely uh, uh, at this point that was foreshadowing for for what was to come, right? Because you go back then, and uh, we had heavy pushback. Um, we had to argue quite a bit in favor of the uh, of Mandalorian being a lot more flawed than people thought. But these days, oh, yeah. not getting much pushback at all for Mandalorian season one. Even people are like, "Hey, it was fun. It was neat. It was fine." But they will tolerate people saying it was shit because they're just like, "Yeah, yeah you don't because remember the honeymoon phase is it. over. It's the same. It's like it's, it's always the same. It's like, no, it's really good." And then uh, the a month or two later, yeah. actually, you were right. It's like, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> the Book of Boba Fett didn't have a honeymoon phase, really. Well, hey, That's you're true. jumping ahead a bit, right? Isn't it season two next for Mando? Oh, uh, yeah. But I thought we briefly touched. Well, yeah, season two was like bad. <laughs> well, so season two, it was interesting because our first episode, we got huge pushback. Ah, uh, yeah. Second weird. episode, sort of pushback. Third, it was, it was starting to slow down. And I believe I said it was, it was fifth. The fifth episode, people had like gone. Okay, shit, you were right, actually. This is pretty bad. It's like, yeah, it's it's just Cameo City, and they've got all of the hallmarks of shitty writing in the middle of their uh, yeah, what, mandated yeah. action scenes what, uh, and characterless fucking events. 
what season two firmly established was the 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 sort of the way that it was going to operate going forward, which is that oh, with Mandalorian because he is like a bounty hunter who travels around the galaxy, he gets to sort of but he becomes embroiled in the the struggles of different people that represent sort of different elements of this universe, um, and that can be really interesting because how does the Mandalorian react to? you know, this job that he has to take on that sees him doing this task for this group of people or that sees him have to go to this planet or, you know, interact with this faction, that that's something that you could have in a bounty hunter show in terms of, you know, developing the Mandalorian as a character. Um, that's not what they did. Uh, the, the realization was, oh, just have him meet, like, ah Ahsoka. Yeah, there she is. Oh look, have him meet um like Bo Katan and have him meet all of these other characters that we've we've seen before. Cause like that'll get people excited. That'll get people yeah, talking about. Because those are really great characters. Up. Yeah. We got to learn awesome. all about them. We did, yeah. And then oh, they yeah. also have Gus Fring. Of course, make, sure that, make sure that people are really excited and entertained by what's going on. We need to make sure that we have at least two action scenes every episode. Usually a smallish action scene during the first act of the episode. And then a big action scene at the end. That's the formula, and it is firmly established in in uh well, Disney in TV Mandalorian. And, uh... Well, it's Disney TV in general because the Marvel shows have a similar structure as well of like one action scene at least per episode, usually two. Well, and what's one um, small one in the first act, and then a big one in the third act. What's worth dropping a seed for is that we had knowledge as early as I think Mando season one. I want to say maybe even earlier of this show they're making called uh, Andor, based on Cassian Andor from yes. Rogue One, and the sentiment, of course, was why Andor? Like really? Why? <laughs> that guy? That 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 guy person who was in why? that movie? <laughs> and, and then and then it's like you know shows would keep coming out. You get like Mando and then Book of Boba Fett, and it's like yeah, Andor's still like they're working away. They've been they've been wor working on the script for a while, and they're about to spend a long time shooting it, and then It'll be long expensive. time like production. And it's expensive, yeah. And it's like okay. Um, Every time it okay. came up, why? Just why? 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 But they're yeah. really pushing forward on it. It's like okay. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, and as we know, like projects would keep being announced and changed. There was supposed to be a Boba Fett and Kenobi movie, but they both got scuttled into TV because shows. Because of Solo, yeah, Solo, right. um, uh, yeah, Solo fucked everything it. up. But to be fair, yeah. it was Solo and TLJ that one-two punch. Just... Uh, I think, yeah, it is the one-two punch because Solo probably would have been more successful if it weren't for TLJ. It, like the Star Wars fandom was very fucking confused as to what the hell they were being given, and they were confused as to what the hell they were making. Um, Though they had given, like, a set of resources and time to this other show that was off in the background, so... I'm feeling, you know, maybe they'll pop back up, but for now, it you was... Know, that wasn't, yeah, that wasn't people's... People weren't that interested. It's like, okay, yeah, and all, but like, oh, oh man, Book of Boba Fett! Well, so like, yeah, oh, if you yeah, remember, yeah, Mando Season 2, one of the cameos is Boba Fett himself. He's it's like, Boba oh, Fett, I'm so yeah. cool, bum, 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 bum. The, the episode with him is so indulgent, it's hilarious. Like, he's, uh, he's just oh, yeah. unstoppable and awesome and so cool and just... And I mean, uh, that one, that episode in particular was emblematic or uh, representative of the, 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 the writing for Mandalorian. What was it that uh, Robert Rodriguez said? That, like, the script was, was not very long at all? Yeah, yeah. Was, I think he was given... I don't know if he said something like it was 15 pages for, like, the entire thing but it, yeah, the, like the, there was, it was huge chunks of just there's a fight here do whatever you want yeah uh, and and one of the things that they wanted was the 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 rockets on the the what was it the knee rockets wasn't oh, it yeah no oh, God, i don't remember, I remember the goodness, knee rocket was, that was that was pretty good though i'm that glad pretty, they kept to be honest that. with you that was probably more the, the more sensical parts of the whole fucking episode oh, <laughs> like yeah, just yeah. The, with the boulder if you remember well, the boulder just, it, having you know, it's like a sci-fi with tool versus I forgot I have a jetpack. Like, oh my yeah. god. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just gonna put that jetpack here and don't take it with me anymore. Well, it was funny, right? Because he doesn't want him to take his weapons off or even his armor. He's just like, put your jetpack down. It's like, oh. That's a really <laughs> weird and specific thing you want. It's like, yeah, so he can't use it, so he can't get to Baby Yoda when he's getting kidnapped. Yep. Um, even though they just left it on the floor right next to him, but he still couldn't get to it. Oh, and then, of course, yeah, just worth just highlighting in the t series of events, Luke Skywalker shows up, and the whole internet went wild, except for literally us. <laughs> we were yeah. like, boo, this is lame, but not Luke. Kid Walker also, um, out of character, 
but everyone like I, I remember us getting every... lots of trouble with lots of people they were like oh my god you hate literally fucking everything you can't actually like anything and it was just like it's really True. not that it's, we're making arguments as far as i'm concerned we're paying attention it's not earned it's bullshit and it's being used to distract you and distract it did people loved it oh yeah okay. yeah Lord, season two that's a good one in our books uh it ain't very loved at this point no um, not much at all um yeah because what came around know. next Book of Boba Fett and Book of Boba uh, Fett, yeah. what a fucking disaster! Bo, 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 yes, bo, bo, absolute, bo, bo, bo. absolute disaster. I think that's the easiest way was to describe it. Was that seven episodes? It. Yes, it was. Except oh. it was really five because there were two Mandalorian episodes. Two Mandalorian that episodes. That were, uh, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> they're the, it's the higher budget thing to look back on because one of the things that happened at the end of season two of Mando was that they basically changed the formula. They finally had the balls to say, "Baby Yoda's." Fucking reached its destination. Mando, go do your own shit now. Thank like, you. Okay. I mean, it's not gonna be good, but it'll be better because it'll we have can finally have something Yoda. built instead of wasting time going on weird adventures, meeting random people, and just having Baby Yoda go blah blah blah. blah. That, that's that's blah. all they've been relying on, and it I'm works by the way. Right? Endangered species. I, well, I love it when our protagonist, who doesn't really do much talking or emoting or really anything in any way. What they decide to do is to pair him up with a character who's pr not even really sentient and can't speak and really just sort of makes um, mm. baby noises and can't communicate with them. So that I was mean, an interesting creative great. decision. That's yeah. awesome. Really, uh, I appreciate but, that. But it's so cute. Rex, right. so yeah. cute. I, I don't understand. Uh. It fucking works. Like, there are people... I've been on several podcasts and discussions about, like, the, the Mando seasons, and first thing, a lot of... And uh, funnily enough, it's like... You'll, you'll never expect it, but it just comes out it's just like, yeah, but Baby Yoda's really cute, though. Like, it's just like, what does that have to do with literally anything? <laughs> no offense, it gives the story. Like, what the... But it's like, it's a really good distraction, and there's so oh, many yeah. of those moments peppered in. Like, Baby Yoda having the little spit up from eating those little, little pieces of food, playing with the little ball, and then, like, Mando has the ball. And it's like, that's so amazing storytelling. He cares about him. It's like, uh, sure... It's like, man, we're we're really limited here. We're scraping the barrel. We've just got nothing. Scraping. We're um, scraping. But he's, you know, Mando at this point, he has the dark saber. He has his super spear. He has like mm. all these connections with all these famous people. He's practically, he's like Ray. The intention with Ray in, in Force Awakens, which is that you are a Star Wars fan being put on a Star Wars roller coaster. That's what Mando is. He's gone and visited all these cool places and cool people and has all these cool objects. But he's not a person. Neither is Ray. Neither of them have character. And uh, this formula has worked. For uh, lots of projects, it's made them a decent amount of money. The reality, of course, I, that I would push forever is that you could have made so much more if you actually had characters. This cynical, like, we're going to build an audience insert so that people can just feel through them. There's loads of stuff behind the scenes of J.J. Abrams saying that, right? Like, when you when you see Rey using the Millennium Falcon in The Force Awakens, it's supposed to feel like a roller coaster of you riding the Millennium Falcon. Hence, her lack of definitive and defined or traits and corners is that you can more easily staple yourself onto her. You're experiencing the Star Wars world as a fan. And it really worked. Um, and so they've sort of been like echoing that that approach. And JJ does it in a lot of his stuff, right? That's why at this point he's like the fucking undertaker of franchises because he he converts them into McDonald's and then they die. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, and, you know, at first we were only seeing the McDonald's portion and, and kind of like, you know, having that one time off McDonald's can be nice sometimes. You're just like, oh, it tastes, it tastes pretty good. It's satisfying. But then, but then when you yeah. eat it like 10 times in a row, you're like, fucking hell, I want to die. Like, oh I actually God. want to die. <laughs> this is horrible. I think I am dying right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and so season two closes out, and uh, Boba Fett is well into its its uh, its tenure. And there he is. He pops up again. You're like, oh, this, I guess it's a fun cameo. And it's like, no, it's not a cameo. It's an episode of Mandalorian. It's, it's yeah. everyone called it this. And everyone said, like, how come it looks so much more expensive? How come it feels like it's shot by different people? How come this has, like, got nothing to do with Boba Fett at all? It's one of the most, mm. I think, when we're watching it, it's like, I don't think I've ever seen this happen before. This is actually bizarre. And yeah, I would love to get shit. more notes on the production of Boba Fett, because I imagine it's a fucking disaster. I imagine all of it was a slap job that, like, like just came together in the end, and they're just hoping people don't notice. Um, it yeah. did have that, yeah, kind of vibe to it. Like, they're like, it has that, oh shit, we need a sequel, hurry, 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 kind of vibe to it. Crazy shit. Um, and the Mando episode, I think that was the one we said was the best one, right? It still wasn't uh, good, yeah, I don't was. think, but we said it was yeah. the best. Yeah, the it wasn't episode good. episode is the one that doesn't have your main protagonist of the show in it. Well, uh, we say it's 
I think when we said it was the best, it was like because the first ten minutes kind of felt like we were doing something interesting. Yeah, yeah. But uh, like the, we were the, kind of exploring and going places and doing bounty hunter stuff. Yeah, just and, being and, a bounty hunter in a different place in the world, which was enough for us to compliment it, even though we're still desperate for character. Yeah. Um. Uh, but the, the the absolute craziest part of it all was that uh, by the time you hit the end of Boba Fett, you find out that Luke was training Baby Yoda. It doesn't go that perfectly well, and he just teams back up with Mando. Yeah, uh, and they make sure to ruin Luke again, because they can't help him. Every time Disney decides to show Luke, they ruin him. Like, every him fucking, fucking time. a creepy weirdo that is an absolute, like, reckless idiot. And and the problem, of course, was people. some people were like, you're ruining Luke, and other people were like, well, they're setting him up for TLJ, aren't they? Because he's he's a reckless idiot in TLJ. It's like, oh my god, this is just well, the worst. Whole, this is absolutely the worst. It was all Grogu. Don't have emotional attachment stuff. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's that, it was that kind of shit. Grogu, you have to choose hey, your little baby or make this. Armor. Yeah, exactly. Make this choice. Like, oh well, I'm gonna you, do the emotional thing infant. because I'm an infant <laughs> and I want to see my friend. Yeah. Um. So, Mando season three is on the way, and it's we're back to square one. Unfucking believable. Um, that we've like Mando season one and two are fucking pointless. I don't know why we would have seen them, uh, except maybe because we're gonna have drama with the whole dark saber thing. I guess nice. we needed to know about that, which is that always seemed dumb to us anyway. So it's just like, all right, fine, we'll be there eventually, whatever. But um, and th this is almost caught up to the timeline. We had one new awesome cool thing coming out, and you're like, what? Well, what is this? And it's a okay. TV right. show. Based entirely yeah. around Obi Wan Kenobi. Yeah, people oh. have been asking for that for ages. Between oh, the wow. prequels and the OTs. Oh my god! Finally, finally, finally. we're yeah. bringing in life. Ewan McGregor, who's the perfect what? age to Yo. play. This is this is just oh, this is everything. This is so good. That is so cool. And he's even producing it. He cares a lot about this. This should be awesome, right? And unfortunately, you find out right. that some people are asking whether or not it's worse than Boba Fett. Oh no! And I'm you know that if you're asking that. Holy shit. <laughs> we're doing something wrong. Man, that show... Because I even think the trailer, we were like, there's a chance. <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's a chance. The foolest... The, the, the optimistic fools that we are. Uh, so, what happened? What can we say? Uh, the... the hmm, it's... They had an idea, and they fucked it completely to the point where mm -hmm. uh, we want nothing but for that to be decanonized. And it's so sad because they had every resource they could possibly want. Oh, yeah. They even did the thing. The thing of, you can de-age these guys pretty easily and actually create new prequel content. You could. It's not too hard. Imagine the amount of meaning you can add to the prequel era and the OT era by doing that. They gave us, like, one scene, and it was... Um, Fuck, I remember taking so much issue with it. It was like he was trying to teach Anakin that you're too aggressive or something and it makes you miss... I can't remember. Makes, makes you lose. No, actually, Anakin just won the fight. Yeah, didn't he, he win the fight that he's just like, you just lost? Yeah, because he won, he was like, uh, you just think we were done. Actually, no, so now you lost. Like, No, you just extended the fight yeah. because you <laughs> said it is not over now, even though he was winning. Don't you get it? Reflects the modern times because Obi Wan, <laughs> God, the amount of—I I don't even know where to begin. We have coverage on it. It was eight hours in total, I think. The supercut. It was absolute fucking disaster. Hated it. And my God, it's testing the ability to remain in any way, just just invested or competent with it within this, uh, confident in Star Wars. It's so bad and like why well, i mean i think it's safe to say right like is you know by the time that we got to obi-wan kenobi and it was done it's like man it's just all been shit yeah like it's, it's all been really bad when... and it's it's been all bad in 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 a, some sense in different ways like in terms of capturing different ways that it could be bad spread across you know a huge amount of the timeline at this point of just like damage that's been dealt dealt to like star wars as a as a story like as a broad universe um, yeah. there's only so many times, right, that you can, like, show up for something and then get kicked in the nuts, and then it's like, so, looking forward to the next show? It's like, I it's, don't know, man. It's, <laughs> it's only so long until they start saying, so, ready for the next nut kicking? I mean, a uh, Star Wars show? Yeah. You have, uh, maybe someone be like, so, how are you still watching Marvel movies? And it's like, well, that was actually kind of the thing. We, we talked about this well before Phase 4 <laughs> even came out. How do you destroy Marvel? It's like, well, you've got, like, 20 characters you've built up, uh, ranging from, like, solid to great, so you gotta... You know, there's a lot of work to be done to bring them all down, and then you've got the will and to just destroy. Four, and, you know, uh, 
plot lines to, to annihilate. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and Sis, 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 Phase and Four, 4 has happened. been making quick work of, of just getting rid of everything. If the MCU had a health bar, it went from, like, you know, like, stable to just... it's it's. I was about to well, imply I mean, it's on, like, a lifeline, but it's like, well, no, it's dead. It's, it, it is yeah. dead. I think, I, think, I think it was... By the time we got to Black Panther Wakanda Forever, I think all of us were just like, all right, so I guess we gotta... Yeah, we should yeah, like, probably, like, the point? check well, it out, for, like, for coverage, just to make mm -hmm. sure that we've, you know, still got, um some sense of you know just it's it's such a big story in terms of pop culture that it's like uh, it's probably worthwhile to you know know what it's like and yeah, just sort of this keep is an our eye job it, right? and like, upon like reading as for any job. any investment in and in actually watched it like upon yeah. reading about like uh the avengers team constructed by falcon fighting the thunderbolts at some point i remember, I, I just thought like i don't even like, I don't even know what I don't, begin I don't about how much care I care about these characters. I just don't care. Yeah, like, I, what I the hell does any of that mean? I don't know. Yeah, I don't I, care. I don't even care about the world. It's like, oh, Ant Man, Quantum Mania. We're going to the Quantum or it's Like, okay, I guess. I, I don't know what that means. I is don't know. It's going to be bullshit. The writers. It's going to be nonsense. Right? Yeah. And I know it at this point because, like, the way that Marvel makes movies seems to be just like incompatible with consistently good storytelling, and I think that Star Wars has been basically falling into that, um, into that category, right? Mm -hmm. Of you need to consistently. I, I mean, formerly it was we need to deliver a film a year, and we saw where that led, and then it, it became we need to deliver like a Star Wars show like every six months to a year. We need to consistently be delivering stuff for the streaming service, and you know what, like four shows in, yeah. <sighs> You know, like it's not not a great result. Um, <laughs> Big it's terrible. Show. Um, um, yeah, and the point being, of course, that that's how much work it took to destroy that story. So, how much work should it take to destroy Star Wars? It's like, well. You gotta kill the main big big uh, three from the OT, being Han, Luke, and Leia. So that's been done by the sequel trilogy. It was, it was pretty much uh, I never exquisite even work. And then you got well. What about like the foundation of what was achieved in the OT? It's like the the destruction of this big evil force, or at least the uh, dismantling of it. And it's like, well, they were all back in an instant, and then they were brought down again. So just it made it feel like it was pointless. Um, what Anakin did, it, his big old like move with his arcs just like palpatine didn't even die man like and the the, the fucking empire came back and it's just like so oh we're, we're in a really bad state it's like well prequels the value you drew out of them is sort of like a big building setup to how we got to the ot and how they were how palpatine was subverted it's just like well the kenobi and boba fett and mandalorian shows are all just like snipping away at everything we could draw out of it for being valuable the world building where do i even begin it's just <laughs> like it's so fucked, and so like it's like wh what is left for Star Wars? Because like it's not as big uh, in terms of story scope, in a sense, as the MCU. It, there wasn't as much to destroy. I say this knowing, of course, that Legends was completely decanonized, right? So I'm discounting that, even though with it that would have arguably have been the like Star Wars fans had trouble with that one. I don't blame them, right? Because they were very invested in all those stories, but they're all gone. But, like Star Wars is much smaller, and of what was left, it was destroyed, and it's like this dwindling IP that I was incredibly passionate about. But, you know, um, we find out, like, we're just doing our, our thing, and it's like, Andor's coming out, by the way. And it's like, oh, shit, right. Uh, oh, yeah. I can absolutely say that it was just like, yep, this is the next Star Wars thing, but it's kind of registering on my radar as Hawkeye did. I'm like, um, I don't know, man. It's a guy who I don't really care about in a story that's not going to be too relevant to the main story, so... Yeah, I'll uh, you know I'll try I'll try and get onto it I guess. Um, and I find out you know it's coming out after or during the release of House of the Dragon, She Hulk, and Rings of Power. Of which... Yeah, it got lost in the shuffle. I I actually did cover five episodes on the Forge, but then it just stopped because we were also meaning to do the the recordings for that, right? Yeah, there's it, it, and then that stopped. Ideas, uh, not everything yeah. can be made the way that we intend, but. Because I was like, oh, I'm yeah. not going to watch any more because I don't want to get too far ahead, uh, right? Yeah, well, and, and by the time anything uh, else happened, <laughs> by the time time was available, we'd find out it's like, oh shit, the last episode's already out. Damn. Uh, yep. Exactly. Rip. Um, so yeah, uh, it's out, and we're moving on. Lots of things still to to cover, like God of War or um, Wakanda Forever, whatever else pops out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you EFAP fans out there, I, I'm seeing these posts every once in a while, like, seriously, they didn't cover Andor, what the fuck? And it's like, well, I mean, Andor's just been missed, alright, it's gone, bye-bye. Uh, especially, like, I'm just not that obsessed to catch all the Star Wars content after the fucking tenure we've had, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, whatever, it's like, maybe, maybe. 
And then, you know, like Moon Knight, for example, a lot of things have the fate of Moon Knight. The, the, the Moon Knight was the closest... Moon Knight is Icarus, basically. It, it, it got the closest, but it fucking died. It, it didn't get its coverage. <laughs> um, but, you know, people still like, Andor, Andor, Andor. And then something weird happened. Uh, Drinker watched all of Andor and said it was really good. I was like, what? I would have thought he would hate... He would more likely hate it than even me. I, I, I was like, oh, okay. And then I hear some other people like, it is good. You just check it out. It's just different. It's not the same. And one of the things that we noticed about, you know, the production of Mando, Kenobi, and uh, Boba Fett... They're all, um, I'm pretty sure, slathered in uh, Filoni and Favreau uh, sticky juices. Juices, yeah, juices. Um, there's this new approach to making Star Wars content, or even just Disney content, and it is fucking factory as hell and gross and oh, yeah. fast. And we were like, I don't want to watch more of that. And then it's like, well, it, it, it wasn't made in that era. It wasn't made by those people. It's a way higher budget, way more deliberate production, and it's got basically nothing to do with all of them and it was set in motion well before those ones were yeah because apparently this has this was started be almost before everything else that came out right i imagine it was inspired soon after rogue one the movie was done. yeah um and so it's like oh, yeah, 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 all right fine maybe maybe so we do all the ragnarok stuff and then i'm like all right guys go watch andor and then i watch andor and uh I suppose that is your forty-five minute history. <laughs> as, as if Ryan, you, how do we get here? As if the know? guys listening to this weren't there for a lot of that. It's like, <laughs> but hey, you know, well, for those who weren't, it. now you know all the context. You're an EFAP historian now. So why don't we do a uh, instead of left to right or right to left, we'll jumble it completely. Go. Uh, oh my god. Why don't uh, metal fringy rags me <gasps> or metal? Oh my god. Well, we'll just start with metal. Why not? That seems weird. You You're weird, and I'm weird too. What uh, do you think of uh, Andor? Relatively spoiler free. Relatively spoiler free. Uh, I think it it really showed that it was not made by the same people. Uh, I liked a lot of the dialogue. Uh, I think the story was fine overall. Uh, there's some some weird bits and bobs here that seem contrived a little bit, but obviously we were going to talk about those. Uh. I already want to go into spoilers and stuff, but I don't want to do that. But yeah, I. Uh, well, we got ten I'm, seconds I'm out of you. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was like, uh, the characters seem to be uh, taken seriously. Uh, it seems very deliberate in terms of what they say. When people talk to each other, they sound like they're talking to each other and not at each other, which is always a bonus. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I did enjoy it. Well. Wow. Okay, all right, fine. That's all right, because we are going to be here for many hours, so... Yeah, exactly. Uh, why don't, like I said, I don't really mind which order we go, but just right, for the jumble factor. Go all right, go I'll go. Wait, who... Sure. Who, okay, right. right. I, I guess it's me. I'll go. So, um, Andor is the best thing that has happened to Star Wars in mm -hmm. 40 years. It is bizarre to think that we had to sludge through... I also, we didn't have to sludge through the prequels, but we got the prequels. We had to sludge through the sequel trilogy. We had to go through two seasons of Mando, a season of Boba Fett, a season of Kenobi, and all of those are either bad to terrible. Um, we got the only thing even that might approach being all right is it's probably Rogue One, uh, but. We got Andor, and it is, I think it's really good. Um, I think it is a, a very solid, good, potentially great, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm settled on, on it being very good right now. Um, it is tonally and just creatively so different than anything else that we've got in a long, long time from Star Wars. This seems like someone had a very clear creative. Um, vision that they wanted to put together there is a wide cast of characters that are all different and all interesting you go to interesting places you talk about interesting things there's there's so much here to praise and it's got a few rough spots undoubtedly uh mm -hmm. generally with the plot and how some things get to being where they are but there's so much here of value that i was legitimately shocked at how good it ended up being 
I we all saw the first three episodes a few months ago, and then we got busy with all the other stuff that had happened. And just the other day, I watched the rest of the nine episodes in a day, essentially just in a straight line, and I was really, really enjoying them. Um, it stands. It is bizarre to call this Star Wars because it is so seemingly different than anything else we've gotten from Star Wars. Um, I'm very excited for what happens next. I'm I've got my fingers crossed, and I'm hoping that people are very receptive to this, that it is uh, successful, so that they are encouraged to give this team, you know, more time and the money that they need to finish the story and to keep going. So we will see how that uh, we'll see how that goes. So those are my quick thoughts on it. All right. I suppose I'll go next. Um, the it may be said more than once as we as we talk about it, but uh, I this is a time where I appreciate everybody's efforts to push me to watch this. Yeah, I probably wouldn't have seen it if not for this job slash being told to see it by more so fans this time than creators or trusted friends sort of thing. And uh, I did feel like it should be covered because we are, if nothing else, primarily Star Wars. At least that's what the foundation of EFAP was kind of built on. So it's like, and it's not, it doesn't cost too much to keep track of Star Wars when it's releasing one sort of thing per year. Like, okay, this is Marvel, which can actually get to be and will be overwhelming, um, especially with how shitty it is. So, like, fine, fine, check it out. And um, I mean, how could I not be utterly thankful for the fact that I have, I was told a story. Uh, this is the, sort of like a meme oh, yeah. that's sad, but it's undeniable in terms of almost category, right? Like, like the thing we were trying to go over earlier was the sort of nature of Mando and Boba Fett and Kenobi is that there's so little soul in, in, in the point that they want to make. They're more so dependent on just getting people to watch it and then move on to the next thing. Slash maybe be recycled into watching again, but to be entertained enough fleetingly so that it takes them to the opening credits of the next one. That's all they need to do. Uh, cameos, after credits scene, that sort of thing. This is a show that uh, I didn't take super seriously at first. Then I started paying more and more attention. Then I was like, oh shit, they've got points to make. Oh, they're doing foreshadowing. Oh, they're doing subtext. Mm -hmm. Holy shit, I, I forgot. Sorry, I have to put on my... I'm Our watching... They're changing, developing. Ah. I'm watching a story <laughs> mode. Which is very, it's very different, but it's almost the equivalent of what I actually do in, in terms of turn my brain off. When I turn my brain off, I'm absorbing less. And it's not something I do to enjoy, it's something I do when I'm just like trying to pass the time. Um, it, it's kind of like my approach with something like a, a Wakanda Forever, but at the same time, I still need the brain on for recording, uh, you, you know, like actual fucking information. I need to be able to actually tell you what the story was and what is working, what isn't working, but... Like I said, this show earned its uh, attention from me. And by the time we hit episode six, my mind had changed from being like, this is tolerable to, oh, this is good, actually. Uh, and then you hit episode 10 and the finale, and I was like, well, I'm actually looking forward to talking about it because uh, we've got something here that's really solid. There's lots of things I would tweak and change, but it's uh, this is the kind of... If this was released after the OT, I'd be very curious what Star Wars' reputation would be versus mm. after the prequels, versus after the sequels, versus after all of the shitty shows that came out. Something the Drinker said that I kind of agree with is, um, oh, if only this show had been the first show to release instead of all those other ones. Um, nice and early, get it out and let let it sit for a while so word of mouth can spread it around and then uh, mm -hmm. build from there. And take your time with the others so that uh, this one can work as a sort of a magnet for those who are just looking Star Wars content, while the other ones can be like, now that you've seen Andor, and you know the kind of power we have for storytelling, we are now going to tell one with Obi-Wan Kenobi. We are now going to tell one with Boba Fett. And you can actually like have people be invested through the characters, but also be like, oh shit, yeah, I'd, I'd love it. The story. And you find out, like, this is made primarily by Tony Gilroy, and I've seen his comments about constructing this, and let's just say it's a lot more reassuring than uh, the people behind the other shows who are just obviously just trying to make something to pass the time. Uh, like rush jobs. So um, I was quite impressed. Uh, what that'll mean exactly is going to be discovered over the next few hours as we talk about it. But uh, it was really cool to have actors delivering performances to see dialogue that if you read it several times, you might just crack a new meaning after the seventh. Um, characters, I, I brought this up before, they don't respond to the literal sentence. They respond to the subtext of the sentence because they're smart and they know what's happening. Um, but one of the things that really hit the fucking spot for me was a competent empire. We finally oh, got yes. an no. empire yes. that's not embarrassing and clowny. 
uh, they can be scary and they can be intelligent and they can be normal. They can be just a person that you know that made a rational decision. They don't have to be a cartoon clown who falls over after saying kill all the innocent people because it's good to kill innocent people. Like, mm -hmm. Absolutely, thoroughly refreshing. I can't believe this is coming from uh, Andor, man who died <laughs> in Rogue One that most people don't even remember. This is his story, so it's like, yeah. Um, yeah, that's my take. Fringy, take it away. I really like Andor. It's, um... It, it is, uh, I think, yeah, the, the, the key word is refreshing. It's like, we got a story here with characters, characters who were well-realized and um, delivered through, like, great performances. We've got, like, dialogue that's interesting. We've got themes that are running throughout the season that are compelling and explored thoroughly. We are provided a whole bunch of differing perspectives of characters on the status of the world and the empire and how each of those people respond to it. And through those characters, we get to see a bunch of different lenses through which we can examine this conflict, how people respond to something like the empire, um, you know, matters of self-preservation or principle, pragmatism, um, you know, the like power corrupting people. Um, we, we get to explore aspects of the Star Wars universe that have felt very much untapped for a long time. We get to go to new planets. We get yes. to see new things that we've never seen before, like new aspects of the Empire that we haven't seen before, new ways of life within the Star Wars universe that we haven't been able to see before. And all of it is just realized through, like, leveraging the tools that are available to them, you know, all of the money and talent that they had in order to realize this show with, like, really, uh, really great cinematography. I really like the soundtrack. Like, all of the aspects of, like, the production are working towards... Uh, bolstering what actually exists there, which is like a core. It's got a core, like it's got a story and characters. It has something to say. It has a voice. Um, and it, it's it's surprising, right? It's like Andor, Andor, like that guy. Yeah, that guy from Rogue One. <laughs> but but like it's it's almost as though because it was Andor and it was this project that's just been there for a while and it wasn't something that got us hyped up as something like The Mandalorian or The Book of Boba Fett or Obi Wan Kenobi that like. The people who are getting to make this show were given the liberty to actually tell a story, to like create something that they had an idea for something that they wanted to say and were able to realize it. Um, I really, really like it. It is, it is, it is without a doubt, like far and away the best Star Wars thing that's happened since Disney bought it. Like it's not even close. It it's like leagues ahead of everything else that they've made so far. And, and I'm really, I'm really, really excited teased. to talk about it. Yes, we have. It's been it's been pretty cataclysmic so far, the <laughs> Disney Star Wars tenure. But now we have Andor, and I'm I'm like I'm super excited to talk about it. I really really enjoyed it. Well, goes without further ado, we probably should then. The format Maybe something 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 to add because I I watched a couple of more episodes uh, before. I really didn't give it a fair shake, I think, when I covered it, because I was, like, in coverage mode, basically. I was like, oh, I gotta put that on the list as well. And I, I, I guess I didn't really pay attention properly, I don't know. Because I was just like, yeah, it's not bad, but I don't know. I was just, I don't know, I'm not really into this. And then I stopped, and then I uh, started watching it again over the week, and I was like, oh. I think I didn't give this a fair shake. <laughs> well, I've seen plenty of people in the EFAB audience say it's, it's not that good, it's kind of shit, so... It'll be interesting uh, to see if um, maybe we yeah. can change some minds, or maybe oh, we can yeah. discover the truth along the way as to how, uh, how good it is or how just bad us. it is. Um, yes, the format will be chronological. We'll go through and pick on sort of the more, I say, juicier segments as we approach, but uh, tell the story broadly. Hopefully provide mm -hmm. enough context for those who haven't seen it to follow while also breaking things down. Mm -hmm. um, Probably going to be a long one. And as I said, Merry Christmas for those who mm, are listening Crimbo. to this on the day of Crimbonius who maybe don't mm. have uh, a place to go or people to talk to. They're just... Um, Happy happen? birthday, Jesus. Yeah, good boy. You did it. What'd you guys get him? Uh, a fish a cross. and bread. I've heard he can multiply them pretty well, or at least turn them into mm. like that. It's Why not true. supply him? Uh... Yeah, um, I don't know. I guess we'll just get started with the... Uh, what do you think of the, uh, the intro? Um, oh, like the, right. intro, the intro itself, the, uh, like the opening title screen. 
it's confusing, and I'll explain. So the intro confused me, because here we are, after all that sludge we've been talking about, and then we have this intro, and I'm like, wait, wait a second, what's going on? Mm. What's happening? You have, like, a nice, nicely paced little developing mini story about this Andor guy, and then there's the alleyway sequence and the, you know, the group, and it's like, no, 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 no. Something's wrong here. The, the tone is like, it has one. And mm. the direction, like, it, it has it. And there are very clear artistic decisions that are being, shall we say, made. So I was very confused. It, it, it just, it, it's like something in my brain was like, are you sure you're watching the right show? This is Disney Star Wars. And yet here we are on this weird, almost Blade Runner-esque, yeah. um, slowly-ish paced, yet somewhat tense kind of setup. It was very strange, and I really liked it kind of from the get-go. Yeah, we were, we were already just like, wait, what? What are we dealing with? Like, this yeah. is happening. This, this, this is one of these things, because we watched those together, right? So the first three episodes. Yes. And it was one of those scenarios where we didn't really talk a lot about it, because it was just you know enjoying the the episodes like oh this is cool this is happening this is a nice little tone and it wasn't really anything's like oh look he just fell down and broke his kneecaps or something and I, I don't know uh so yeah it was uh it had a lot very... to um make up for because of his predecessors uh so yeah yeah there's a lot of just i was gonna say bad faith but maybe it's just reasonable it's like a lot of assumption of you've been delivering lots of poo to me now i've got this box uh, i assume there's poo yeah. in it um, but it's a nice box, and you're what? So. Not a fan of poo, so no, uh, not even like... mine. But yeah, it's a uh, it's dare I say subtle and simple. And I was like, yeah, okay, all righty then. Let's see what you got. Mm. Um, okay. A summary is he's looking for his sister, Mister Andor, on Molana One, a Priox Molana corporate zone in BBY mm -hmm. Five. I remember reading all that and being like, I ain't gonna remember this shit. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, no um, way. It's funny because like all of it will be relevant and it worth remembering in terms of just allowing yourself to piece together everything. But again, you've got to earn it, I think, from the audience. It's like, why should I care about anything you tell me when you don't care about it? And it's funny because it has to like I can imagine the creators of the show being like, Why do I have to deal with all the baggage of these other shitty shows? It's like because <laughs> you're a part of that IP, man. I don't know. I'm yeah, sorry. Sorry. Uh yeah, he tries to find her, and while looking for it, clearly annoys two other uh, off-duty patrolmen who are there. And uh, it looks like they have a sense of regularity with essentially bullying people to some degree. They just get a bit of fun out of it. Excise their power beyond its typical limits for the uh, fun of it. Um, and they sort of chase after him because he's a... Uh, Sort of smart talks to him a little bit, doesn't just uh, submit, and they get thrown off by the the girl he's talking to. He's just there to find information. Um, yeah, but he kind of accidentally pisses them off a little bit by being a bit of a rebel, you could say. What? And, uh, yeah, he gets chased out, and uh, there's this cool sort of approach to delivering this information where we're just with him, camera facing him as he's walking forward toward it, but then they call for him several times and you get like i think it's like a two minute shot of it's all just, just his, face. On his reaction yeah mm -hmm. yep. we all of the 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 guys who are approaching him are sort of blurred out and they're coming a bit more into focus but we are very honed in on how andor is reacting to this situation yeah he's basically like, trying uh, to ignore it if i recall correctly right he's just like well, i don't want any trouble really i'm just uh well i think he's thinking oh fuck what am i gonna do mm -hmm. like they're coming they're this way am i gonna run do i make a scene do i you know what do i do do i try and play it easy do i just hope that they're nice or you, you just he's just thinking what am i gonna do he's so you could tell he's nervous and on edge and he's like oh, and, fuck, uh, what i do it's essentially a robbery uh but it's like you could call it official robbery like they uh they basically tell him like you're gonna probably oh, so be taxes fine. then mauler i oh. know how you are oh they uh they're gonna want to hit him for a fine for where they he may have parked his car. They I think they're guessing at where he may have parked it, and it would be a fine if he has got it because yeah. he's heading toward that area. So basically, just an assumption on maybe a thing he did that would incur a fine. And he says like, "Listen, I've I've got like three hundred credits in my pocket or something." Like that. And they're like, "Oh, good. That's exactly what it costs." 
Yeah. Like, um, th th that's what it, I, I think there Yet is. Yet another plot contrivance. Ah, oh, can't believe it. I'd say that's exactly what they're going for, though, is that this is, this is absolutely bullying and stealing, but done absolutely. in a way that's being hidden up and, and dressed up as official and government legal. Like, it's, uh, and these this guys feel powerful and expect. right doing it. Yeah, it's power without the responsibility of, you know, of authority, which is something you all... Hmm. And they uh, they get nice and close to get the money, but one of them gets headbutted, the other one uh, in a fist fight until he loses the gun. And uh, Cassian finds the, the one he headbutted uh, either from the headbutt alone or he hit his head on the floor on his way down, but he's, he's dead. Floor, yeah. Yeah, um, which can happen. It's not unheard of. In fact, it's it's absolutely it's funny how much you see people get very hardcore punched in the face without uh, more lethal sort of results. It can, uh, yeah, and and then there's this super interesting thing happens of um, the remaining guy goes from being pissed and fucking angry. You killed him, you idiot, you psycho. Like what the fuck? And then gradually, like you know, I this this is fine actually. Don't don't worry about it. You know, this can all and will go away like it because he's he's realizing straight away the smartest thing for Cass to do now is to kill him too yeah and he realized that and he's suddenly like hey we can just go there we can talk about it. So, oh, it was an accident just a thing yeah, that got out of control thing. don't don't worry about it begging for his life yeah absolutely we, yeah and we're like holy shit well this is star wars doing this are we doing this in star wars is this yeah. happening well no it, nuts. It, it reminded me immediately of one of the things that impressed me about Rogue One when you first watch it, if you guys remember, he's he's meeting a contact at the beginning. Stormtroopers uh, find out where their location is. They've been they've been discovered and they're heading toward them. And the guy he's with has like a bad leg, and so he just shoots him, like uh, and then runs away himself. Like the idea being that you know too much about me, so if I kill you and get out of here instead of you getting captured and me getting out of here, then I'm better off. The idea, uh, again, Rogue One, I think initially it didn't end up this way. It was supposed to be about all of the greys of. Uh, Star Wars morality, because Star Wars is mm -hmm. oftentimes black versus white in terms of very obviously who the good and bad guys are. Um, yeah. But, the, you know, this approach is much more... And, and it's the same for the Andor show. It's like, was what Cass did here a good thing? And it's like... Uh, it's kind of hard to say. It's not. It, it's kind of what he had to do. Mm -hmm. uh, those guys were assholes. It's like, yes, but you execute the guy for what he did? It's like, well... Oh. I don't know, man. <laughs> like, you know, he gets out of there, and uh, this sort of moment is basically the reason for the whole season to happen the way that it does. Yep, pretty much. Um, yeah, and 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 uh, just a really solid start for uh, for atmosphere and uh, I guess character, and it felt very serious. Like we we haven't gotten this in some time. Everything's always so goofy, whether it be deliberate or accidental in in Star Wars, like mm. the the stupid multicolored bicycle things or the or the uh, the guy who does his 360 flip before shooting right it's really hard to take any of this seriously but when you see a guy in like a dark raining sci-fi world getting uh robbed and then he like unintentionally kills the one of the robbers and then has to execute the other one to save uh, himself from authorities it's like damn star wars what are you doing man yeah. you're doing pretty serious you're gonna be I'm able fine. to keep that up star wars hmm what are we doing are you baiting me are you trying um, to bamboozle me? Which pushes us on to um, he well he he goes home, which is uh, Ferrix. Is the planet Ferrix or is it the town? I don't uh, know. It might say planet. so in a subtitle whenever you, whenever the scene uh, goes there early on. I think but... the planet is Ferrix. Molana system, free trade sector. But I guess that's in terms of the galaxy, not even the. Yeah, um, sure the it's the Star Ferrix. Wars thing of the name of the planet is this one town that you only visit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, always strange, a little bit confusing, but uh, it's it's already neat. That it's funny. One of the criticisms Rogue One had, I don't know if you guys remember this, was that we went to like six planets in ten minutes or something, so it, it got confusing. But it was it's still. Like, where are we? <laughs> Help. It, it's still a better problem to have than oh Tatooine. Ooh, Tatooine. <laughs> oh, oh Tatooine. Oh Tatooine. <laughs> there you go, oh, Tatooine. I remember Tatooine. But yeah. Uh, oh, can we go to Tatooine next? I wonder what's of... happening out on Tatooine today. In a matter of 10 minutes, we got us two new planets with two distinct looks. Kind of like, oh, it already yep. feels more creative, uh, more more uh, free from the bounds of uh, typical Star Wars production, where I'm just waiting for that Tatooine set to show up. That one street, it always shows up. Come on, give me <laughs> Um, I know you want to do it. Just get it over with. Show me that dusty street. Show it to me. Do it. 
Uh, and yeah, so uh, Cass spends all of episode one basically getting everything in position so that he can successfully lie, basically. He's going to have yeah. to get everything in place. He needs a, an alibi. He needs to hide any evidence. He needs to move himself around in different ways, shapes, and forms. And we get introduced to uh, B2, I think is the name of the robot, right? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, he's a, is a fun, cute, interesting sort of thing. It's the kind of thing you, you get from Star Wars. He's not dissimilar from an R2-D2 type, but... Yeah. Dare Still I say, is... he's like R2-D2 with less courage. Yeah, probably. He's like a little, he hey, does. what's up? I was just yeah. Doing he's more scared about everything. Yeah. And, uh, and also he's, a bit rugged. Not, yeah, he's not, also not all the way. Not super efficient, lagging and, and uh, stuttering a lot. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and the, and the robot says, uh, Marva said you were out ruining your life. Um so we, we, you know, it's it, it the the kind of dialogue that you know that once you've seen the whole show, it'll make a hell of a lot more sense. When you first watch this, you're just like, "Who the fuck is that? Who are you? Why are you talking to him? Where is this? What's happening?" Um, it's just funny to think because in retrospect, now that I'm so familiar with the the worlds and the characters, it all makes much more sense. Whereas on my first time through, I probably would have ignored most of this. Um, but apparently, it takes more energy for robots to lie than it does to tell the truth. Certainly, this um, one. That's interesting. Which That's is interesting. Like it's it's um it's kind of true in terms of it, it is true for humans right it's more difficult to maintain lies than it is to mm -hmm. tell the truth because the truth is just remember as things as happened instead of remember how you told them but it's just uh, it makes a significant difference to the robot to the point of actually drawing out power um and it makes, he says yeah, there's... I have pa adequate power reserves for lies yeah this idea that lying requires a sort of impromptu creativity that requires more processing power maybe so you have to you know yeah, it might be an actual like brain a little bit yeah register a, a, a fact that overrides an actual fact in in the banks or whatever i don't know but uh either way he says i only need you to tell him one lie just don't tell anybody you saw me and don't tell anybody you know where i am and the robot just goes that's two lies I thought it was fun. <laughs> yeah. it's like I gotta tell two. Jeez. Um. Yeah, and then they start up uh, flashbacks, which I think what we'll do for the sake of this is uh, we'll talk about the flashbacks as a whole once we hit the end of episode three. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Because this is. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess to lay it out for viewers, there is a string of flashbacks that occur throughout the first three episodes that are showing Andor's life on his home planet, not Ferrix, but where he actually lived. It's his origin story. Um, yeah, essentially his origin Denied. story. Uh, for how you know, like, um, and and that like gets scattered throughout the first three episodes. Um, but yeah, it probably makes more sense to take it all as a whole later. Mm -hmm. So he heads over to um, his place of work and immediately gets yeah. to a friend and starts explaining what his alibi right, is going to so. be. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and like the conversation immediately starts with him just like laying out a set of events of like, oh, this is what happened last night. And of mm -hmm. course, his, his buddy immediately picks up like, uh, so what? what's happened? Like something's happened. What's up? Yeah. And, um, uh, and it's done in a way of the buddy just starts adding on to the story to make yes. it more believable uh, and even exactly. adds in how he got a wound as well. It's a really cool yeah. way of showing chemistry. It's very that, nice. Those guys are buddies and they're helping each other out. And something that was really neat as well is that Brasso, when he gets up on like the transport vehicle, calls out, like very loudly states something that uh, has to do with the alibi as well, just to, you know, a bit more firmly establish it. And it's yeah. like, that's neat. That's cool. You can immediately quickly, tell yeah. that they are close and they yeah, cool. look out for each other. Before. Yeah, this and this is kind of already <clears throat> giving us an impression when we're watching it, like, oh, you're like a real bit of writing. You're, you're not like a real yeah. story. You, yeah. you don't you don't you don't have them say, like, Hey, best friend, how are you doing today? Do you this remember? This is a closer when we... scrape than that gunfight on Sargasso Nine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was. Hey, let us step on this memory machine now and look at our memories. It's I a, can't a, believe a, I saved you. Actually, if I recall correctly, I saved you. <laughs> oh, you. We are, we are joking, <laughs> but in a in a Filoni thing, I would I would absolutely expect him to have introduced him as like, man, it uh, feels like I haven't seen my best friend in so long, even though it's only been a couple days, huh? And it's like, yeah, we considering how far we go back, it would be weird for us to have spent a day apart. Yeah, just, just hard to believe like that, that his name is Jim Davis. Yeah, <laughs> hard, to, hard to believe he has a name. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and then, it, and then it would be really simple. Like, I need you to tell me an, uh, uh, to re understand an alibi. Here is my note of all of the story. Re revise it and, and make it the alibi. Yes, I will do that for you, friend. Like, it would just be that simple. And you'd be like, okay. But um, they achieve what they're going for uh, while also giving us information that's not explicit. It's just like, neat, good job. And then we get the scene, I think, that all of us, uh, when we were first watching this, we were like, all right, what's going on here? Like, this, this is... Uh, <laughs> It is the corporate security's reaction to the two dead members of the Corpo team. The introduction mm. of Cyril. Cyril Yay. and his superior, yes. And this yeah, scene this, this scene changes everything for me like... in terms of like, all right, I'm listening. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, done. Like, oh shit, you're showing me their response? Three I, scenes I, as a pattern. All right. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I think um, it would be that I'm the listening. fact that the scene itself even exists is something, but the way that the scene plays out is kind of like, okay, show. Sure. Hmm, what are you up to? Well, what, are you up to? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> God, um, Cyril is like, uh, he's our security guard man, essentially. That's why I just keep calling him, but we'll try and call him Cyril because it's much more easy to keep track of him. Uh, he speaks really well, stands straight and tall. He tailored his uniform personally, and he's just, he seems incredibly on board and respectful to his superior, despite the superior seeming like he doesn't give a single shit about this. Sort of event. Well, yeah, his superior is comparatively pretty shaggy. Like his 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 uh uniform isn't ironed. It's kind of um desaturated. It's uh he's he's much more lackadaisical in the yes. way that he holds yeah. himself. Even before our conversation like really begins and we get to understand what's happening, you know, in this scene. But you already do kind of understand what's happening in the scene. It's all conveyed through all these little touches. Um, it's even the fact that like Cyril, he is holding himself well, but he feels a little bit awkward. Just a little bit like you're. Tr it feels like you're trying really hard to be like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To like stand, you know, back straight, held held up. Like it seems like you're exerting a lot of effort to make that happen. And then as the scene progresses, we see that kind of um, fault. You know, sort of waver a little bit at times. Like kind yeah. of, kind of um, the. I don't know if I want to say facade, but like whatever he's trying to do right now, it's it's difficult for him to maintain. Yeah. He's trying to project a particular image that he has not fully uh, become in in any way, shape, or form. No. Really, he just what is yeah. what he wants to be. Yeah, um, he also like took care of his like uniform and made some modifications and stuff, to, so it looks looks much neater than everyone else's as well. Like he's a bit brighter he's, he's, as well. Yeah, he's he's trying. He's probably just cleaning his his uniform. <laughs> the um, others don't. Yeah, yeah, he says two men are dead, sir. If that's not worth standing up for, then I'm not worthy of wearing this uniform. Like he's yeah. uh, it's, it's, like oh this is this isn't you know this <laughs> I I feel like I'm jumping the gut a little bit but it's just like so he cares because of lost life what in Star Wars isn't what? And, and you might be like isn't Random he part of the Empire it's like yes of without he, consequence he is technically a part of the Empire and he's saying his motivation is to you know get some form of justice for two men who were murdered like huh. And uh, the conversation is super interesting. His superior says, I want you to conjure an accident, get it outside the leisure zone. Because uh, uh, basically we need to find a way of dampening this as much as possible as an event. And his response is like, they were murdered. And he says, they died in a fight, went on the job. Clearly they chose the wrong person to annoy. Tell people mm -hmm. they died being helpful, sad, but inspiring. Uh, you know, not too inspiring. Yeah, not too inspiring. <laughs> and he says, uh, you look stricken. I'm going to an Imperial Regional Command review. I'll be asked to make a report about our crime rates. And the goal of that speech, if you're ever asked to deliver it, is brevity. Mm -hmm. uh, which is super, super cool. He's basically explaining, like, it makes everything easier for us the less crime I have to report. And the less crime I have to report is determined by us taking crime... Basically converting it into something that doesn't really matter. And to be honest with you, he's saying, like, there's not going to be much repercussion from this. They pissed off someone who killed them. This isn't, like, some grand scheme or anything. This is this is obviously just something that went wrong. So there's no yeah. need to make ripples. Just move on. That's it. Done. Uh, minimizing the time like the Empire spends thinking about Preox Morlana benefits our superiors and, by extension, everyone here, which at the moment includes you. Yeah. At the moment, which feels like a threat. Um, yeah, oh, I mean, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah that's but, true. And, and Wait, we're rocking the boat. Him, like, he, he would have said, "Don't rock the boat, or I'll fire you." <laughs> yeah, dialogue. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's something that's worth emphasizing. It, something that um, the galaxies are they're quite big. 
Um, I imagine that the this, the galaxy that Star Wars is set in is no different. And to actually establish that the Empire doesn't have, like, a physical presence everywhere, and that there are, like, contractors, private companies, that are responsible for overseeing certain areas of, uh, of, the, of the galaxy, that's really, like, neat as a detail. It just makes this world feel more believable, and it makes it feel all the more interesting that there is a level of um, apathy and complacency uh, and trying to fly under the radar and not draw too much attention to oneself, like, in that bureaucracy. And that the, uh, the guy who's in charge of this company, Primor, I believe it's called, he kind of understands that really well, and Cyril is um, less motivated by that like it informs a lot less of what he uh he chooses to do like clearly pretty evidently in this scene it's kind mm -hmm. of a what i find super neat about it as well is that it's super representative of just uh normal jobs you a new guy comes in and he's super like enticed and energetic to do well at the job but you meet this superior or even it could be a lower level person who's just like dude calm down calm down everything works a particular way here okay everything runs a, B, C, D, E, F, G, there's no, none of this crazy by the book or extended, extensive, passionate moves in this way or that way. It's like, you don't understand the goals you have are probably more likely served in the long run by doing the things I'm telling you to do, even though they don't seem like they are. Because uh, he's basically warning through what he says of how much worse things could get if you make uh, too much noise with, with stuff like this. Um Whatever exactly he means in terms of how that could turn out, maybe we'll find out in the future. But Cyril is clearly unsatisfied. Um, it was a uh, really great scene. Yeah, it was super solid as an introduction uh, to Empire operations, or at least the lower levels of security in in lower level sectors. It's just like this is cool. I wasn't even expecting to get a scene for them. And no, not at all. This is also the it it all happen more and more as in as we move forwards but this is kind of that initial setup of this is star wars the empire is around you might not see them you might not be walking around and just being visible but there is this sort of this uh, this kind of atmosphere of being a being wary of the empire um it it's kind of like this like like a tense vibe uh, whenever they're spoken about, um, which I really quite liked. Uh, they don't just go, Stormtrooper, Stormtrooper, TIE Fighter, here we go. Oh my gosh, good, Star Destroyer. Ah, it's the Palpatine, look, red lightsaber. No, mm -hmm. no, no. Everyone's like, yeah, we know the Empire is. We don't want to mess around with them. We don't, we don't want to get attention. Just, mm. Yes. Uh, then Cass heads to Bix, a friend of his. Um, she helps him sell off Different parts he may steal or acquire through whatever means. And uh, he's asking now, can I sell something, basically the best thing I've ever gotten? He's clearly kept it for like a rainy day sort of thing. And it's like, I want to sell it now so I can have enough money to get off world because I'm in trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. And so she says there'll be a contact that she can try to, to get for this. That's that scene, basically. She seems like... Uh, there's, 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 I don't have a lot to say about Bix's introduction. She's very normal. She's a character yeah. that exists here and does stuff. She's like a mechanic who sorts out. She's like a connection to other people. Um, so, yeah. Uh, next up, I think we go back to Cyril, actually. It's not long before you realize he's basically a big POV character. Um, mm -hmm. well, yeah. The next thing that we see him doing is he's... he's uh, we've got, like, a real close-up on him as he's standing, like, outside of a door, you know, uh, beyond a room in a hallway. Uh, he looks very nervous. Like he looks, uh, he looks uneasy. Um, yeah, this is a couple of guys. Walk past, it's like, hey, how are you doing? And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. But obviously, he's not. It's it's kind of like he's he's getting ready to amp himself up because as soon as he walks into the room, his demeanor shifts into a more like assertive. Uh, it's the first tone. time he's exerting authority uh, properly, and he's he's trying to big himself up, yeah, because he's got to get these guys in line, depending on if they're doing the things that he wants or not. And it's going to be, it, it almost comes across as though he's. Yes, I hope they don't realize there's a little bit of there's cracks in his uh, demeanor. He could be um, overthrown if they knew more about him. But he's like, you can hide that just by 
behaving strong enough, right? Which is just something like, why do you even, why is this being dealt with? It's like, yeah, because he's a person. That's why. Like, we're getting, there's a character behind, he's running plot, right, for the sort of antagonistic side of Cassian overall, but we're also being delivered. This is a person that's behind it with goals and, you know, intentions that go beyond just serving the Empire. He he serves it for core reasons and um, got to deal with his own flaws. And so, yeah, he gets in there and he's um, he's trying to figure out through the ship that Cassian left on where it ended up. And uh, to do that, they're going to have to trace like all of the... Think of it as like a traffic cam. He wants the guy to basically search and find exactly where that ship went. And he was like, that's going to take me fucking for ages. And he's like, Does, do you, do you want to keep your job? He's just like, yeah, right, okay. Like, just do it, you know, get it done. And he says, uh, I don't know what's more disturbing. The fact that our corporate borders are so unprotected or your complacence about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Solid lines. You're like, oh, shit. Because, yeah, Cyril is uh, not aware of all of these different pieces of their... Um, the security, but they're all so lax. They just they're just like mm. nobody really cares. Everybody's um apathetic about it. Yeah, yeah. There's that sense of yeah, just general apathy. Just a job. And uh, yeah, a guy called Dirchi walks up to Caspid like, "I need the money you owe me." And uh, it's just kind of like I guess it's a bit of comic relief because there's this this comically <laughs> large alien, alien that walks up behind yeah. him and Cassie's like, oh, yeah. "Really? <laughs> Seriously?" And he's like, "What?" <laughs> just, the idea you is just like, told oh, me to, "Just told me to stand here. I don't even know what's going on." <laughs> like, are you that desperate for money that you're like gonna be this guy's muscle? Um, but yeah, of course. Just the point of that, I assume, is to just show us that uh, there's lots of pressures on Cassie and, uh, outside of the uh, the big one. Covering up all this shit that's happened. Yeah. Um, yeah, then we, f we find that uh, Bix has a friend in a different area of town that she makes contact with that has a machine in his back area that sends signals to the buyer. Uh, this, for now, is only as interesting as to sell the piece that Cass has, but obviously it's going to become more relevant as to what the point of that machine is and how it got there as we go on. Um. So then, yeah, uh, back to Cyril, and he's um, still trying to engage with the the work of this system, and he's dealing with loads of really like low level workers who all have access to information. Even before he enters the room, they're talking about overtime and whether or not they're going to get more, and whether or not the person that would engage with it can pay, uh, can actually like properly authorize it. Which I, I don't know about you guys, just that's so familiar to me from back when I was working in retail, like as a normal conversation. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yes, overtime is on the table, but like. He can authorize it, right? Like, I'm not going to do overtime and not get paid for it or anything, am I? Like, that is what the concern is. It's not about doing the job, because nobody fucking cares. Like, it's... But Cyril does. That's kind of the point. He's like, what the fuck? Why isn't everybody more passionate about the justice of finding this guy, of, of making up for um the, the two who died? He says, uh, we're yeah. talking about the murder of two Primor employees. And everyone's like, okay. It's like, yeah, I didn't know him, so whatever. I don't care. It's just yeah, there's a, it's an everyday thing, and yeah, he's the only, so he's um he's almost like a a monkey wrench at this point, even though he's trying to do his job properly. And uh, yeah, he tells them that you need to flood all the channels with a request for a canary mail, uh, which is information they've gathered as a result of him looking for his sister, who he's described as being canary. So that's that's how that would have gone out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, uh, uh, we see Cass is switching out his chip log for his own, the ship he used, which doesn't belong to him. He borrowed it off someone else, and that guy's like, what the fuck are you doing? And he's like, oh, you know, just switching it out. It's old. And it's like, yeah, it's got nothing to do with it being traced or anything, which, again... No, 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 no. <laughs> I appreciate that all the scenes with Cass in the first episode are just all him making strong efforts to get his alibi and all of his tech in order to scrub as much as he possibly can from the coming yeah. storm of having killed two people. Yeah, uh, uh, he's been doing clearly been doing shady stuff in the past he's been this is not new he's not figuring out how to do all this stuff just now it's something that he's probably had as a backup plan just in case you know this is his panic procedure well and something that we get that's that's cool in terms of the differing uh povs is we, we've kind of got like three different reactions to him so uh with brasso it's just like yeah i'll help you out buddy no problem 
uh when he's talking to bix it's more like what are you what 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 happened like what are you getting up to it's like yeah but you can do this for me right like you're gonna do this it's like okay but like i'm kind of like what what'd you actually do like i'm kind of wondering uh and then this fella here is just like dude what the hell are you doing like i don't want to like it's the the tone with this guy in particular is like you're drawing attention like i don't like i don't want that like like whatever you're doing like i'm done i'm i don't want you to be doing this like you're gonna mm -hmm. get me in trouble like it's kind of that sense you're gonna get me in trouble and i don't want to i don't want that to happen because the consequences could be significant um it's kind of like this looming specter right the empire even though it's not even here right it's not even on on a ferrox yeah. like directly um but everybody's still kind of it's kind of like you know, hmm, there's, there's, yeah, there's like that looming dread of, um, I could get in trouble and I don't, I yeah. don't want that to happen because of what the empire is. Just yeah. the threat we don't of them it. coming here is <clears throat> yeah, like you, something to be afraid of. You get a, you get a pretty good understanding of the empire being threatening to all these people here right now, and they don't want to be dealing with them because that's just trouble and gonna make them, I don't know, less money and probably they're going to do some shenanigans. You can feel like the, the fist pushing down on this whole, uh, on all of Ferrix, basically. Like, everyone is kind of looking out for themselves, don't want to get any trouble. Uh, yeah, what you, I like you... about it, um, in this case, is that the Empire aren't here. There aren't any stormtroopers walking around. There aren't even any, like, pre more security guys walking around. Like, yeah, there's no... no no overt like presence on ferrox of the empire no. but it doesn't need to be it's yeah. kind of like the nature of what the empire has to do to maintain control is to project its influence across the galaxy exactly that doesn't mean stormtroopers walking around everywhere it's it's just more subtle um it's indicative of, of just being more a, a more well thought out scenario um and yeah uh funny enough with the way that break, we're breaking this up we're actually onto episode two now because the, the flashbacks oh. make up some of the rest. And then, of course, we're not going into hyper detail. But there are 12 episodes, so... Mm -hmm. worry. And as far as I'm concerned, they become more dense as we go on. Um, yeah, of course. So, we get... Uh, again, there's still flashback scenes we're sort of running over, but... We get, um... I don't even know how to put it. It's it's like the... the, the the bell man, or, or just anvil I, man. Yeah, anvil man. I, He's... Um... He, He's loving his job. He loves He's his job great. so much, yeah. <laughs> well, I think um, I'm wondering if I'm pulling more meaning out of it than it's actually there, but I, I kind of feel like giving the, 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 the show a bit more credit. The impression I get with him having, like, this routine and this rhythm he goes through that he's, like, very into is, like, trying to, trying to, like, pull some level of uh, satisfaction out of, like, a mundane situation to try and find, like, some sort of joy or... Uh, or uh, fulfillment wherever he can, even if it's as simple mm. as I'm just gonna strike the thing to make the bell chime so that everybody knows that it's time to go to work. But like in this sort of oppressive world where it feels like everybody's a lot more restricted, he's just gonna find an opportunity where he can to, you know, pull something out of it. Um, I might be reading into it more than that. It might just be that he is a guy who rings a bell and he just, I don't know, he enjoys it. <laughs> but, um, I don't know, that was kind of the impression I got. Probably yeah. feel pretty important being up there, you know. Doing well, they that. do. Um, like... They they mean mean to show like they keep intercutting him with all the characters doing their uh, end of shift stuff. Yeah, yeah. it so seems they, like, almost ceremonial. Like the implication being that the they day. do actually listen out for him. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's he's, not he, Jim's not up there just because we need you know he's not he's for tradition something to or do, anything. He's actually, yeah. make him feel like he's you know helpful and yeah. Um, so, Cass meets up with his mum, Marva, who, uh, I was saying this to Rags, I, I remember the actress basically only playing the auntie in Harry Potter, uh, you got the auntie and uncle, I've, I've even forgotten their names, like, uh, I used to know Harry Potter a bit better, but they're like absurd caricatures Hogwarts. of people, right? The, they're the Hogwarts, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 uh... What I really remember is, doesn't the, the uncle eat a cake and get really fat at one point? Or is that uh, some other woman? That's just a normal way to get fat, Muller. <laughs> no, I said really. So, like, more than... Oh, yeah, really fat. Okay. Really fat. And Not like it's fake fat. They get so fat, they, like, float up into the... Do they actually float outside the room and float up into the air? Because I remember being that terrifying. Is that why I remember that scene? Because if... It's like a spell that Harry accidentally casts, or Dobby casts it, and they get so fat, they start to just fly, and they go up into the air, and it's like, Jesus Christ, so either they just keep rising and they die, or they deflate and they die. 
<laughs> like, anyway, we'll cover. You know what? That's foreshadowing for the eventual EFAP movies, Harry Potter, that'll probably happen oh my someday. God. Why not? Um, anyway, she plays the the auntie. I forget the actress's name, but when she pops up in this, it's just like, oh look, it's here. I guess. Uh, she among several impressed me thoroughly with their acting. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, yes. she was great. Right. Absolutely great, especially by the end of the season. Oh, what a great addition oh, to the absolutely cast. absolutely by the end of the season. Um, I guess we haven't talked about it all that much, but just so far across the board, acting's been really good, kind of from yeah, everybody. Really well, good. Well, the thing is, is that um, some of the, like, it, it has been, and we, we haven't, we haven't uh, met some major POV characters yet who deliver some really excellent performances. Oh, very much so. Um... Well, that's the thing, right? We haven't introduced uh, like seventy percent of the cast still. So. No, we we're we're, uh, we're very focused on Andor right now. And in, in fact, it's um, I'd say that like because because the show could be described as in some sense an ensemble uh, cast, but like these first three episodes are hyper focused on Andor. Yeah. So uh, he he walks in and um, it's announced through the the droids like this this searching for Can a Canary male, which uh, he's from Canary. Uh, and so the mum's already but like... most people don't know that. It's a secret. Yeah, it's supposed to be a secret. So she says, who else knows? And he says, about what? And it's like, you're born on Canary. And uh, he says, what, you don't want to know what happened? Obviously, because they're searching for a Canary male being him. So what did he do wrong? You know, that's the question. But she doesn't care about that. She wants to know who uh, sold him out, well, basically. He's business first. Uh, first yeah. up, first. Yeah, yeah right, 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 right. Well, Listen, to me, it's not even. It's it's the she is. Uh, the, the, this mm. isn't even spoilery. She's like died in the wool rebel type. She uh, she uh, couldn't give. If the empire versus anyone, if that scenario is coming up, she'll take their side. So she doesn't care what he did wrong, so to speak, with the authorities going after him. She doesn't. She couldn't care less what he fucking did. Uh, she yeah. just wants to know how they managed to find that information and who we can't trust. Who is the one that gave you up? Who's the one that told exactly, them you're from yeah. Canary? And what you did won't great. change. But yeah, what, what you did, what who next. fucking cares? Um, and yeah, he does say, like, don't you want to know what happened? She's like, yeah, we'll get to that. And because, uh, yeah. like, yeah, the, we'll, we'll talk about it, but it's much more important to get that sorted. So uh, he says, like, you've told plenty of people. And she's like, yeah, family. Who told these primal bastards about Canary? And he says, <laughs> that would be me. And then she's just like, what have you done? Like, because it's, yeah, it's his mistake that he made in approaching, looking for his sister. It's just, it's as simple as that. Um, so, yeah, uh, just a, through the lack of information being given back and forth to the each other, we get loads of information. It's um, almost one of the best ways to describe how subtext works. It's like, we, we understand how much she cares about him and the nature of his history being hidden, because we've already had several flashbacks at this point, which we will go over, mm -hmm. um, that inform a lot of it, and that she's aware of it, he's aware of it, obviously, and we've got uh, knowing about that narrows down being able to find him. Um, so, it's interesting. And yes, he uh, he meets with Bix again, but uh, her boyfriend is starting to get a little more, um, a little more uh, on the up and up, trying to figure out what's going on, and that might be the first place I can start being a little bit more critical now that we've established more things. Um, he's keeping an eye on them to having a com sorry, he's keeping an eye on them to having a conversation, and he eventually decides to uh, you know report Cassian in. He tells uh, the security people where Cassian is. And I don't think it's it's bad enough to do this. like I think we may as well just skip forward. You find this out. I want to say in like episode and seven i think um that his motivation for doing this is that he thought those two were getting back together yeah that's really lame that is really lame <laughs> i'm not even sure it makes much sense uh to bring down the security of this hard uh on on this this area with his awareness of how much you don't want to do that mm. and it how seems people... a bit odd right that it would be that if it gets like a better motivation would be he thought he was going to get her in trouble exactly and so he wanted to, Why? to uh, prevent her from getting in trouble all he had to do was make andor an established troublemaker that this isn't the first time he's fucked up her life or something or other people's lives and that this is the and him finding out you killed two people it's like this guy has to go away are you serious like he's 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 a uh... and you know maybe he can Gotta say like he believes somewhat in us. justice yeah. and that this this is 
like we can't keep helping him get out of these insane situations like this is enough but no apparently he really was just kind of jealous and he was like you guys are hooking back up but that's no fair i'm gonna they even show him with alcohol i guess to try and help us understand why he made the decision it's just like eh, yeah lame but fine um so yeah the security people uh told it could be cassian andor and they're like, Cassian Andor, and let's, let's have a look at him. And they get him up, and then they've grabbed the girl from the, who Cass talked to in the first episode about his sister. So that's it. He's done at that point, because you can combine the verification. And uh, Cyril is on to him, basically. Simple pretty as quickly, that. Pretty quickly, in, in a few days. Yeah, which, uh, yeah. Cyril, Cyril did good work. He's pretty good at this, yeah. <clears throat> um, though I guess you could say a lot of it was helped by boyfriend giving him that information. Uh, sure, but I mean, you know, it's, uh, that's true. But I mean, nevertheless... Well, Cyril has done everything doesn't... as best he can, still. Yeah. yeah, it just all lines up well and He's being him. very competent. He's being the C-word. Oh I think God. it's at all awkward that, um, Bix then comes to boyfriend guy and is like, hey, wanna, wanna hook up and do thing? And then he's like, yeah, let's do it, when he knows at that point that she would fucking never be doing any of this with him if she knew what he had done. Yeah. A little bit awkward, right? Um, it's awkward, but, I mean, it's totally believable that a guy would do that. Oh, I didn't say it's not. Some, that's what I'm, <laughs> I'm, say, I, I'm not Definitely a fan of this awkward, guy is no. kind of what I'm getting at. Like, yeah. Uh, you can tell they show shots of him looking conflicted, but it's like, my dude, <laughs> like, you've done something pretty horrendous. And it's not even something that yeah. would necessarily remain super secret. Um, well, he gives it up anyway as information. It's just that, yeah. But anyway, we get another Chad character introduced. Uh, I'll defend him to my very death, okay? His name is Linus Moss. Jar Jar. Yes, of course. Um, and he is a pretty solid reflection of Cyril. He's uh, the security man that's been brought in to organize yeah. the team that Cyril's going to be using to capture Cassian. And um, man, he's just... Uh, he's, he's, he's very... He's well-groomed, well-dressed, and very much uh, on board with this to the point where Cyril gives him a couple questions and he actually... Um, Starts giving a description of how he thinks thinks uh, how he thinks things should run, and Cyril is like almost inspired by him explaining his motivation. Yeah, um, <clears throat> like proud to be part of sort of justice and conformity and running with like a clean and startling precision sort of thing. Um, and he's looking to impress as well. Like I would say he's hilariously competent. It's it, I can't believe I'm watching this. Like it's it's like people who <laughs> it's really weird. The thing like that actually, wrong. Wrong. I remember me like, wrong. <laughs> actually losing my shit when they were like, okay, we need to capture one guy and we believe him to be dangerous because he killed two people, but obviously he's going to be in civilian mode. Um, how many men do we need? Now, if you roll back to the sequel trilogy where they send like fucking three stormtroopers after Jedi and stuff, like, uh, Mosk says we're going we're gonna to be conducting this with 12 men. Like, excellent. Oh. <laughs> like, you might actually get the person you're after with that. Um... But yeah, uh, he said, show a force to boost morale. Nothing like seeing an officer on the line. Hats off to you, sir, and the inspector. Two men dead mm -hmm. in the line of duty. Colleagues, outrageous. And uh, he says, exactly. The thought of anything less in a case like this is unconscionable. The dereliction of duty at the minimum. I've seen it. Half measures. Take it slow. Wait and see. It's a plague on discipline. Facing your man yourself for the rest of your life, knowing you did less than everything you possibly could. I've been saying this all along. We've needed a stronger hand in these affiliated planets. There's fermenting out there, sir. Corporate tactical forces are the Empire's first line of defense, and the best way to keep the blade sharp is to use it. So thank you. So good. <laughs> Just, it's, it's, do you understand? Like, he's a, he's a person that believes that, like, things will fall apart if we don't actually keep the, the laws in place and we enforce them. Yeah. And that, uh... You know, like, it, it, this, this is the complication that the story starts to generate, is that uh, are Cyril and uh, Linus, are they good people or bad people? Yeah. I left it, that open. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, that's why I wasn't saying anything. The permeating question, is it yeah. good people in a bad organization? Are people just trying to get by? Or are they just caught up in all this madness? That already they're really getting you to think because I mean after all he did kill two people you know that's what and I mean uh, and, and it feels like the the show is coming through on the promises of Rogue One like there is a lot of gray here exactly what the answer is uh, the answers are is a little bit more complicated um by the way I'm not against stories having strict good and bad guys 
I, I'm, I'm a fan oh, yeah, of yeah. He-Man versus Skeletor like anyone else. <laughs> so, mm. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I'm also. He man killed two of my security guards. <laughs> we must find him. Kill him. They were in my way. Um. But yeah. Uh. Then actually, I think after the next flashback, we got introduced to Stellan Skarsgård's Luthen. Yo. What? Yay! Yeah. This is Luthen. Stuff like this is unironically the reason why I'm like, oh, thank goodness. Especially on a sort of first run through, I'm like, an actor I really enjoy. I don't even care what they do as long as I get to see them talk. Uh, this would be equivalent of, there's so many actors that fulfill this role. If this guy was played by Charles Dance, I'd be like, yeah, I don't really <laughs> care what you do. Just do things. Just talk. <laughs> um, he's quite a, a favorite at this point. He pops up in lots of things, and whenever he does, he's really good. Uh, he's just, there's a reason why everyone wants him and stuff. Fucking solid ass actor, very talented. Um, as we will, it, if you didn't know it before, you will soon. Oh yeah. Um. So then we meet a guy called Zanwan, I think, or Zanwan. He's a, uh, for lack of my understanding of the situation, he like organizes transport, I think, for Ferrix, and he's a friend of mm. Cass's as well. To be fair, mostly everybody is a friend of everybody mm. here. This is a tight, a pretty tight knit community that will come up later as a big yeah. thing. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And uh, Cass is asking him to transport something without. I think I think he says like you know, irrelevant of weight, irrelevant of name and tag. Like basically, make it a huge smuggling secret. And the more you do that, the more it costs. Um, he's getting that in order as well. Um, yeah, and then we cut over to Cyril organizing with uh, Linus the men for when they launch on Ferrix. And it's, uh, it's a really cool sort of comparison, right? Li Linus says, um, he may not appear formidable, but two of our men are dead as a result of making that mistake. Remind the local and amused residents that there is a monthly opportunity for them to file official complaints if they, you know, have issue with us going through the streets. And then he says, uh, all yours, sir. So, like, he provided just useful information. And then he's like, now it's time yeah. for you, Cyril, to <clears throat> give us the, the sort of rousing speech. And so Cyril, like, awkwardly steps forward and he's like, there comes a time when the risk of doing nothing becomes the greatest risk of all. This is a decisive moment, uh, and I, I can imagine, can't imagine a team I'd rather share it with than, than all of you. Uh, there's no room for doubt on the path to success uh <laughs> and justice uh be best best of luck to to us all yeah so um, he's not very good at this yeah uh, and, and they, they, <laughs> they they shoot it so that like several guys are sort of looking around looking down sort of awkwardly swaying from back and forth just like what the fuck is this and there's so many gaps and us and the funny thing is i i think i brought this up when it was first discussed on one of the open bars but like the speech itself is pretty solid the, yeah, the but the words, way he... it's just the way he delivered it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it makes just... sense. He would know what to say, you know, but how to say it. Yeah, he's not there, and uh, you can tell that Linus notices in the background. He's just keeping an eye on him, like, "What the fuck are you doing, man? Like, yeah. <laughs> if anything, this is going to damage things." And like the speech ends, there's this pause, and then Linus just starts clapping, like, "Yeah, yeah, <laughs> woohoo, yeah. sweet, we're doing it, all set, inspiring." And yeah, he's just such a fucking hype dude. Like he's trying to keep. Yeah. Uh, he's and, a bro. Yeah, you can't help but assume it's because yeah, he he sees that Cyril believes in the same sort of values. It's just that he's not quite suited for the job. Um, he's uh, and, and you know this is the thing, right? Like uh, when you get this much information on a character like Cyril, we're all sitting here sort of like, wait, is this going to be? You wonder maybe by the time we hit the end of, I think this is it three seasons in total for Andor this planned. I, uh, I think know. I think no it clue, is. Actually. Well, if it's three, you imagine that by the end of season three, if Cyril is still alive or whatever is going on with him, that he's going to be very different from the Cyril we know. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. He, oh, yeah, he seems like the character to pick for giving a significant arc. We'll change him up. Yeah, he's probably going to get like competent and finds his mojo and whatnot. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. Uh, Luthen takes a transport to get from the outskirts of barracks into the main town and there's just this little grandpa dude that starts talking to him yeah and, yeah um, <laughs> it's kind of interesting to watch in retrospect because i've seen the show twice now uh and on the second time through 
Luthen is a guy who is very much paranoid about literally everything down to like the color of the seats he sits on sort of thing. Like you'll be, you want to make sure everything is going well and, and good and be careful about every single decision you make. Old grandpa dude just being like, hey man, how you doing? There's definitely a, who are you? Why are you here? Why are you talking to me? What do you want? <laughs> Fuck you want from me. But it's just, it's just a kindly grandpa dude who's just existing in this world and he's just complaining about normal things like, oh, you know, the prices didn't used to be so bad and oh, you know, we're, these transports used to be quicker, man. Just saying, what's going on these days? But, you know, Ferex is fun to visit. Plenty to do here. We find out, like, Ferex is a um, transport hub, basically. It's a big area right. in the galaxy that's popular for everybody to sort of go back and forth from. Kind of like Tatooine as a watering hole sort of thing. Um, but obviously for trade. Um, and yeah, it's just... Uh, I think the scene only exists to be like, there are totally normal people doing totally normal things in this world that you... Yeah. So, uh, but things are still being noticed. Things are still changing gradually. Uh, yeah, Luthen is just doing his best to get through the conversation without actually addressing him. Um, yeah, we're already near the end of episode two. Damn, so much to cram into these things, you know, that they uh have to sort of do relatively fast. But then again, like I said, there's a lot of flashback stuff. In fact, I'm kind of surprised how much there is. I forgot. Yeah, because. But I mean, that'll be. That's a, a sizable amount. Yeah, we're nearing the uh, discussion. Talk about, yeah. So, yes. Um, I think Cassian's preparing to get everything done now. Because th this is the thing. A lot of people considered episode one and two to be boring and eh. Uh, episode three uh, is the one that people considered to be the good one because things happen. Um, well, this is well, where, that's why we need the setup from the first two episodes. I mean, well, <laughs> so that, that would be the, that would be the clear defense for those first two episodes, which I think are stronger than the third episode. Anyway, is that we're laying down a lot of groundwork, we're building yeah. things up, we're establishing character and a sense of place, and beginning to set into motion some of the uh, core thematic through lines that are going to carry through to the rest of the season. Yeah, but it doesn't feel bad uh, or poorly paced. It doesn't feel no, like we're all. wasting time or we're just fucking around. Everything seems to be pretty... intentional. The show is pretty expeditious in terms of how much it's achieving at the same time. We've talked about it briefly, and we'll get to talk about it a lot as things go on. We've got a lot of scenes that are achieving multiple things at once in terms of advancing plot, building character, um, establishing a sense of place in this world, and and um, yeah, it's it's like pretty uh pretty efficient storytelling. And I I, I want to mention it was widely considered to be poorly paced. Uh, the first two, but yeah. like this is the problem oh, with the pacing. Uh... The, it's the pacing argument. There's not much that can be done beyond saying, "I think it's poorly paced." I don't. Okay. Uh, nah. My argument for why it's not is that we get a substantial amount of information per time. Uh, I don't know what the response would be to that exactly. Um, some people may say, "Well, the information itself wasn't interesting, or that really there wasn't that much information." You're sort of overblowing it. Like there's different things that could be said. We found it to be pretty well paced, if not uh, not distracting at all in that department. I have never had trouble with not having an action scene. It's not something I need at all. Fine no. with me. In fact, now I'm sick and of it. Yeah, it is <laughs> yeah. more refreshing that we're not having action scenes. Like, Especially in while. Star Wars. Those yeah. action scenes were also, fucking with you, awful. I get worried when there's an action scene a lot of the time. Yeah, well, because they're often so variable. bad. It's higher, higher variables, which means it's a lot harder to, like, it. more things can go wrong when you're doing an action scene compared to two people talking to each other. Speaking of, uh, Luthen and Bix talk about the situation with Andor, the fact that he's being hunted, the thing that he's trying to sell, and they do, they do so of a relatively hearable volume among just all kinds of people everywhere. Not a scene mm. I, I like for that. Uh, I'm, Seems very uncharacteristic of him in particular. Yeah, I, I maybe would allow it for Bix, but not for Luthen. Yeah, he wouldn't do this. Um, as much as they do imply throughout the season he's taking more risks, this isn't one I think that matches the kind of risks he takes. This yeah. is pointless as a risk. You just talk quieter or go someplace slightly different. Um, right. This one just stands out as being, they just uh, messed up. They just uh, did a whoopsie. It's um, a problem. Yeah, uh, our uh, Cyril and his team are heading to Barracks, and um, Marva's house is... Uh, like the first place they go, that's obviously where Cassian lives. And um, as they move through the town, there's a lot of eyes on them. Everyone sort of sees them and realizes what it means. I think someone says, like, it's been a while since we've seen the boys in blue. Like, 
This is this. It means a lot that they're here. This is significant. It means someone's in trouble. They're looking for someone. Yeah, and um, yeah. the way that it works in Star Wars, right? Uh, this feels like a much more serious example of it. The droids are. They're like people. They're not too far away from them. It's a little bit awkward sometimes to think more on it than you'd like to. Uh, kind of. B2 seems to be like a character. Yes, he's not just a functioning program following uh, ones and zeros. In the Star Wars universe, and I'm pretty sure there's more on this the deeper you delve. Like, it's it can get creepy in terms of just how people-ish they are. But um, they want information from her, and she ain't going to be giving it to them. But uh, mm -hmm. then they say, you know, they ask start us in the droid, and it's like, uh, I don't know. And then they go pull the power supply, and it's like, no! And it's just like, oh, Jesus. Like, what does that, what mm -hmm. does that mean if it's like... Is that like the equivalent of like drawing your blood out of you sort of thing? Like, I wonder. Um, no. It's, and yeah, and she even says, like, they can't do that. Like, it, like it's illegal to pull the power on a droid, potentially. I, I have no idea. I, I don't know exactly. The, the Star Wars has never really taken the time to explore let's say, droid rights, other than cartoonishly in the Solo movie. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, it's difficult to do it because of what we've said in stone already, right? Which is that yeah. you, you can't really don't establish want suddenly that these are all living creatures that deserve rights when we've been having so much chill fun with them. Like C-3PO yeah. and R2-D2 are fun. We don't really try to think more so about they're like souls trapped in machines or something. That's not really, <laughs> oh, not really no. go that direction. Um... So anyway, uh, yeah, it's worth saying. I think the first two episodes are pretty solid. Episode three, uh, this is this is the where the hot takes can begin. Episode three is the weakest of the three. Uh, yeah, I think so. Even though it's considered the strongest by everyone, other than I guess us, <laughs> it, it feels that way. Yeah. Anyway. But uh, especially on rewatch, right? So, so it, I think I said when we were rewatching it, they're they're in Marva's house. They're trying to get information from the droid. And unfortunately, at that moment, Andor contacts the droid, and he's like, hello, droid, yeah. like, how's everything going? You okay? And I, when we were watching it, I was like, ah, I know what this is. He's, they've, they've set this up, because Andor can then distract them to a false location, and he can save Marva and the droid. I was wrong. Uh, yep. It is as simple as it appears. He literally contacted them by chance at the worst possible time. If he had done it five minutes earlier, he'd be fine. Yeah. 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 Just... Pretty lame. Pretty lame. They all, it's... through that information, find out where he is. It's like, well... Okay. Can't all be winners. <laughs> yeah, there's no... Be checking that it's okay for him to talk if he shouldn't even really be doing it. Well, it's just to facilitate um, that, 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 that it's, it's the thing that allows him to track him to the warehouse. Like, that's yeah. basically the only reason it happens. Um, and yeah, so we got uh, Cass and Luthen have a big old chat, and obviously Cass is here to sell a spaceship part, but Luthen turns out is here for much yeah. more than that. Because yep. um, these days are going to end, Cassie, and the sound of that voice telling you to stop, to move, to die. Soon enough, they'll have something else to listen to. Um, and then Cass, while he's saying all this stuff, is like, "Pay for thing, you want to be caught with things? <laughs> like, why? Are you, what's going on?" Um, uh, yeah, and he says, like, if they catch you with that that part, you know, you, you'll get fucked. And he says, will they hang me? Yeah, like your father? And Cassie's just like, what the fuck? Like, what's, what is with you, my dude? Which, um... You're yeah, so mean. Probably could have had a different approach to, you know, get to him faster, but hey, it's, it's fine. And uh, he says, it seems like a waste of talent to let them have you. Don't you want to fight these bastards for real? Like, what is happening here? Um... And then another piece of plot writing happens that I'm not a fan of. Um, Luthen has a thing that starts going off. Like, what, what, what's happening? Mm -hmm. And he, he says, can I, can I grab my thing from my pocket? And Andor's like, yeah, sure, okay. And uh, he's like, oh no, my thing in my pocket is telling me that you have a thing that is allowing people to track your location. And he means the comm link that he spoke yeah. to uh, the droid with. And so he takes it out and smashes it. And he's like, you idiot, don't have anything that you don't ultimately control. And I remember sitting there thinking, like, ah. Oh. So if Luther had detected that, that immediately, well, think about it, right? If he had detected it from the moment he had entered, they would have smashed it and left the place and done their deal somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so the whole plot changed. Yeah, it, yeah. it needed yeah, to be late. Yeah. So I was just like, ah, oh, that's, that's lame. Mm, yeah. Damn you. Stop. <laughs> like, <laughs> Uh, the character stuff has been so solid. Stop using these like really cheap. And by the way, these are these are stretches that are appearing 
they're not they're not holes and they're not even they're not huge stretches compared to what we're often delivered so it's, <laughs> it's just it would be nice if it was uh tighter yeah um so yeah, they realize too late that they're being attacked and they start preparing and uh, somehow, I guess, the way this job worked is that Cassian put the, the special, special part down on a table and then was like, give me the money. Um, and he seems very thingy about like, I need to know that you have the money before we're doing this deal, but he still did that. And the reason I bring this up is had he just kept it in his pocket, uh, it wouldn't have been found by the Empire because he can't get it out of this room. He loses it, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I'm not hugely thrilled by either. It's another example of plot going a particular direction that kind of deals just a... All of these deal little pieces of damage to character. It means, like, Luthan wasn't more careful than he obviously would be as he's characterized. Andor isn't more secure with his part before giving it up than he obviously would be. He wasn't more careful with contacting the droid than he obviously would be. But each of these choices allow for grander plot elements to happen. That part needs to be in the wreckage because it needs to be registered as something that was here so it can be traced and it's going to be a big well, part a big of someone else's plot line. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so this is the thing. I want these things highlighted because they're not small, they have huge effects, and they're not entirely in character. So they're little, what I would call maybe cheats on the writer's part to be like, I want this to yeah. happen. And mm -hmm. it's happening. Yeah. Uh, the the quantity though that exists in this show compared to the rest of Disney Star Wars though, yeah, it's um, not even close. And so some guys try to see what's in the building, and um, uh, Luthen has charges on the door as he came in uh, that he detonates. I guess as a sort of like security thing. And what I like about it is that the uh, Linus finds out, and the first thing he says is like, "I told you not to to go in without us," sort of thing. Like we're supposed to. You know, do this as a team. The whole fucking point yeah. is that we do this well. We do this smart. We don't like like he's more pissed at the fact that they would have made the decision to get close enough to be killed, not that they're killed. Like, frustrated. Well, he is of course uh, upset at any man dying. It's just that there was a way we were supposed to conduct this, and you're not you're not doing it the way that I told you to. Um, yeah, Cass is shot in the arm uh, during the fight, which is a little bit satisfying in terms of just repercussions for hanging mm -hmm. around for as long as they do. Yeah, get into a gun battle. People get shot. But um, holy shit, they choose to that this gunfight is in this absolute fucking Indiana Jones level crazy room of just traps <laughs> and insane shit. Dropping, happens. yeah, yeah, these room. engines and stuff rigged up on the ceiling that just drop <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. It's a, it is an action-packed room. It just, uh, it's just waiting. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a video game room, boys and they girls. Store machine engines on the ceiling. It's really odd. Chains. Move them later. Chains. It's to keep them off the. So they're not dirty. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Plus, they like it when it's for the birds. So uh, there is commotion, of course, and during the bit. commotion, this is this is all the things I'm highlighting right now. This is why I'm not a fan of this episode compared to the first two. Bix starts running, and her motivation we find out is to warn Cassian about what's happening. It's like okay, and so the way she's running is going to necessarily be in the opposite direction of most people who are fleeing from the explosion and the men in blue. And so she happens to go down a street. Remember, there are, what was it, 12 men in total? She goes down the one street that has four of them. Yeah, in yeah. a whole city. And, like, uh, and they see her, they see her running. And he's like, you're running in the different direction. Hold right there, you're probably evil. <laughs> So well, yeah, because okay. imagine if she was running to her house that was in that direction. Yeah, like, like, that that shit is so house. beyond unsatisfying to me. It's like really okay, fine. It's not a, like I said. It's not a hole. It's just okay. That's what happened, I guess. Because whenever a character gets captured, it's significant or released. Um, yes, it is. So it's like mm, okay then. Uh, Star Wars doesn't have the best track record of just kind of having you no. know characters be captured and released later by. Factions. And then we get something really strange happen. Boyfriend finds out she's been captured, I guess, because he was chasing after her, and he finds oh, out yeah, that, that she's happened. there. And I think this this moment was the moment that we, when we were watching it, were like, holy shit, what's going on? This is a bit, like, what the fuck? Um, he tries to escape, and they, like, throw her back into the wall. There's not much she can do. And Boyfriend mm. turns up, and he's like, hey, what are you doing? Leave her alone. And then they're like, stay the fuck back. And then he's just like, no, and runs towards her. They just Charge shoot him. Forward and then shoot him. He gets yeah. shot immediately. It's like, yeah, of course that happened. I don't, that's what would happen, idiot. you dumbass. They told you. 
they told you multiple times, like, hey, They're pointing guns at gun? you, screaming. Gotta, there are four men using that one. Four men pointing blasters at you. What were you doing? And I know that I want to try and represent as strong as a defense as possible. It's not even a strong defense. It's just the strongest one. It's that he was emotional. He saw that she was covered. Her head was blood on it. And that he loves her. It's like. I think okay. it's just that they wanted to give him some sort of, like, moment of redemption before they killed him off. To, yes. like, make you feel a bit sadder about it, but it's just a really maybe awkward it was just, sort of yeah, moment of redemption. Yeah, like, they wanted him out of the story, maybe, but they just... You gotta do stuff? Yeah, I got a bit lost on that one. I feel like it was a bit rushed. It's like, we didn't really know what to do with him, mm -hmm. but we want him to be seen as not irredeemable. See, he's a good yeah. man. He really did love her. It's like, okay... Okay. <laughs> I haven't mm -hmm. got anything else, so it's just... That happened. Um. So yeah, uh, the uh, Andor then and and Luthen are making their way back through the town, and uh, Linus orders the men to basically prepare some form of a kill box ready for them because uh, they're not sure where they are, but they know they'll be heading through this area, and uh, they're all prepared. And Cyril is the one that Andor actually gets oh, a gun on. Something that, something that was worth noting though with the, that scene is that the guy who shot um the boyfriend he he they took the gun from us like go back to the go back to like the drop ship that's your job now you're not doing this go back to the drop ship and, and the get reason that i didn't back. bring that up is i don't know how much i value that in terms of like they were they were all i don't i don't know oh, that no, it's no, no, that... no. i'm just i'm just saying like so that people because i i think that the yeah the scene is like super like riddled with problems it's just so that because there's something that happens later with the, the drop ship oh that's true for plot yeah um but that's, yeah, yeah. For plot, that's all well, what I was thinking about, though, you bringing it up, of course, was just that it seemed like it was in response to him shooting someone. But right, it's like, like he the got thing is, if or, you yeah. angrily sprint at uh, security, yeah, they sh they shoot you. Uh, it's a thing that happens, right? It's it's like I wouldn't I wouldn't blame the guy too heavily. I'm not even sure what what you're supposed to do when when someone does that. I'm not sure exactly what training says. It's just that uh, I wouldn't see it as him punishing him for that decision or anything. Like you no, go back it's... to the ship now. Yeah, it's like you. It's like whenever there's a uh, an officer related shooting in America, at least that pretty much, regardless, the first thing they do is like, yeah, you're on, you're on leave until we figure out what happened. Yeah, um, and yeah, Cyril is uh stressed the fuck out. He walks into a room. There's like two. I'm not sure if they're Jawas or something, but they they run off and he just shoots at them immediately. He's so on fucking edge. Mm -hmm. um, he just, just kills them. Two, <laughs> yeah, Jesus. And you can Luckily, tell, they managed to get away. You can tell he's not. Not holding themselves together well. Uh, he's not ready for this kind of situation. He is like the guy who's in the office. Right? Yeah, it, the, it's, the, it was as was pointed out, right? The officer in the the ranks is like, yeah, he's normally not there. Yeah. Um. And so yeah, uh, Cassian's behind him, gets a gun on his head, and uh, kind of cool. He says, "How many are you?" And he says, "I don't know." And then uh, in the background, Luthen just says, "Just kill him. I'll kill him." Then he goes, uh, yeah, it's like, Jesus. And he, and he's <laughs> fucking stressing the hell out, stuttering, sweating, and he says 12, 14, 14. Yeah. Like, because obviously they are 12, but I guess you should probably make yourself sound bigger than you are. Uh, or he was just like legitimately having trouble remembering how many there were. I can, I can believe he thought or not. Uh, that he got the number right, because that's the kind of shit he would get right, right? He's all about the facts and stuff, but he realized he should probably well, tell them. In that, in that circumstance, you know, with a gun and everything. Yeah, well, he did get it right. It's just that he decided to fluff the number up. They are 12. Oh, I see. Oh, I gotcha, I gotcha. He's, uh... He went with 12, and then he changed it to 14, because, yeah. Um, but, yeah, he's just absolutely terrified, and he gives up the information. Like, and this is the, something that... Yeah. I appreciate it when we don't have characters that are always the, uh, I'll never give up any information. It's just, like, he gives it up pretty no, I quickly. Live. Yeah, this, yeah. This, this, is, this is a normal dude. He's just... Uh, yeah. He's terrified. He doesn't want to die. It's interesting because if you would, pro if you <clears throat> probably if you would put uh, the Linus guy in that situation, he totally wouldn't have said anything. I can believe like, he I, wouldn't. Yeah, I, I believe no. he would be ready to die. Yeah, you'd see it as his duty to protect his men. Yep. Um. So anyway, the guy gets to his ship and he lifts off, and something is very strange as he like gets caught down. He's it's like there's a wire attached to a weight. And um, I'm not sure how you guys feel about this. I'm not even sure how I feel about this, but it comes across to me as something that's like, it would have been rare for this to have fucked up to the point where he crashes. It, you'd think he would have had enough time oh, to be like, right. oh, there's an absurd weight. Something's wrong with my yeah, ship. Yeah, obviously some, I should yeah chill out and not keep yeah. just stubbornly but, trying to take off. Yeah, he keeps trying to go. He lifts the thing up and it, like the weight fucks him up to the point where he just crashes into a building. And you watch the scene, and you're just like, bro, if you just calm the fuck down. 
Like, but yeah, I guess I don't know. He's stressed out or whatever, but he crashes and uh, blows up their whole transport. She's like, damn, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, things aren't going well for Team Cyril. Obviously. No, not really. They're still trying to make use of everything. Uh, they free Cyril because he's been captured, and I'm pretty sure this is a deliberate choice on theirs to not kill him. He tells them they're escaping in that car, and the thing, the reality is that that is a decoy. It explodes and kills several men, and then they yep. escape on a different transport. So I think the reason like Luthen and and uh, Cass probably would have been okay with leaving Cyril alive is that he actually sells their decoy story by accident. Yeah, um, which is kind of neat. Uh, yeah, and so uh, several wounded, possible several dead. The whole mission failed. The ship exploded. They've caused immense property and civilian damage and stress. And Cyril is fucking losing his mind. He is um, distraught. You can see oh, it. He's yeah. got that thousand yard stare. Clearly, yeah, he is traumatized. He was not ready for this. It's all nope. gone wrong. Uh, yeah, but then we also get a lot of reactions because uh, because throughout this scene, as uh, Andor and Luthen are escaping, we see sort of the reactions of several different important characters, which is sort of intercut, right? Like Bix is seriously hurt, mm -hmm. just sort of uh, very um out of it. Physically, uh, Brasso's there, yeah. Brasso's getting a drink, just sort of sitting there thinking. Um. And we've also got uh, Marva as well. Just sort of this, this, uh, this sense of unease, right, and and sadness as well. Andor's leaving. Who knows if she'll ever see him again? Yeah, who knows if he's they... even okay? You know. Well, and, and yeah. all of this also comes real... from those security guards kind of bullying Andor. Yeah, yeah, because pretty much yeah. authority and... abuse. People abusing their authority. Yeah, and everyone Ferris like, oh shit, like corporal people died here. There's going to be trouble now. The Imperium is going to do something here. Uh, the Empire, well, yeah. I mean. I'm not sure if uh, we, we went into it in too much detail, but after they had harassed uh, Marva, there were a bunch of people outside the house like, what are you doing? Like, harassing? She's just an old lady. Like, what are you doing? She's like, why, quite, are you, why are you doing this? She's quite popular in the town. She knows She's well respected in the town. Yeah. And, yeah. and as we've already established, it's a tight-knit community. And one of the things that we see as uh, the, the crowd scatters is they all have a bunch of... um. Just sort of metal, like loose metal, scrap metal, and then they start banging on it. It's like an intimidation tactic. So as they're moving through the town, it's just a lot of loud rattling noises. Kind of gives an indication of where they are too. Just like these tactics that are being used to to get to them. And as we see, it gets to some of them. Like it's working. Some yeah. of them are really nervous about it. Yeah. Um, and and then I I love the line that Marva has where it's like, you know, I know it gets to you. Like while they're in a house, and they're just like, shut up. And then I think she says something along the lines of it's when it stops, like that's when it gets scary that's, or that's yeah. when it should worry you, which yeah, is some really great foreshadowing. Like. Yeah, because, because I, I think it's pretty clear what she, I, I guess the easy way to read it is once, once that stops, you know that they're like actually like ready to fight you. It kind of like as a, I guess, a broader statement about, um, about like what would be happening in this world. Like just the, the sounds of discontent, that's like one thing. But when it when it stops, it's like that's when shits hit the fan. That's when everybody's had enough. That's when it's over. Yeah, um, that's one way to read it anyway. Well, and that closes out the uh, Luthen and Cass make it out on a ship. So Cassian's life is fucked in terms of being able to stay in Ferex. He's with someone who's yeah. offered him a chance to fight the Empire for real, quote unquote. But he he's not that into it. Well, that's like that's, that's the thing that's worth emphasizing. It's earlier obviously on. It's he worth really the escape, it. but yeah, like what what yeah. Is, what does this mean going but, on? But it's worth keeping in mind is that this is not an ideal... This is this is far from an ideal situation for Andor. Even his means of escape is not great because he knows that it's going to tie him into stuff that he doesn't want to get involved in. I, I think if there's, like, a way to describe Andor at this point, he, he self-preservation, not at any cost, but self-preservation, you know, not getting mine yeah, into too uh, much trouble. We get a lot more of that in uh, 4, 5, 6, I would say, as well, in terms mm -hmm. of... Um... Because it's, well, this is the thing, a lot of people have said it, but the arcs in this go 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5, 6, and then 7, 8, 9, 10, and then 11, 12. Yeah. Um, it's, they are split just to create sort of uh, grander, so, smaller stories that tell a big story overall. Uh, which, is, which is a good strategy, I think, for a season. It, it can be quite engaging. It, it builds and then pays off, builds, pays off. Um, yeah. 
So let's talk about the flashbacks. Thing, I agree. All um, right, here we go with the flashbacks. We, the, the, the idea with the flashbacks is that Cassian's homeworld, uh, Canari, is essentially taken over fully by the Empire for mining. And uh, we discover in the present time that there was a disaster there that killed basically all, all or many of the inhabitants of the planet and the workers. Uh, like a toxic mining disaster that uh, made the Empire move out once it, once it had happened. Um, a ship crash lands near where they're just hanging out, their little, little tribe, and because uh, they're like uh, native to the planet, they don't have much of any technology other than what they've clearly scavenged. Like they've got pieces of plastic and metal that they fashion into different tools. Um, and yeah, so they decide like they clearly when ships crash or arrive, they go to try and uh, you know find them wherever they land and just see what they can make of the situation. Um, there's. Like a distinct, I wasn't sure what to make of this. There's distinctly no adults among them. The the oldest you get is about a, like younger teenagers. The, 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 they're clearly yeah, they're quite young. Um, I'm not sure what the idea is exactly. Um, I don't know either. I think it just might be some just some hmm material, just something to think about because it's cl it, clearly a deliberate choice. Yeah. Um. Well, and and we never but, you know, necessarily got the answer to whether or not um. You were supposed to have subtitles with them or not? Well, no. Um, th there are no subtitles. It just says speaking Canari. That's all it says. There you go. Um, Which, by the way, so it is um, an interesting I like choice. And I, I, yeah, it's neat. I like that because what it means is that they want you to watch the scenes not knowing what they're saying yeah, and only picking up what's happening through tone. Yeah, yeah and Section, and you know, um, articulation, body language. It's it's neat. They didn't it have to do neat. that, but they did. Yeah. Um, they make it to the crash ship, and there's just bodies outside of it. The... Oh well, I guess um, I don't want to. I really like the shot where it's uh, Andor looking at the massive mining operation as they're moving through because they move through the will. It's like the gradual reveal of the nature of this planet. Because at first it's like they're living out in the forest, but then as they sort of walk through the jungle, you see a couple of signs of more industrial things like some you know worn down equipment, and then big mining operation, and then they head to the ship. Yeah, like I said, they uh. The mining sort of efforts were abandoned apparently through disaster. Uh, uh yes, that's what we know now that the planet was abandoned and quarantined. Uh, so yeah, they get to the crash ship. They send what I think is their leader uh, to, you know, check out the place, see if it's safe first. She checks if the bodies are alive. They're not seem to be moving. But then one of them wakes up and, and they shoots her with a blaster. Yellow. They're yellow, and there's some gas leaking out of uh nearby yeah. as well. Um. Um, it's it's kind of crazy. He shoots her with a blaster that everyone like screams and starts shooting him with uh, little like Poison blow dots. dots. Yeah, yeah. He gets fucking pelted. He's a pin cushion <laughs> by the end of it. Uh, which yeah, th that obviously kills him. And then they all like desperately struggle to get her, presumably back to their uh, village. I don't know for medical care or she is just straight up dead. But either way, Cassian, uh, out of curiosity and partially fury, goes into the ship to go and check it out and. Uh, he, um, he, I think he, he like starts smashing shit up, breaking. Yeah, he's a little pissed, and uh, he happens to bump into Marva and Clem, who are Which, team by of the scavengers. Way, that particular transition into that scene is super smooth. It's actually it's really B2. cool. Yeah, mm. uh, B two is like worn down. He's very worn down. Old. He stutters. He's, oh he's a, yeah, he's I remember. Up, worn down little uh, droid. But then when they do the transition, it cuts from him to like a very sleek, clean. Yeah. Um, B2. And immediately it's like, oh, that's neat. It's this, cool. Uh, that was really cool. That's to the see, point where that's it's almost what we like, call oh, visual did they storytelling. Just do that? Yes. Uh, and yeah, uh, it's funny as well because in that moment he checks the oxygen and atmosphere levels to make sure it's safe for them to breathe, which is hilarious because you don't have but... to do it. But I appreciate you doing yeah. it because characters just knocking out their own fucking forces, sources of oxygen. It's not something you should do casually. But uh, they don't do this in fucking Prometheus and Alien Covenant and shit. Or rather, it's Alien Covenant specifically is what I always pick on. In Prometheus, they're a little bit better, but it's still bad. Um, yeah, I, I always appreciate shit like that. There's no reason not to have it. They had it. It was cool. Um, but yeah, the uh, he's like panicking and terrified of them. She has uh, B2 make a like a knockout stuff for the, for the kid. And um, Clem is basically saying, like, we can't possibly fucking, like, adopt a full-on person. That would be insane. we got to get out of here. we got to get what we can and get out of here. And then she's like, if we leave him, he's dead. 
like the Republic will kill him. They'll execute him. And I thought it was interesting they referred to them as the Republic as well. Because this would obviously be soon after Palpatine takes over, so it's not the Empire yet, or at least it wouldn't be called the Empire yet. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously it's the Empire by now, but um, again, just uh, that kind of attention to detail is super cool. Uh, so yeah, uh, she decides that she can't let him die. It would be a, it'd just be fucked up if she did, so she grabs him and takes them, him with her. So that's that's how Cassian, like I said, originated, for lack of a better term. It's just kind of... Thingy. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, Clem says, you better think about this. And she says, plenty of time for that. I'm not leaving him here to die. Like the implication yeah. being, yeah, I haven't thought about this, but it, I, I can't go further than I can't let this kid die. That's it's as simple as that. A good person? Gross. It's just principled thinking, right? Like it doesn't matter yeah. what the repercussions are. I have to make, I have to do this action. Uh... We do a lot with a little, if you haven't noticed. We We've, really uh, do. We do well, yeah, and, and it, it kind of reflects, funnily enough, what um what Linus said um about how can you really look your own men in the eye if you knew you didn't do everything you could sort of thing. Like, she is saying in that moment, it's like, we can do something to stop this kid from dying. Are we just going to leave him? Like, I can't. I can't do it. What can happen? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, she rescues him, and we have his sort of... Th these flashbacks are being shown at the same time as the present story progressing. And her rescue of him is being shown at the same time as the present of him, like, escaping. It, she's rescuing him from the Empire likely killing him, and at the same time as the present story of him escaping Ferex before the Empire are going to kill him again, sort of thing. It's like a big old reflection, a big old echo. And um, the squeeze of the Empire is being felt more thoroughly, just everywhere. So, um... Yeah, I'd say that the history and the present sort of matching up for the biggest events that changed Cassian's life forever sort of thing, right? Like, it goes from uh, Canari and ends up at Ferex, and now he's on Ferex, but that's all going to change forever now because he can't get out of this situation. Well, without doing some drastic changes. So, that's episodes one, two, three. Yeah. Which, um, in terms of sort of setting the stage for the the season is it's just like those three episodes it's like hmm this is like a this is not bad hmm. what are you doing show what are you doing are you like telling a story in star how, wars how dare you <laughs> we don't do that anymore go somewhere else like i said i just got a distinct impression of just giving us a character profile life and history and then enough pieces of surrounding characters and, and world to create a nice little uh sandbox and uh, it felt like the goals of this this three is to like really give us a solid understanding of who exactly cassian is it's funny yes i've heard plenty of people say like god he's such like a worthless character i don't care about i care way more about the other people and i was just like oh, i don't know i i, I, I feel like these episodes did a lot of work to basically say like he's uh He's got a lot of heart, aggression and principled thinking but he's simultaneously not looking to rock the boat at all yeah, yeah. Um, he just doesn't have enough motivation to do that. And what we're going to see over the course of the season is an accumulation of reasons to actually want to fight. That's what that's what we're going to see him go on an arc for throughout the season. And so, um, I guess because you know we haven't got all the time in the world, we'll just push on to the good old episode four out of yeah, 12. do it. And it's Which, funny. Uh, I, 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 what's yeah. that? Oh, I was just going to say, this is the episode that I think kind of, like, starts to expand our, uh... This is the one that really begins to expand the scope of the show. Yes. If those first three episodes were focused on Andor, these episodes, like, episode four is the beginning of really starting to develop a whole bunch of other POV characters. Yeah. Um, and we get some real interesting perspectives, um, from this point going forward that will just it's run funny. concurrently with the ones we already have. The way I wrote my notes for episodes one, two, three, and then four is where it starts to change. Is I, I was writing them chronologically, uh, but splitting flashback and present. But from then on, I split it POV because uh, oh. that's a way to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, well, it's just because of the nature of the way the episodes went. Is the these were much more focused around Andor the first three, but they start to split up, and there's other significant stories running alongside his, which is yeah, you know how TV shows often do it. Um, so he's with Luthen. And uh, he's just like, the fuck, this is this is a whole craft. I've never seen it do whatever. And she's like, yeah, it's just a good bit of language for he's probably using something that's uh, seen as being pretty shit, but he's modified it heavily. I mean, 
it's all gonna be like little pieces of information that let you know about Luthen's competency and experience. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they have a big old chat. Uh, he says, "I wondered who you were: Alliance, Sep, Gorilla, Partisan Front, one of them." And before I even go on with further on the dialogue, throwing like all these different names of different groups that are trying to push back against the Empire and. One of them being casually mentioned, Sep, being separatist, being the fucking army that was fought in the prequels by the, the Republic. It's just like, they've reduced down to just one of several groups that try to oppose the Empire now. Yeah. And they're not even not even a negative at all, even though, of course, that's kind of... It, it makes me think back to the potential of the prequels, right? You know, like, when Anakin executes all the separatist leaders, that is such a like horrifying moment, or at least it could be in a different story. Just slaughtering all yeah. of them when a lot of them are there just because they think that the Republic are kind of empire-ish, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, I wish the prequels had done more with the will building, that's all. Uh, I, I, I just like mentions it, because this, this, I believe, and this will become clearer the more we cover more stuff, but we kind of mentioned it in Ragnarok and some other things, that this is how you repair writing. You don't ignore your history, you do your best to incorporate yeah. the parts that work. Gotta have um, to take uh, take the baggage with you if you like it or not. It's, it's there. No, and that's you and that's the thing, right? I don't even think this one's hard. Using the separatists to your advantage in these timelines is super easy, I think. Oh uh, yeah. And you you can even just have casual mentions of the inspiring speeches that Count Dooku would be delivering. I know this is the wrong timeline for that. I just mean if you were doing it in prequel era. Um, different mm -hmm. things like that for, for leadership. But yeah, uh, Luthen says, "Isn't it all the same?" And uh, Andal says, "It is to me." Which is, uh, which is interesting, because it is to Luthen as well, uh, just for completely different reasons. Luthen sees all of it as, if you're opposed to the Empire, that's good. And, you know, it doesn't matter in what way we need to work together. Meanwhile, Andor sees them all as, like, people who are desperately trying to poke holes in an Empire that they should better off leave alone, because uh, they're only going to make things worse. It doesn't really matter what their motive is, they shouldn't be doing it. It says that, uh, it's all useless. And so Luthen says, well, better to spit in their food and steal their trinkets, which is what Andor's been doing. And he says, better to mm. live, better to eat, sleep, and do what you want. I fought in Mimban when I was 16, straight out of prison and into the mud, one of 50 men who survived. Um, uh, turned out we were fighting ourselves. And basically, like, he's talking about a, an event that would have shaped a lot of his POV uh, running forward now. What's interesting is that uh, Luthen knows more about it then he realizes, and he says, you served on the ground for six months, you served as a cook, and you lived because you ran. You were, yeah. you were, you were fighting each other, and that should make you hate them even more. Like, it, it's so interesting to just provide a completely different context that should have led him to different values, but it didn't. Um, because, you know, different events can have different results. And he says, uh, wouldn't you rather give it all at once to something real than carve off pieces until there's nothing left? <laughs> Seems to be foreshadowing his mm. ultimate fate. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, this thing we could talk about that, right? Because it's not a spoiler. It's like, yeah, this the future of this man is to give everything he can to stop, uh, to help give plans to help someone else yeah, the stop the Death plan, Star, which is right. hugely significant. His efforts are like uh, are so important to uh to the broader universe. <clears throat> they are indeed. Um. And yes, he says, like, the plan that I'm conducting right now that I want you in on is we're stealing the quarterly payroll for an entire Imperial sector. Which is a lot of money. That's a lot. It's probably a, a, lot, a lot. lot of money, yeah. And uh, I thought it was neat that he says you needed a fake name, and he goes with Clem, and that's the name of the dad that he had in the flashbacks. <laughs> right. Sort of going to be a setup, because we, we get more information on what happens to uh, his dad as time goes on. Um, and yeah, Sounds we get pretty to, snoy to me. I don't know. We get to meet. Oh, very true. Well, yeah. So it depends on what kind of order we want to do this now. I think I think we can do this episode chronological, but we'll start going POV from then on. Um, okay. We meet the ISB. My God, how beautiful! What a fascinating, what a wonderful, what a fascinating what a, what a subplot that we are about to uh, witness. This is one of them. Thank you moments for me. Thank, thank you so, so we much. we finally get a major new perspective within the Empire. What does yep. it look like when you've got the intelligence agency within the Empire? How do they operate? This and we is... get so much for this subplot that's super I can't interesting. Wait. Yeah. Mm. I mean, they're sitting around tables, so I assume someone's going to get force choked or no. thrown out of a window <laughs> or just shot randomly. Uh, oh, I can't wait. So 
This is the Imperial Security Bureau, and it's headed by Partagaz. And fuck me, do I like Partagaz. Uh, he is one of my favorites. Yep. I really like this character a lot. Like yeah. by the same guy who plays uh, Kyburn in Game of Thrones, for those who may be familiar with that. I'm not sure exactly what other stuff he's been in, but popped up here and there. Um, he's He's got a very distinct voice. Uh, I thought he may have been putting it on in Game of Thrones, but since this is the same one here, I assume that's just how he speaks. It's uh, It's very breathy and subdued. But at the same time, he holds himself quite confidently, and he can be quite threatening. It's a really cool combo. Um, comes across as the kind of person I would expect to be in charge of higher level events in the Empire. Um, and they find an excuse pretty immediately to give us an intro to the ISB that's as you know natural as I guess they can pull off. Um, it, it, there's there's a lot of complaints, but there's a lot of people saying what they're doing to try and solve problems that aren't exactly very efficient. And so he gets annoyed and he says, what do we do here? What is our purpose? Which <laughs> to me is such a like, it's as blatant as you're going to get with this level of writing in terms of the writers being like, we are now going to explain to you what the ISB are, okay? And it's like, yeah. You, okay. <laughs> he says, we are here but to... even though they're going to explain it, it's going to be explained through the perspective of this character. Yeah, there's, 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 it's not as simple. As, I mean, like I said, the prompting of it is is not exactly as clunky as it may sound. It's he's, nope. He wants to reaffirm what the point of this whole fucking place is because people aren't performing as well as he'd like. Yeah, to, he, wants to to he wants value. to recalibrate the officers, essentially. Let's get on the same page again. And uh, he offers it to the floor of, like, who wants to explain what we do? And uh, uh, Deirdre is the one that speaks up, which I think matches, like, she's... Uh, going to be our POV character, and she's quite a, yeah, go-getter. She wants to make an impression. She says, We're here to further security objectives by collecting intelligence, providing useful analysis, and conducting effective covert actions, sir. And he says, That is verbatim from the ISB mission statement <laughs> and wrong. Which is pretty interesting. He says, Security is an illusion. You want security? Call the Navy. Launch a regiment of troopers. We are healthcare providers. We treat sickness. We identify symptoms. We locate germs, whether they arise from within or they have come from the outside. The longer we wait to identify a disorder, the harder it is to treat the disease. Uh, it's a really cool intro to what their job is. Yeah. They, um, they just try to find shit going wrong and deal with it well before it can reach its full repercussions. Uh, you could think of them almost as an immune system for the galaxy. Yeah. Well, for the Empire specifically. I, I, I assume that they would think of themselves as right. They're not oh, just doing this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. the Definitely. Empire, they do it We for are the evil. <laughs> Our job so is that's the funny thing. Is, uh, and bad. The way he's describing this and the passion they all have, it's not what you might expect from the sequels where it's like, we are literally bad guys and we do things at the expense of the innocent. Woohoo, let's drink some blood. Like, it's, it's so some blood. Yeah. absurd and how bad it's gotten for the bad guys in, like, sequel content, that you must have felt kind of embarrassed making this, being like, I'm about to make the bad guys people. I hope, I like, hope, uh, you know, I hope Lucasfilm are okay with this. I hope, I hope Disney are okay with this. Because they're clowns in the, in, in everything else. But, uh, yeah, so they, they make their, their job very clear. But you've got, like, the sets, the uniforms, it's, it's all... Kind of, kind of Very gorgeous official. in terms of yeah, yeah like it's it, it, it suits it's exactly official. what you expect it to be. Which, Borderline by the way, ceremonial. when you have when you have the juxtaposition with Ferrex, which is a very industrial town, lots of uh, lots of greys and and browns, uh, in terms of like the color palette for this uh, this location, like it's very uh, it's very desaturated. Um, meanwhile, yeah, ISB is like incredibly well lit. Everything's bright yeah. and clean. It's nice just and tidy. Um, yeah, we got we got it it's a it's a lot of just, you know, telling your story through the environment. You look at uh you look at Ferrix and you look at that town and you already it's like this is a working class place. And meanwhile yeah, with the ISP, it's like, oh, this is like this is real high up the totem pole in terms <laughs> of like the Empire and, and, and um and its organizations. Um So yeah you know what? I'm changing my mind halfway through. I think we might pursue uh, the you um, the, well, yeah, because it ISB might be worth wondering. Okay, yeah, and sure. then we'll go back to Andor. So, yeah, uh, 
we find like basically what happened on Ferex with the the men getting that's reached the ISB and they're like we got to deal with this this is insane how the fuck did so many how how many how how have people died like what what is happening and it's you know like like need more information and um Deidre says the the star path unit that was recovered at the scene of the crime for like the big old shootout she says that that gives her authority because it was taken from I want to say Dear God, uh, which is her sector. Dear God, yeah. yeah. Uh, she says she's she's sort of got a theory, but access to information has been denied, leading her to uh, take the issue to Partagaz. Which, by the way, just that alone, that there is a level of compartmentalization in terms of the information that people can have. It's not just, oh, you, what, you want access to everything? Yeah, sure. There's yeah. a chain of command. Do you well, have a rule? Sure, you can have that information. You, you have have rules. A face. I was just and, about to reference that. Do you have a face? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even well, and, what we and, saw I mean, in Kenobi, like her <laughs> getting into the, she just walks in because, well, I'm your superior, so let me in, and yeah. she just gets in that way, and that's yep. the input um, HQ, and they just let her in. It's like it's such a joke, and now it's actually serious. Well, because to jump ahead a little bit, something that becomes relevant later in the story is that the Senate, spurred by Palpatine wants mm -hmm. to basically expand the powers of the ISB. They want to give them, like, a, a, a mandate and the capacity to uh, exert more, like, to have less bureaucracy to enable them to essentially um, more uh, viciously, I guess, pursue their uh, objectives. Yes. But it's just that that, right, that we have it established that there are rules here. This is, this is an organization that needs to function in some sense, and part of what it means to function is to have rules that bind the people who are part of it. Yep. And a level of uh, chain of command and bureaucracy. Yep. And I mean, that's part of what we see with uh, Deidre in this episode is, is playing the game of uh, bureaucracy. Yeah, I love the fact that they have to go through official channels needs. that one could consider yep. this laborious. I found it interesting. I was like, this it's so yeah, interesting. Because, because you don't, you, when she starts like talking about stuff and then the boss man goes like, well, yeah, but you don't really have any information on that, right? Like, it's just theorizing. He's like, yeah. It's like, well, come back to me when you have more, uh, we have better information, and then we can. Well, so I actually want to give again. more. I'm going to give more credit to that because I really like that scene. It's, it's some uh, that another whole moment of impressing great. me. So, she's yeah, with. Yeah. Um, she's taken the issue to Partagaz, and there's a guy who controls the sector. She wants access to. It's those two butting heads, basically. You can't have access to my sector. Stick to your own sector. And she's like, I deserve it because pieces of my sector were taken to yours. Like the, It sounds like a normal kind of complaint to have. So who decides? Partagaz will. And so he's like, all right, make a case. And she says, the stolen item has great value, particularly to the rebels. Tracing its theft might expose activity in my sector. It is my feeling that this is part of an ongoing effort to steal proprietary imperial uh, equipment in anticipation of an organized rebellion. I have three previous case files on my desk that begin to suggest a pattern. The reason I really like this dialogue is she packs so much into that. But there's one thing yeah. she said that's more important than anything, and Partagaz picks up on it, and he just responds, a feeling? Yeah. Like, he's cut right it's... to the point. Yep. Because that's what he does persistently in all of his scenes. It's like, let's cut through the fluff. Tell me what you're actually saying, or I'll, t I'll identify it for you. Yeah. Um... And I mean, it's it's the nature of it, right? By trying to fluff up what she has, she's she's basically presenting that she has way more than she actually does, and he's smart enough to know that. So it's like, is that really enough to give give her access to a different sector? It sounds like she's overreaching. Um, yeah. So yeah, he he wants more, and she says there are similar items of interest. There are repeated methods, uh, gut instinct. And then he just says, we act on vetted and verifiable information. Alert me when this materializes into something more definite. Until then, stick to your sectors. Yeah, and something that's, that's worth emphasizing as well is that it is identified by the other officer. It's like, you're just trying to get more for yourself. Like, yep. you're playing the game of career. You're trying to advance. I have more sectors than you. You want, you want access to these sectors. Like, I'm not going to let you do that. Just the infighting within this organization... Yeah. Yeah, sure. Maybe they all have the same broad objective, but that doesn't mean that they all agree on everything. Or there's not I mean there's clearly office politics going on here. Yep. Yeah. Which is and then exactly we, what and would happen with well, something like, this broad and uh well extensive. Yeah, exactly. And we even see like Deidre has her own uh people. Um I can't remember there there was one officer with her in particular who's like constantly working with her to try and get information and push things forward. And he even has a couple of moments in the season where he like uh, sort of chirps up to help her, and then it works, and it gets her through the situation, gets her what she needs. Yep. 
we just get to see a really in-depth look at the uh at the inner workings of a, a part of the empire and it's like thank you finally i yeah, just want really stuff cool. like this um, and uh, Partagas says, he does, I will admit, hew to traditional viewpoints of this office and its staffing. Which I'm not sure if he means male versus female hiring, or if he means that she's inexperienced. And I think they are vague on purpose with this. He says, um, I'm sure he is a challenge to work with, but his reports are in and yours are not. There's a high bar for your yeah. performance. Unfair, perhaps, but senseless to ignore and potential and uh, potentially the foundation of a uniquely superior career. You're supposed to be competent and tucked away. Um, of course, I guess he's trying to lay out to her how she can be successful, where she can go, and so if she keeps pushing and failing, uh, it's going to have really bad results. She's, yeah. a, she's a bit of a risk taker, so yeah, you get a good shot of her at the end of the scene of being like, fuck, like I've really got to yeah, get a win out. out of this. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> And uh, that actually closes her out for the episode, so we can now roll back to Cassian, I think. I can find where we are. Well, they're off to Aldani. Yes, Aldani, a new planet again. A new place! Seems to be, Aldani, uh... Aldani, a new place. It's not even Tatooine! Like a... what? No, no Tatooine this season, thank <laughs> not, god. Not even a... Just do we even get places. a desert planet? We no, get... we don't. We I, Well, I think the closest we get is the, uh... The, Eryx the, is kind of dusty. Um, that's more... Yeah, but I guess it's it's less like a, um, a sort of like a Sahara, sort of that kind of desert, more yeah. of like a, like, you know, like the American Southwest kind of, uh, rocky sort of desert. Um, yeah, yeah, but, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aldani is uh it seems more like Scottish Highlands kind of uh kind of vibe, at least in the area that we get to uh we get to see in the show. So uh yeah, we're cool new planet and Luthan's like, I gotta go speak to this lady who's gonna be your boss, basically. Uh, Stay in the ship. Yeah, she's not gonna Stay like Stay here. This. Something I like while he goes and talks to her is there's there's a shot where we come back to Andor's looking at them for a while, and then he looks at the steering wheel. Yeah, and he sits yeah. here for a little while, and then the little droid says, "Is there anything I can help you with?" <laughs> like, <laughs> I love that because I, ha I just, I can't help but infer that the droid was like, "You ain't stealing this shit, buddy. Don't even try." <laughs> like, yeah. What do you mean? Well, it, 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 it's an important thing to remember. Andor does not want to be here. He no. does not want to be doing this. All he wanted to do was sell his little ship part and get the hell out of here. He got some money. He does not want to be involved in the cause. The Conversation between Luthen and uh, her name is Vel, I believe, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, That's right. She's, she's going to be. I, I would go as far as saying she's pretty much POV. Um, uh, yeah, she is. She uh, is. She's quite an yeah. interesting, uh, important character. So, yeah, their conversation, it feels like Luthen's on the back foot. He's basically having to argue how it's okay that for the significant and controversial job we're doing that I'm adding some guy in three days before we're doing it, which this thing has been planned for months, I think, right? Yes. Oh yeah. Um, it is long for, for a while. while. Yeah. Um, and he says, "I'm buying cr critical redundancy. You know I'm right. You're wasting energy." And she like is getting more and more annoyed. And he says, uh, "In the next three days, if for any reason," and she's like not caring. She goes, "Look at me!" And it's just like, "Oh, oh shit." Okay. <laughs> like he's uh, mm -hmm. he's he's very serious about this. He believes Cassian's the right call. Um, he says, "If anything goes wrong, you cancel the mission." And she says, "If he's the problem." And then uh, Luthen says he's disposable. Yep. So, uh, this this Luthen guy, lots of lots of information we've been given in terms of what he wants to do, what his values are that aren't necessarily fully matching up yet. He's, he seems complicated, very multi multi dimensional. Um. So I, uh, yeah, they start heading back, and one thing I really like is that um, the sight and sound of one Tie Fighter moving through the area slowly is like terrifying to them. Yes. Yes. And I, was, and I was like, oh, thank really nice. fuck, man. <clears throat> Scaling it all the way back down so that one TIE fighter's, like, little, that scream almost of it going past, just, it's jet black. It's moving through the area as, like, a sentry. It's just like, yeah, that's scary. Instead of just seeing it's them all get blown once. apart yep. constantly and nobody gives a shit. It's like, oh, no, yeah. TIE fighter. Ooh. It's like, singular no. units can be, you know, intimidating and dangerous. Especially TIE Fighter versus just a human. Uh, TIE Fighter's gonna win, like, every time. <laughs> it only, and, and it's just about raising the alarm, you know? Like, and it raising only the takes alarm, one yeah. person to see you and spot yeah. you. 
Like, what are know. these weirdos down there doing? What's, what's going on? Um, so yeah, uh, we, we get our new cast of characters. We've got a team that's going to be doing this job. Because uh, obviously there's some other plot lines happening, but we, we'll just go through them chronologically, like I said, at this point. Uh, it, piece by piece, people by people. So, um... You have. I'm gonna. Uh, we're gonna have to work together to remember all the names of these people. Well, so you've got Nemec. I definitely remember him. Yeah, he's asleep on the job, right? He's the first person we actually meet. Yes, he is. Um, right. He is asleep on the job, and they even have a conversation. <laughs> he has a conversation with um. Uh, it was it was it was Skeen. Skeen. That was a guy. Yeah. yeah. Skeen. Cause, yeah. Because it's, it's like uh... you're asleep. Like we could all be dead because you're asleep. Um, and then, and then I think he says something, uh, like Nemec says, don't tell, uh, Vel. It's like, no, you, you'll tell her. Yeah. yeah. Which, which characterizes both of them straight away as just valuable yep. information. One of them is no nonsense, do the job properly. This is incredibly important. The other one, not, you could argue not quite taking it as seriously, a little bit more forgiving about I think, the nature I think of the situation. It's, um, and Nemec is green. Like he's, true, uh, yeah. he's new. He's, he's not experienced clearly. Um, um yeah, and like when we got Cinta as well. Yeah, when Cassian is introduced to the team, you get like it's a bit late for surprises, like like a very you know. Ooh, but then yeah, uh, Nemec yeah. is like, "Good to have you, Clem. We can take all the help we can get." You know, like a uh, such different responses <laughs> in terms of the. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, everybody's a bit different because the the thing with like Cinta is she's I don't think she says anything, but you just know she's looking at him like, oh, yeah. "What the hell are you doing here? Like, who are you?" Cinta's um, a pretty good example of. Uh, very simplistically characterized and and comes through on those pieces of information we're given. Uh, yeah, the, the biggest yeah. action I mean, Cinta takes it's just efficiently written. Yeah, the biggest action she takes matches entirely what we knew about it. Um, that's throughout the season. It's but mainly it's, uh, it's it's Bart Kona who's like the most. I think that's his name. Uh, former stormtrooper guy. He's the one who's like most vocal in terms of expressing. Yeah, you can tell frustrations. He is super like I don't want anything to not be under our control sort of guy. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah, that's, that's a clear indication. And I quite like uh, as we well, got... uh, how do you know yeah. him? He comes highly recommended, so you don't know him. Yeah, <laughs> it just immediate. we've got so many examples of that throughout the show where it's just like, you're bullshitting me. Like, I know that you're not telling me the truth or and it's, you're obfuscating the truth and I'm really, just going to uh, cut through that. cool dynamic because she was given bullshit and that she's been told she has to deliver this bullshit now. Yes, like, and uh, she has to try and do it com convincingly. And she's not great at it. No, and, and that's the thing. Luthan basically just told her, like, you know I'm correct. This is an extra man. There's no reason not to trust him. Trust me that I trust him. And that, and then she's like, trust me that I trust him, basically. That's how a lot of characters get things moving, is just put my word on the line, okay? All of you can sort of shut the fuck up. We can move on. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he's obviously they take quite a bit of issue with, with him being here. Uh... So we find out, uh, as part of them planning this whole job, that uh, it's so funny to see this line come up, right? So there are 40 men garrisoned at this big old place, and you're like, well, the quarterly payment of an entire sector doesn't <laughs> I know seem... what you're referring to already. It's like, only 40 men defending it? And they're like, well, they don't expect anybody to actually try and fucking steal this shit. And it's like, oh my god, it's the same use <laughs> of a particular writing strategy as in a little episode of Kenobi where... Mm -hmm. They look at this enormous building, it's the headquarters of the Inquisitors, and they say, why aren't there any shields? Well, because nobody would be stupid enough to try and attack them. That now, why don't we highlight the difference between these two, why one works <laughs> and one doesn't? There are only 40 people resources. stationed on a remote garrison that is just not considered to be that important, and even if somebody tried to steal something from them, they still generally have the resources to prevent that from happening. Yeah, now, they the got less, 40 people you know, in their equipment, yeah. It's a big, it's a big galaxy, <laughs> they got a lot of things to oversee. As 40 we've people seen, isn't small, they... even, you know? Like, in terms of closed hallways and a no, significant really. area to defend, 40 is still a decent chunk of people to fight. And but to oh, be yeah. clear, it... we're comparing this against the headquarters of the Inquisition. Yes. Well, yeah, so, so, so to just tie a bow on it in Andor, it's like, it's just allocation of resources. You have a finite number of resources to spread across a massive galaxy. To some extent, the Empire is just going to be stretched thin. You can't afford to have, like, 100 or 200 people in a place that you don't expect anything bad to happen. Um, so that's the reason why. It's just understuffed because it's they're stretched thin and they don't think that anything bad's going to happen there. Compared yeah. to 
Why don't we turn the shields on our Inquisitor base? Well, nobody would come here. That's stupid. So why no one would we would be turn dumb on enough the to attack this incredibly valuable military and intelligence target? When why wouldn't we just turn like, on the shields? I feel yeah. like what your energy bill is going to be a little bit higher, sure, but like, what is the real cost of turning well, yeah, it on? Uh, Especially with how lax their security is at the front fucking gate. Yes, God, can all be bad. All right, that's the that's <laughs> that's very is. bad. If you like it, you're bad. wrong. Um, the last member of the team is a guy who is actually still actively uh, a member of... Yes, um, Lieutenant Gorn. Yes, he's he's a... And he is very angry when he finds out that Andor's there. He's yeah, he thinks this is hyper bullshit. Um, I quite like as well that they ask him to leave his boots... Or they leave, they leave his belt and gloves behind because uh, he can obviously get extras with little issue, but they need more from, uh, to create a new yeah. uniform. Yeah. But I mean, in terms of having gone here now, it's like we have our we have our team, and everybody's different. Every single person on this team is different. Yeah. And as yeah. we'll learn over the next couple of episodes, they all have different perspectives on the Empire and the Rebellion, and like what they need to do as people. Well, like yeah, the strategy are. I would argue for writing is that episode one we just introduce all of these people and what the plan is and how it's going to work, and then episode two we start to learn about what they all value as people. Yep. As uh, we start to see more in more depth what the plan them, yeah. is going to be. What is the plan, actually? And for those um, listening, the plan is that there is a famous event that happens on this planet called the Eye, where it's a series of the equivalent of comics, comets flying across the sky all at once, like thousands. And, yeah. Uh, the idea is that it's going to be such a distracting event that it's probably the best time to organize a heist, and that's when they're going to do it, and it's coming up soon. Um, relatively simple. It happens every few years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which... and, and the thing is, is, that's really cool is that over the course of the next few episodes, we get to learn a lot more about the eye and how the locals on this planet feel about it, like how important it is culturally to them, yeah. uh, as well as perspectives of people in the empire as about the, the natives, eye, yeah. um, in, in terms, and, and to the, to the people who live on the planet. And I know we're jumping ahead a bit, but something, no, we'll leave it actually, because it's more relevant in episode six. All right. Uh, so that's it for Cassian's plotline and the ISB, which leaves uh, Cyril which leaves, and Luthan. Uh, um, we'll and go with well, Mon Mothma, right? She's she's uh, she's about to be introduced through Luthan's plotline. Um, oh right, I get yeah yeah I get you. So yeah, the what we see of Luthan heading back to Coruscant is that he's uh, he changes his whole like outfit and wig. Yeah. And, um, they they give you a few like the, the so like a point that's funny about it right is that you see him put it on as like a normal person wig but um I just think it's amusing because it's movie quality the second he turns around right like uh, of right. course yeah <laughs> it ain't like a Halloween store type wig it's like it's gorgeously done maybe he's an expert in doing that or it's a sci-fi thing either way though it's just I like that they give us so much time for he's got the sort of the rebel insurrectionist type personality and now he's trying to get into his um, shop owner of uh, rare artifacts selling and trading them and stuff character that has a whole like I said it's it's a whole costume he's wearing and uh, what's cool is once he gets it all on he starts like changing up his body language and his expressions and preparing yeah, himself a little bit basically. more flamboyant just a little bit more flamboyant but then like it drops very quickly yeah, after, um, like practicing for a little bit. It's the kind of shit that I love to see. Cause it's, it's giving Stellan Skarsgård a guy who can really do it. Lots of things to do. He's yep. acting. He's an actor who's acting as a a character acting. Yes, uh, you love to see it. Um. So yeah, he he holds up a shop that just trades items of interest, like uh, artifacts and antiques and stuff. And uh, Mon Mothma visits. You know her. You know her from the. Yes. The old uh, the OT, and she popped up in Rogue One. She is she is a Star Wars character of interest, and here she is, actually moving around in the world, being important. We're gonna get a lot more on what? here, and I feel like it's worth mentioning since we already did it with Luthan anyway. What a fantastic job the actress does with yeah the, Hell yeah with Mon Mothma. This yeah. is damn. This is probably ooh. This is arguably best Might performance. Be the best performance. With, yeah. Might this be. is really yeah. good shit. And you you have to know that she must have made an impact for us to mention that we don't like everyone's doing a pretty good job in this. But man, she's uh, she's something else with her expressions. She really lets you something know else. what Mon Mothma's thinking about. We got a lot of great stuff in the Mon Mothma uh, subplot. And so it's like a really. Perspective that we get to explore in the show. 
And what's cool is they don't give you everything away straight away. She arrives and she's talking to Luthen about like different pieces to buy. And they they have this whole like false conversation that we go through just like the characters do, but it's all for one person in that room. It's it's got nothing to do with anything other than that. It's uh Yeah. She has a new driver. And so everything they talk about in the room is all actually irrelevant. They don't care about it. They find an excuse in the middle of the conversation to go check the back to see if he's got something in that she wants. And the second they get out of earshot, they drop it, both of them do, and they start talking as uh, yeah. rebels, basically. Uh, it's, it's just really cool shit. It's really cool how instant it is. Like, they go for him, they have, like, the smile, and it's like, okay, what's up? Time for business. Like, we gotta do shit. We have a new driver. It's, uh, it's quite something to see. It's really cool. Really good. And Mon Mothma is basically... She is Luthen's way of getting access to money and that he can then spend on different people doing different actions to further their goals as rebels. She's explaining to him he's having trouble getting access to money at this point, that things are going wrong, and that she wants to bring someone in to help. And he's like, that's a fucking insane bad choice, what do you mean? And uh, they're both feeling a little bit trapped in terms of funding. And... Uh, he seems pretty angry with her, and he says it's a daring... Like, back when they're being able to be listened by the driver, he says, it's a daring choice, but I trust you'll have the courage to turn back if it should be a bit much. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of code talking in some of Luthen's scenes, and this isn't quite the one I would pick. There's a couple to come that I would like to dig yeah. into a little bit for what is said. Um, which... Is that is that it for that? For Luthen and... Well, we get to meet uh, Mon Mothma's husband, and there's... He is clearly not, um... Mr. Mothma. They don't really sync very well. No. Uh, or do different people. She's quite socially responsible, uh, passionate about, you know, helping people. He's just kind of, um... Enjoying life as a uh, rich person. Yeah, pretty much. He's not, uh, he's not particularly passionate about anything. He's just enjoying life. Yeah. And, uh, that causes problems when you're married to someone who is very much opposite in terms of where she's aiming her resources, but um, yeah, that leaves us with just the one last plotline to sort out, which is the Cyril one. We open with the Cyril, the Superior, and um, uh, Linus. They're all just being chewed out, basically, for the absolute failure on Ferex. Complete fuck-up. And funnily enough, the person who's doing it is the sector manager from the ISB. The one that's competing yep, with now Deirdre. Mm, the Empire's right, right. moving in permanently to this sector. Um, Primor's done. Empire's taken over. Yep. yep. He said, you will not be replaced. You've rung the final bell. As of this morning, the Molana system is under permanent imperial authority. Which just sounds like the fist is closing, basically. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of it is laid directly at the feet of Cyril. And all of this Even was told was by that superior in the first episode. He said this would happen if you make waves, if you fuck up, it'll... We'll yeah. lose our chill and night. All those people who aren't doing their job particularly well, but acceptably, all of them are probably now going to be forced to do the job excellently. It's going to be under hyper surveillance. Well, you know? those of them who still keep their jobs, because a lot of them got fired, clearly. Yep. So, like, Cyril's decisions have had significant repercussions uh, that would absolutely be considered negative as hell, and he's not feeling too yeah, great yeah. about it. Nice to see that there's actually repercussions for the I'm fuck up he did. Exactly. And not like, oh, you, 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 you bad. Now go back to work. It's like, no, no, you're he's fired, basically, if I recall correctly. So, like... also lets us know that the empire is associated with efficiency and yeah. you know, in, you know, order. Yeah, order. it's not. Oh, oh, the Imperials are coming. We could kill them easy. They're they're no match for us. They're they stink. They're bad. Oh well, yeah, typically like, you no, need to throw empire's... a banana peel on the floor, and they will find it. They will trip and up. they'll kill themselves with it, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then we get like a series of shots of Cyril just sort of heading home, being incredibly yeah. depressed. He's lost his job, he's lost pretty much everything, and it's all because he was and the trying. set design. Yeah, it, it, it feels like a the world. Thing. It's so oppressive. Like, it's just him going through like these massive, just concrete apartment buildings. Yep. Um, like these incredibly dense blocks, very little color making its way through. Um, and he's yeah, he's heading home. It, it all just too. it's so deliberate. Yeah, we got time to really soak in what's happening with this character. Um, yeah, he's gone to live with his mum because he's not going to be able to live on his own anymore. With the situation yeah. he's in, he gives him a slap and then she gives him a hug. Yeah. 
And already it's just like, man, the Cyril plot line I expect to be very interesting. Oh yes. Like by this point I was I was super interested. It's like, what are we gonna do with this character? It could he could go in any number of directions and I'm interested to see what they do. Well, once you've had this time with him and you know what he's like, the idea of seeing him with his mother, what is she, what must she be like? You know, yeah. what is he like at home? You know, just and what, around. what's his plan now? What's his plan? For yeah, the future? How does he, he do? feel about what's happened that he tried to do what he thought was the right thing and everything just went totally wrong, especially when we know just based on the way that he was acting, that that was like an important job to him to, to like fill out that kind of role in the world. What's he going to do? Uh, which takes us to episode five. On, on we go. Uh, we'll start with the Cassian plot line. That's probably how we'll do it with most of these. Uh, so he wakes up and his pistol's gone. Gary, oh. what the fuck? No, um, not my pistol. But uh, it turns out it's being checked by Skeen. Um, I can't remember if it's being checked for like efficiency or something else, but uh, still. I think it's just clean up, bit of a, maintenance stuff. Bit of them shifty yeah. eyes on Skeen though, right? Just keeping them shifty eyes. Shifty eyes. Um, but yeah, they have a chat about uh, sort of what links them to specifically, and uh, Skeen says you've noticed what I've got branded on me is a evidence of being having served time, basically, uh, in more than one place, I think, as well. And the reason he recognizes it is because he's served time as well. Um, nobody else has there, so it's kind of what relates the two of them. And um, yeah, uh, Skeen says the axe forgets, but the tree remembers, in reference to it's a great quote. Yeah, what um, what he the implication, of course, what happened to him, he's not forgotten, and uh, the empire is to blame. And then in response to that, uh, Andal says, "So that's why you're here, revenge." I love the response the scheme gives. Says that's good enough for now. Mm-hmm. Ah, <laughs> that's yeah. Especially knowing where it all where it all where goes. All yeah. Um. So yeah, and then we we uh, he starts describing the team. He says Namek is a true believer. Sinter is stone cold. She's the toughest one here. And um, we got the lieutenant. And Andal says the lieutenant could be leading us to a trap. Like, what? How do we know that's not the case? And Ski just says maybe that's why you're here. Listen, like you could be leading us to a trap. Fucking who knows? Yeah. This, this this there's a lot of uncertainty with this. Well. If uh, if he was leading him into a trap, it would have been sprung a long time ago. They've been doing this for months. There's nothing stopping the Empire from coming to grab him. Yeah, and and but just to a degree, there's just some stuff you're not going to be able to guarantee. That's just how it works. Some of stuff, course. It sucks, but, you know, that's the nature of the job they're trying to conduct. Um, but then we get, we get access, uh, introduced to this navigation tool that uh, Nemec is helping them use, and uh, he says it can't be jammed or intercepted. Once you master this, you, you're free. Relying on things provided by the Imperials have us forgetting freedom by design. Like it, um, kind of cool. The idea that you're provided tools and programs and access through imperial like recommendation and advice, and it's um this this comes up in the uh next arc, but it's like a game and a framing you're provided by your oppressors helps to control you while convincing you you're given freedom. Like you're, they make you learn tools and aspects that are under sort of their control instead of learning things that are actually giving you lots more um, options and freedom. You could kind of like relate this to um, the difference between like Apple and Linux. Like uh, it takes a lot more work, but once you get like the core components and understanding of like machines down, you can do whatever you want. Meanwhile, when you use stuff that's like corporately approved and restricted, but still made with UIs that are super accessible, you, you can do... You can feel like you can do mostly everything, but you'll find loads and loads of invisible walls and dead ends. Um, and he's just explaining that that's the way that the tools work. They're much more complicated, but if you can learn the ones that aren't provided by the Imperials, you can get much more access to control and uh, subversion and stuff. Kind of neat. It is interesting. Yeah, it really is. It, you, you get these Imperial perspectives and the perspectives of the Empire, both sides going both ways. Um, and it's... Yeah, I mean, it's really nice to see. Because remember, there was once a time when a certain trailer for The Force Awakens came out and we saw, like, this um, th this beleaguered um, stormtrooper taking off his helmet. And we're like, oh, are they going to try to make, like, stormtroopers a character? Is this going to be one of someone we follow? And we're super excited and everything. That just never amounted to anything. It was almost immediately, you know, um, nixed and undone. 
deal with it. And, and here we have, you know, just another, you know, little brick on that wall of building a house that is kind of a, just a bunch of nice soft world building. It's going to be well, in this case, it's, it's, a, it's a cool rebel sort of POV where we get different perspectives on the rebellion. And Nemec is very, he, he's, a, he's a real interesting one. Um, cause it's, it's like, yeah, he, he's very much dedicated and, and to the cause and he, he gives a lot of thought to his, uh, framework, like his moral framework and his, his philosophical political framework. Um, and I mean, it, it even reflects in the fact that his choice of tools is driven by a philosophical framework more so than a matter of utility. The, like, I think that he really extracts a lot of value personally from knowing how to use, um, I guess you could say analog technology because mm -hmm. he believes it's liberating. And in a, and and as we later come to to discover, right, it, he's right. He's vindicated in his perspective um, to jump yeah, the gun a little bit. It, like yeah, the old stuff. His use know. of this tool is really critical uh, to the success of the to the success of the mission. Um, he says, uh, well, Skeen says he's writing a manifesto. Apparently, the only thing keeping us from liberty is a few more ideas. And uh, he comes out with a line, uh, Nevik, that I love. He says, the pace of oppression outstrips our ability to understand it. Like, uh, the speed, even though it's slow, of the buildup of oppressive systems, it happens in such a way that it's, by the time you can even contemplate what's being taken away from you, the next one is on top. And, uh, yeah. It's, it's Which one? Like, um, there's another line like that later in the uh the I can't remember exactly who said. Oh no, it's uh it's it's um it's Luthen, uh in his big old speech in episode ten. Mm. Well, definitely he says something very that. similar. Oh yeah, that was one of those mm. ones where instead of writing Ooh. down a quote, I just wrote down the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's good shit. That was real good shit. Um, I really like Nemec. Um. Yeah, he he's. Uh, I, found him, I found him super interesting. Uh, he also gets provided special milk, uh, Cass, <laughs> and he, it, he clearly thinks it tastes like shit. And then before he goes off to talk more about the mission, they're like, "Oh, you should finish your milk." And he like goes uh, and tosses it out. And the part that I just thought was really funny is it sounds like it's sizzling on the floor, like it's melting the grass or something. <laughs> I think I, I, I think it was. Did he toss it? Was there a fire in front of him? Oh, I think there was a fire. I'm, yeah. I'm joking either way. I just find oh, it amusing <laughs> that like it's yeah. so it's horrible. Like xenomorph, <laughs> xenomorph, like milk, milk just melts yeah. through the ground. Um. So yeah. Uh. I quite like that the, they basically try to get information out of uh, and or about the ship they're going to be piloting without revealing to him that they basically don't know how it works. Yeah. Um, I thought it was such a great thing. Yeah, he realizes pretty soon because they ask him uh, how is the weight calculated or something like that, but they deliver it as a sort of quiz question. Like, you know, you should know this, but then he quickly is like, wait, do you not know? Uh, they're sort of just like, uh... And like he explains how so it's done. And then he's just like, you know what, fuck this, I'm piloting. And then she says, no, you'll do as you're told. And he says, you can tell him it's your idea, but if my ass is on the line, I'm getting us out of there. And I love that. He recognized pretty quickly what the problem is. You can't change the fundamentals of the plan. I'm the leader. And it's like, yeah, fine. It was your idea. I don't care. I'm piloting. Yeah. Yeah. I, something I really like about Andor is he is he is intelligent. Like, Andor is a smart guy. Yeah. You he know what it is, though? It's not the, it's like the writer's smart enough to write him smart. You know what I mean? Uh, well, yeah, but I mean, we'll, we'll be we'll be complimenting that throughout the show because there's a lot of examples of the writers making some really clever decisions in terms of plotting that like stem through the character decisions. There's a subplot in particular involving Luthen and the ISB in like a sort of a, almost like a proxy battle that we'll get to later that is clearly indicative of like, man, the writers, they knew what they were doing. They had a plan. They're smart. They, they, um, they crafted a scenario that's super interesting. And all of the characters react to it logically. But I mean, in the case of Andor, it's just, this is yet another example of many that we'll get through the show where like Andor cuts through, um, I guess you could say like the fog and the noise to just identify the core problem. He, he does that a lot where it's just like, no, let's, let's get real. Like this is actually what the conversation is. Um, in this case being, you, oh, holy shit, you guys didn't even know, like, anything about this ship. Alright, fine, I'm, I'm flying it. Yeah, and he says, like, what the I, hell were you, you gonna do if I wasn't here? And they were like, I wasn't here, we would've yeah. made it work. Like, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, would you? I mean, this is really good from a plotting perspective. It just gives them more reason. It, it just it just gives Andor a little bit more protection, in a sense. Uh, it becomes harder and harder for them to have any reason to discard him from uh, the mission. Yeah. 
Like, it's just smart, right, in setting up a scenario where it's like, we know that the, all of these characters are going to mistrust Andor. We know that he's sort of got an uphill battle in terms of being able to participate in this mission. What are we doing? It's like, well, if we imagine it like, I don't know, like a chess game, we've given him a couple extra pieces that just give him an advantage um, that protect him. It's, it's just good stuff. It's, it's, it's well thought out, clearly. Mm -hmm. Part of this plan is going to involve them pretending to be troopers for a decent amount of time. And so yes. we get a scene of basically the ex-trooper teaching them how to be troopers. Well, I think we don't know that he's a, an ex-stormtrooper yet, do we? Or did oh, well, was that I, something I, that... I think um... you already mentioned it, so... Oh, well, I already mentioned it, but but I don't think we find that out until later. So it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that follows. Well, yeah, in retrospect, obviously, it's just a benefit to the the narrative that he would be teaching them that and he would know how to teach them that. Um, yes. And it's just, it's, I don't know, man. It's just like, And also makes sense. that, that uh, his discipline, like the it's training insane. that he would have received as a stormtrooper is still present. There's a lot of times where he's like, pick it up or, you know, like, um, you know, like get he's back, sergeant, like get in yeah. order. Yeah, get it. And then we get this really great moment where they're doing their practicing march and Andor being the observant, like perceptive person that he is, Notices like, oh, we, we all hold our guns differently. Maybe we should rearrange the order that we're standing in so that we all have our guns on the outside in case yeah. shit goes wrong. And um, he's resistant to it at first, but he, he actually changes it because Andor's right. Yeah. It was clever. Good idea. I think uh, <laughs> we see a moment in Ferrex where the control and the clutches of the ISB are getting more and more and even... They, they shoot it so that, like, the sector head is looking around and, like, men sort of, like, like troopers stomp by in a in a series of four, and then they cut to the training sequence where it's happening. Yeah, a lot like, of smooth transitions. Mm -hmm. They're definitely doing it deliberately. Yeah. yeah. The thought it happened by accident. Nice neat. Um, so... Yeah, uh, we, we get pieces as well of the lieutenant setting things up over on the actual, like, base. We know, obviously, that he's on our side, so to speak. Um, and uh, he goes to the shrine where everyone's going to be collecting to watch the eye, and there's just a bunch of junk there and target practice and bullshit. And he's like, why the hell hasn't this been cleaned up? And the guys are just like, I don't know. <laughs> and I think part of it is to imply that they just couldn't give less of a fuck about the people who, the, the cultural sort of native people here. They're just like, I don't care. This is their, like, sacred shrine place, and they've bored, just got shit all over it. But they're it. just bored. And they, got, they just yeah. want to shoot shit. They're bored. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, like, he keeps threatening... The idea is, like, threatening the soldiers uh, in terms of if they don't do what they're supposed to do, then they will be refused from being able to see the eye. And, of course, yeah. that's, that's, like, a, a thing of... You really do want to see the eye, but at the same time, it's like he wants them to want to see the eye, because they're going to be busy that night with a certain thing happening that's definitely not the eye, so... This is, a, uh, this is like a thing that's worth honing in on. We see it in episode five and six. The guys who are stationed here, they really want to see the eye. Yeah. They just want to see it. It's people, they want to see it. It's this. Oh yeah, nobody. It's ac absolutely it. yeah. It's they make a big yeah. There's there's a good. Well, it's just people uh, just I, say you. I want to see it. I want to go check it out. I want to go take a look. Like it's actually a sight worth seeing. And jump the people. gun a little bit because there's a part where Lieutenant Gorn is like he he's inside of the base in the area where they're actually going to like steal the ship. And um, they're, they're talking about, like, they need to get stuff sorted, right? Because there's going to be, like, Imperial, like, higher-ups coming to visit. And everything needs to be, like, in tip-top shape. Uh, and it's like, well, you guys got to clean it. And, like, you, you know what? You'll be cleaning it during the eye. And then I think that the guys basically say, um, man, like, nobody really wants to be, like, an Aldani. It's not, like, a really preferable place to get stationed. But, like, it would really hurt morale if 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 more people than necessary didn't get to see this this uh this event. Yeah. Um it's just these kind of things to humanize the people who were within the Empire. It's like yeah, at the I end of the day, they're shit. like people stationed there. They're human beings who wanna see a really interesting cosmic event. Um that like the fact that that's baked into it is just like it's relevant for plot. Like it's it's relevant in terms of the plot because like you said, Lieutenant Gorn wants to actually get as many people as possible out there. Um, yeah. because it's better for the mission, but it's it's just working off of the fact that the people who who are here would just want to see it because they're not automatons; they're humans. Well, and like there is uh, Gorn's scenes, uh, you find out Gorn's motivation is that he fell in love with a local girl here, and as a result, lost her and lost his promotion. Uh, yeah, like it's just discouraged to the point of being absolutely cruel. So he just he lost investment in the empire completely, but. It's not just that he is surrounded by people who just shit on the locals, and they do yeah. a lot of it is um, 
relatively subtle in terms of, like I said, the disrespect of sort of like any customs or uh, cultural landmarks. But you also have like, he's like, oh, how many people are going to be arriving this time? And he's like, at one point it was as many as a thousand. And he's talking to like the, the comms guy and he's just like, imagine like 5,000. It was a bunch. Yeah. No, that's a different uh, part. I'm talking about when... I'm, no, the... I, I don't mean that part either. I, I think here it was something like that, too. It was a bunch. I think it was more than that. I got it written down. <laughs> so, Lies. It says, uh, no, I'm, I'm thinking of the other thing. Yeah, you're thinking the of the one with... I no, I, I know that one was that number, but I also think that this one was a similar number. He says, um, how many people are coming? He says, don't know. Last time it was like a, a, a hundred, a thousand. And then he says, can you imagine a thousand? Could you imagine the smell? <laughs> and uh you could tell Gorn is just like oh, that's great man like yeah uh and once you know his motivation it's it's just that it's all it's going to do is encourage Gorn to go ahead with the plan basically you you guys suck i hate all of you like fuck all of you yeah sort of just thing. further motivation to follow through <clears throat> um and yeah we get another like the there's this painting that's not finished and he says do it tomorrow night and then they're like oh man that's one yeah like if we do we it tomorrow night we want to see the eye see man the eye. And, and then yeah. And you can tell Gorn is like, all right, fine. I will allow you to see the eye. You've got to get it done. Then as he's walking off, he's like smiling because obviously yeah. <laughs> the goal there is to make them invested in the eye as much as possible. And just builds his cover more and more, yep. you know, just helps build his cover. Um, but yeah, and then uh, Andor, I don't know if he's like sleeping or if he's chilling out, but he gets a knife to his throat and Skeen is like, motherfucker, you're wearing a stone worth 30,000 credits. Why the hell would you have that on this mission? Yeah, Which, Kyber Crystal. By the way, I find really amusing. It, it, there's, there's a good point that's made with all of this. But at first, just being like, I don't know. It, it, if, let's say, we were, we were building a, something together and I was just wearing odd-colored socks. It's like, that, what the fuck is that? And it's like, I don't know, it's just... What does this have to do with anything, dude? It's like, why would you bring this to a mission? It's like, I don't know, it could be any reason. What are you doing? Why are you like... <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, Skeen hasn't got much to work with, is kind of what I'm getting Not at. Not really, no. There was and, a uh, detail here that I, I rather liked, too, was, if you remember, um, how much does Lufin say that the, you know, don't sell it for anything less than... 50. You remember how much? 50,000. And the guy says 30,000. Yeah. They both know it's valuable, but of course their appraisals are not exactly the same. Could also be that Skeen they is going to lowball it for his own benefit. <laughs> uh, in some way. I don't there's know, I lot, can believe that. There's a lot of reasons why they could say that, but it's the fact that they didn't have them both have the exact same number. It's kind of like before when we were talking about how uh, C Cyril said 12, oh, 14. It's like, why yeah. did he say that? There's a couple of reasons he might have said that. You didn't have to write that, but you did. It's a neat touch. Yeah, and uh, so that, that scene, it's like, it, the stone was given to him by Luthan. I can't remember if we mentioned that. Uh, it was like a yes. almost a down payment or a deposit. You can yeah, you keep this. Uh, you do the job. Give it back to me. Um, you'll get your money, but I want it back. But the fact that I'm giving you this means I'm trusting you to, you know, yeah. stay here and do this mission and get through it. Um, and what what I like about the the ending of that scene where he's he's like accusing him of being up to more fleems than he's letting on is the the leader is like, give him the fucking stone back. You know, we can't deal with this right now. Whatever even is this. And as Skeen is handing it back, he, he's like, you'd be right where I am. Like. Re like trying to tell Cassian this like we're no different man I've noticed something weird you would have pointed this out about anyone else I'm not I'm not I'm not doing anything weird okay and then uh, Cass just says yeah tell yourself whatever you want <laughs> yeah but yeah like this is uh there's something else going on and Cassian gets to point it out a little bit later he says um I'm here for the money you know take it or leave it and uh they're like panicking and stuff, and he says, the day before is always hard. There's so much time you can just worry. And then they say, what, you think we're scared? Maybe you're the one that's afraid. He says, of course I'm afraid, but there's a difference between that and losing your nerve. Losing if your you, nerve, yeah. yeah, that's right. If you don't want to right. do this mission, fine, but don't use me as an excuse. I really like that, because yeah. that's, it's just Andor calling them out in their bullshit. Exactly. Yeah, and that's, that's Skeen's bullshit. He, he's clearly, he's got enough reason to think this plan won't work, so he's trying to find some kind of logic to why they shouldn't do it now. Mm -hmm. And we later essentially get confirmation with, with Val, that's kind of an episode six of like, you are actually quite nervous about this. You might lose your nerve, even though you're the leader. Yeah. But I guess we're jumping on a bit. Yeah. This but we're almost done with the uh, bullshit. Cassian's plot line, and then we'll reset. Yep. Um, but yeah, the last scene I think for this is that uh, Skeen says, all right, if 
Val told me I should tell you about my brother, who is a farmer. Uh, the Empire came in and essentially flooded his land. He couldn't fight that, and he couldn't bear it, so he essentially drowned himself. And uh, yep. hated the Empire ever since. And, uh, you know, um, Cassian just asked him, like, what kind of farm did he have, and he, he explains it, and then he says, uh, that's as close to an apology you're going to get. Like, uh, which I quite like. The, the implication, of course, being, like, I'm on edge. I, I hate the Empire. That's that's why I did what I did. Um, and mm -hmm. well, he says that's as close to an apology he's going to get. It's like he pretty much is saying he's sorry about that, and that's why it happened. Yeah. Tough. So, we rewind. Going for someone else's plot line now, and that'd be Cyril. Cyril. Who's sitting, uh, boy, eating some cereal and chatting with his mum, which is a visual we get quite a bit of in this season, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Before he goes to work, essentially, and he's still at home. And I, I, I can't believe this is happening. It is a conversation between a, a guy and his mum while having some cereal. And the, the, the quality of the dialogue is so much better than it needs to be. <laughs> um, yeah, Cyril, the way he kind of jabs at her and is a sarcastic I love how asshole. they jab at each other. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, she opens with, like, being a leader isn't something you can just turn on and off. You might as well wear a sign that says, I promise to disappoint you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's right. just like, holy shit. Damn. Uh, yeah, Mom. she says, uh, it would have been nice to see you when you were flourishing. And he says, you are always welcome to visit. And she says, any civilized being knows an open invitation is no invitation at all. Yeah. Which is a really interesting thing to think about. Mm. Uh, and she says, my assumption is you have no prospects for the future. And he ignores that and just says, I had a spare room. Could have visited any time you want. You know that. And uh, when he says, you know that, she goes from that to say, I know what you tell me. I intuit the rest. I intuit you have no future prospects. So she just repeats mm -hmm. the conversation she wants to have. And he looks like so fucking depressed. He just goes, I've forgotten the precision of your predictive powers. Because like, <laughs> of course he has no fucking prospects, woman. <laughs> like he's, he's sitting yeah. here sipping on some cereal with well, his Well, so mom. that's a nice alliteration right there. Wait, no, the precision of predictive powers? Precision of your predictive powers, yeah. Oh, I thought nice you were talking about sipping on some cereal. Yeah, I thought you might have been. Uh, no, the predictive power. I'm just complimenting the dialogue there. I mean, the dialogue in that scene is really strong. Oh, I thought um, he was saying something nice about you, Muller. Never mind. It's okay. <clears throat> well, um, I'm glad you included that line. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Just watching uh, out for my friends. Well, the thing it he says that, which I really like as a subtle jab, and her response is, you've remembered how to mock me? Like, uh, and then, you know, like, cause she's, she's getting annoyed that he's not addressing the fucking question she keeps asking. And then his response is, I forgot how sensitive you could be. Like, you know, like, oh, you're going too far with, like, there's like a second conversation happening at the same time as the first one. A lot of the on the surface stuff being said is being ignored by both of them to each other. Um, and she says, perhaps you've forgotten my question. Do you even have a single prospect before you? And he says, I'll find a way. Gonna go, she says she's going to ring Uncle Harlow, and he says, what for? And it's uh, to find someone to take you on. And he says, ah, oh, bet us setting the bar high, are we? Um, it's, it, we it, all it, have, it, we've all got that Uncle Harlow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing where it's just like, we just got to get you a job. Doesn't really matter what one it is. Yeah. And she says, I needn't tell you how wrong you were about Uncle Harlow. And he just responds, but you will. <laughs> like, <laughs> but you will. <laughs> um, yeah, just as uh, he never felt police work was your chosen path. And he's like, because he knows me so well. He says, whose fault is that? And he just looks at her and says, can I guess? And that line to me, I was just like, man, that could either be commentary on how she's not letting him like set the record on anything. She's like, the position of power being that he's sort of crawled back to her means that she will assess his situation without even asking him what he feels about it or what happened. And so, like, she will tell him what the reality of all situations and all relationships is. Or is it that she is the reason that he's not got a great relationship with this Uncle Harlow guy? Because their, con uh, their, their conversation is very addictive. Their relationship isn't great. Yeah, they're, they get along, sort of, but it's all under this, you know, understanding of, yeah, we don't get along. And, uh, we get along, but we don't get along. And he, uh, we find out that um, the, the conversation, what did she tell Uncle Harlow? She said uh, what you went through was a big enough mistake to learn a lot from. It's like, 
it, fuck it out. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> thanks. It's, it's not only that you fucked up completely, but that you've, uh, you've moved on from it, right? You've learned a lot. You were stupid. You've, you've developed from it, right? It's like... But yeah, Cyril's not in the best of places. Kind of uh, the update for him in this episode. Pretty much. Which, uh, let's Oops. move over to... Just a, just a scene in a Star Wars show where this guy that we kind of are interested in, in his personality, his character, he's talking with his mom... Uh, Mon Mothma, we see her at home, and uh, her relationship Mothma with residence. her daughter is not good. Uh, she keeps tr she's basically desperately trying to convince her daughter that she should be able to uh to take her to like like the equivalent of school or at least on some kind of trip. Um, which is weird, right? Like a parent shouldn't have to convince their child they can do that, but the child is yeah. the, the daughter's really pushing back on it, and um. She basically says to her mum, "You're only doing it for the like to look as though you're doing it. Like basically, her daughter is cynical enough about their relationship that she believes the only time Mon will spend time with her is to come across as though she's a good mum. Yeah. Uh, which is, I mean, the work you're doing already. Like we barely even know this character, but you're already setting that her investment in politics and the subversion of said politics is so intense that it's cost her a relationship with her daughter, pretty much." I can't believe that 40 years ago, when we saw Mon Mothma for those two minutes, I would be thinking, man, I can't wait to learn about her personal relationship with her daughter. And yet, here we are. And, and yet, here we are, and I'm like, man, I hope things work out. Um, <laughs> but like, when, when the daughter makes that clear to her, her response is, that's so hurtful. And the daughter's like, yeah, see, it's all about you. <laughs> it's just like, oh, God. And uh, the dad's doing nothing about this. The camera hits no, him a couple times, chilling. and he's just looking around, just like, eh. You know, a lot of fathers will try and help heal uh, sort of uh, rifts like that, but he's not doing anything about it. Um, yeah, and he says, when were you going to tell me about the new foundation? And she says, uh, I didn't think you'd be interested. And he says, why? And she says, well, it's charitable. Yeah. I just it's like, damn. Tells you everything again. And uh, the husband can't remember the name of the driver. He keeps having to be reminded of it. He just uh, it, to me, that's just like a sign of he just really does not give a shit about yeah. uh, people other than himself, pretty much. Um, which you know, it's possible to forget people's names, but I think that's what they're going for with this guy. So um, we get a little bit of Deirdre in this episode. She basically says to her subordinate, she doesn't really know what she's doing, mm -hmm. um, but like it's it's ultimately the pieces of information she has, it's just too spread out to be organized. And the guy says back to her, you don't believe that. And she said, well, that's just the thing. If I wanted to achieve this, this is how I might do it. And the guy says, yeah, it's too random to be random. Meaning that it's almost perfect in terms of how... Perfectly random, yeah, which isn't typically how randomness actually works. Yeah. Everything is so desperately disparate like it, it's it's like it feels more so like it was planned which is a really cool way to give off a, a clue that things aren't quite as they seem yeah and it just shows that the empire's looking they're like yeah, yeah they're this looking. is it's too random to be random i'm looking at this pattern it's just it doesn't check out the empire are not stupid yeah they're using the vast resources they have and the network of information to figure shit out effectively and f quickly like they're fast Um, and then we get one little bit for, for Luthen as well. Um, got his little partner lady in the shop they run. Uh, he seems a little bit desperate to get any contacts or information about the job on um, Aldani. And he says, have you checked your walkaway pack? Who is his partner lady? And she says, I don't like seeing you nervous. Either they're going to be okay or they're not. And he says, wow, that's a daring prediction. <laughs> like, <it's, laughs> Of course, her point being that there's nothing you can do. We're, we're just going to get the result. That's, that's all that happens next. Yep. Yeah. Um, and she says, like, you wanted this to happen. This is what it took. He says, uh, I wanted it too much. Um, he says, it'll all be over by the time we hit tomorrow. And he says, or it'll just be starting. Is uh, yeah. kind of neat because this event arguably it's... is the beginning of the rebel sort of the rebellion becoming more and more, uh, much more of a it's... serious thing. 
a yeah. very pivotal starting yeah moment which closes out episode five whoa 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 indeed so yeah considering i mean i was sort of like a, a pit stop right five episodes of tv um it's it's the kind of thing you can settle into and just be like it's, it's kind of a subject i've wanted to talk about because a lot of people do you yeah. can be tricked into thinking this isn't even Star Wars anymore. It's just sci-fi. Like, it's a sci-fi You don't TV watch show. it thinking it's Star Wars. Typically, when you watch something that's Star Wars, it's it's Star Wars. It's it's a meta thing that your brain just can't really shake off. Yeah. And here, um, you just you forget that it's Star Wars. Well, and so that's seen as both a criticism and a boon. So perhaps we should go over that a little quick. Um, the criticism side of it being... This isn't even interesting to developing the IP. It's just a story that's told relatively well. It's stapled into the Star Wars universe. Boo. I'll take it. I'll t yeah. <laughs> because we've seen what happens when they try to move the IP forward. Um, yeah, because moving the IP forward to them is, hey, do you remember this character and this one and this one? Oh, do you hear the Your key shit. jangle? Do you hear it? Oh, it's so good. And everyone's like, ooh. Well, so the, the thing for me is that, uh, first of all, yeah, you can, like, you can just recontextualize a really good story to just be a part of a universe, and you'd be like, is it really? And you're like, well, it is now. I don't know. Fuck it. Like, as long as nothing contradicts, right? The thing is, yeah. like, there's loads of Star Wars references in this show. They're everywhere. Like, uh, all the location names, the tool names, and then lots of like fighting legacy the empire. Characters. Yeah. Well, of course, the fact that yeah, the core conflict is the rebellion versus the empire. For as much as it may not feel like Star Wars at points, it is inextricably Star Wars. Yeah. Well, part of the problem for me is that I'm glad it doesn't feel like current day Star Wars because that is a yes, thing that nothing absolutely. should feel like anymore. It's crap. And like, I mean, it's worth stating now, even with the five episodes that we've had, how nice is it to just have a story that is exploring the perspectives of regular people? We don't have any Jedi. Yeah, we don't story. have any people with direct connections to, like, major players that exist in the, you know, mm. the mainline stories. For the first time in how <clears> long, like, for that, that's been asked for, like, ever since Mandalorian as a show, like, existed, of just, can we have a story about people, just regular people living in this world? And like stories that don't directly tie into the main one. It's a universe. It's it's a whole world brimming yeah. with like all these different planets and people and factions that we can explore without having to directly yeah. tie it into like Luke Skywalker. It's, it's actually the first time this feels like a big universe, to be honest. It feels big. Yeah, it feels. Because which is have... funny when we talk about the low stakes of uh, a lot of the situations that one TIE fighter yeah. is scary, but it's it's expansive. Yeah, because we have different planets that look different, with different people, with different viewpoints, and not, uh, sand. It's like, oh, great. Good stuff. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty much in the same camp. I don't actually see any problem. Uh, if, if it's being brought up to say, well, this is why it's not getting very far, though. People aren't very concerned to see it because it's just a good story. It's not good Star Wars story. Uh... The thing is, I don't even know when the last time we got a good Star Wars story was. Yeah, um, that's the thing. If if that's how it's being years categorized, ago. if if it has to include Jedi jumping around doing all kinds of like, and it's not that that can't, you know, that can be good as well. It's just that um, I don't know, guys. We we need to expand a little bit. We're in a rut with Star Wars. This is the one of them things, especially at the point of uh, Episode Five. It's just like, man, we. This is kind of... I'm okay with this. This is good. This We should encourage this. Much more than how I felt about anything to do with like the best of Mando or anything. This, um... I don't even know what to draw out of Mando that I thought was that good. Uh, I think that we said, like, we would compliment the fact that it felt like it was lower down and more mm -hmm. about the people, but this is actually that. This feels much more substantive in terms of that. And, um, apparently it's to its detriment. Like I said, there's, there's several channels uh that have th th to be fair they had bad responses from their fans about how this sucks <laughs> because there's no x-wings because there's no lightsabers because uh, there's no force users like oh. fools stop that's a shame that you would that that's your bar yeah like so. I'm, I'm all for you're welcome to talk to me about what entertains you and what doesn't but don't tell me like the story sucks unless there's lightsabers like oh god please please We've had enough lightsabers and fucking force users. Like, I just want to, I want to explore different aspects of this universe. Funnily enough, um, one of my my only like things that's kind of like a pet peeve is I wish we had more POV characters who were aliens. 
Yeah, um, it's there's a every, lot of every, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. human. Every single and I mean and, and like especially like there's so many instances where it's all humans. It's like can we just throw like one alien in there? <laughs> that's yeah, like it but neat. I mean other Otherwise, I'm pretty happy with, like, sort of uh, getting to see, like, representations of different sides of the Star Wars universe. It's just that I wish we had a little bit more variety in terms of the uh, the aliens. But, like, I'm pretty happy with, like, the locales that we get to go to and uh, all of the differences between those locations. And, of course, the characters themselves being distinct from one another. Just wish we had a few more aliens. That would be nice. Yeah, it's very, very human-centric. Yeah. Well, uh, let's talk about episode six, which, by the way, uh, changes its conventions a little bit. I'm pretty sure it's like it's pretty much all set on Aldani. It doesn't really yes go outside hyper of focus. It. Yeah, um, we begin with uh, Nemec telling Cassian he can't sleep, uh, and he and he asks, "Why doesn't my faith calm me? You have nothing, and you sleep like a stone," which mm -hmm. is such a like says so casually because uh, Cassian's made it clear that he's here for the money, as in the prior episode, but like saying that to him is like offensive kind of as it would be to anybody you have nothing it's like it's not it's, <laughs> you know it's just like well fuck you man I, I i do believe in things i just not like you know i'm not like you i guess my primary motivation uh, and he says i write when i can't sleep i wrote about you or rather i wrote what it is to be a mercenary what is a mercenary's role in the struggle for freedom he says weapons are tools those that use them, by extension, function, uh, functional assets that we must use to our best advantage. The Empire has no moral boundaries, so why not take hold of every chance we get? Let them see how an insurgent, uh, insurgency adapts. It's like Namek basically trying to reconcile a uh, moral quandary that he's had to grapple with because of Andor. That's what he's been working on, figuring that out. If, yeah, it feels weird when you're like, we all believe in this cause, it's the right thing to do, let's, let's bring in you. And this like, guy who's like, give me money and I'll do it. It, it feels like, yeah. oh, that doesn't, uh, huh, okay. And then it's like, oh, well, what if, like, I reconcile it as, well, you, you're like an extension of a tool, essentially, because you have no, you know, you have no cause. Yeah. You essentially, uh, you essentially represent our cause by extension because you're with us. So, um, yeah, obviously, he's just trying to get it all straight in his head so that he can feel more comfortable about all of this. And, um, mm -hmm. Andor says, the one thing you got wrong is the Empire don't learn, they don't need to. Um, and he says, perhaps they will tomorrow. Then Andor says, be careful what you wish for. He's yeah. obviously referring yeah. to how, like, when you push, they will push back. They will push back, and hard. Push Which kind hard. of puts them in line with Luthen, as we learn later, in particular. They're kind of well, on the it, same, you know, of the same mind. They recognize the same... It puts them in line with yeah, Luthen. They yeah, they recognize yeah. the same outcome. They don't necessarily want it. They don't, well, they, well don't. they have a different they yeah. have a different thing about whether they want it or not, but they both know what's going to happen. Um, yeah, Namek is like, so what? You think it's hopeless to you? Freedom, independence, justice? We should just submit and be thankful. And I was at this point be curious, like, what is Adol going to say? And he says, "Do I look thankful?" Yeah, but yeah, that, that about puts it there. His whole idea, Cass, is that like we can always make things worse. Let's just take advantage of the fact that right now we're able to live and eat and do kind of what we want. Like, yeah, I don't like them either. But I mean, really want to push them? That, that seems to be a, a lot of his perspective. However, he is here to do this job because it's good for money. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and he says like, no, but I'm glad you're here no matter the reason. And he says, don't worry, you'll be fine. Which, whenever that happens in any story, of like, don't worry, like, character, uh -oh. you're gonna be okay. It's like, oh. Uh, who's dying? <laughs> who's dying? Uh, the bad guys, uh, uh, being all the ones at the big old stationy place, they're having a little chat. You get to meet, like, the... I think he's the commandant, right? Big dude, big, char big in charge dude. Um, essentially, whatever the... I forget his title. I thought it was he's commandant. In... I can't remember. Very, can't remember very either. possibly, though. Um, but yeah, uh, he talks about... I fucking kind of adore this speech. He talks about how we can, how they destroy a culture, basically. There's, like, uh, how to manipulate and dwindle the numbers of, like, all the locals. And he, he talks about how um, you have to keep throwing all kinds of offers and options at them without ever giving them what they're actually asking for. 
you got to whittle them down over time, make like smaller and, and worse concessions each time it's repeated until it's smaller and smaller and smaller and dissuade them with gifts. Uh, and they'll even try and like sort of push back, they'll refuse. Um, but you can always use that as a form of manipulation as well. He said, we offered a transport to move them from their locale to the actual spot for viewing the eye, and they refused. They knew they'd refuse. And so they peppered the entire trail that's quite long that gets them from where they are to where we are with inns and taverns throughout their track. Mm. And he said that they've reduced the number from like 1,000 down to about 60 now. Uh, and of course, it's just a matter of, you know, it's a long track. You you got the option to fucking have some drinks with your pals and just, yeah, it's just gonna, it's gonna, you know, pick off the numbers here and there until it is a very peaceful way of destroying them uh, gradually. And that's the only intention that he pretty much has and talks about. Um, and he says, yeah, at one point they were as strong as 15,000 coming to watch the eye, but they've managed to get them all the way down to almost like 60 now. That's and, what I was thinking of. I was thinking of the people going to the eye, not the, you know, okay. That's what I was thinking of. And uh, it's just it's just super interesting that he's talking about, and he says that this is actually the last year they'll be able to see the eye. They don't know that, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they're going to stop him from, next, uh, from going forward. Um, yeah, and he explains all this right in front of Gorn, who, as we we're told he's more sympathetic to the locals than the empire so it's just it's and it's said so meticulously but it's just so evil a lot of it anyway you know it's like uh but said with confidence yeah, and intelligence as well this uh this commandant guy as well they show us he has a little family and uh, he's right. not exactly the most friendly to them but it still dare i say humanizes him he's got his own stuff going on yeah he's a stern parent you know he wants his he wants his kid to look you know really good. Yep. This is important. He wants to look good, himself. not just because it's good for him, you know, career wise, but because they're you know well, they don't want to be here. Be, uh, yeah, exactly. This might be their opportunity to get transferred to a different place. Yeah, because good at the for end all of the of day, us. they don't really want to be here. Nobody seems to want to be on Aldani. No, no, nobody likes being assigned here. Um, and yeah, so the, the, the locals arrive, and uh, I think Gordon can speak their language, and he says, you look well for such a long journey, and the response is, may the eyes stay open long enough for you to find some good within you. Mm-hmm. It's just like, damn, all right. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, he says that to everyone. It's, it's just it's optimistic. What I think is really neat about it is that extended speech of how they've manipulated these people fully, and they've, they've got them, and they're screwed. It's all assuming they're too stupid to realize it, but they know. Uh, these people know exactly how much the Empire have uh, oppressed the fuck out of them, and they're just doing what they can with what they have. And that's the reality for a lot of these different things. Like, the Empire believes that they have the, um, sort of the one-up on a lot of people in terms of knowledge. Mm. But oftentimes, yeah. they, they actually don't. Um, it's like a, a, it's a big old chess game that's happening with a lot of these different factions, and we get smaller stories where it's happening on smaller scales. Um, yeah, we find out that Sinta's backstory essentially is a, a trooper killed her entire family. Uh, hence her sort of standoffishness and coldness with everyone. A bit punishery. Not a happy lady. Nope. Mm -hmm. uh, Punished Sinta. Yambo. But the plan is coming along. That, so they're, they're, like, they're all dressed up as uh, troopers and the idea is that Gorn is just going to direct them to be of moving the commandant while everyone else stays outside to make sure the eye thing goes well and they'll uh, have good old uh, val and Sinta disrupt communications temporarily of course and while that's happening then try and conduct the the thievery and how it's gonna go um yeah and i think uh, when when the commandant arrives the guy says you may enter our temple peace to those who come in peace and, uh, yep. he's, and he says, tell him our ghosts have strong hands and long memories. Which is such a like, great little lie. In terms of just, oh shit, you are a... You do not like the Empire. And Gorn translates it, so to speak, uh, as may the, eye, may the eye find good in all of us. And it's so cool because the expression of the local guy, he knows he lied. Which means he probably but speaks he English. Yeah. Yeah? Refuses to speak it to them. It's just, uh, it's just good shit. So, yeah, I All guess. All these little things. They didn't have to do that. Yeah, None of that it, was necessary. It wasn't needed. Arguably, it's, it's anyway. Gorn's effort to be like, I ain't fucking saying 
that. <laughs> like, I'm not going to create any boat rocking at this point. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, the cooperation is done just to keep things at a peaceful enough level before they're going to sort everything out permanently, but this is being made use of by the good guys as a like I said, a big old opportunity, a big old distraction. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, they head in, and then uh, the action sort of begins. They shut the door and keep the guns on everybody, but a, a lieutenant pulls out his pistol uh, in time enough to get it on uh, Nemec, I think it is. And he makes one strict and quick demand, let the boy go. Which I think is super interesting. He's not demanding that they stop their whole operation, just that they let the kid leave. It's a very human thing to say. It's just, um, you could have, if this was maybe a Filoni production, have him pull the pistol and say, I drink children's blood, and I'm gonna kill you as well. Like, oh. I'm bad. And then all the other troopers said, yeah, I bad, like being bad. Bad is good. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but his only intention is to save the kid, and then he gets shot in the back by Cinta. Like I said, kind of been told why she might do that more so than any other character, but yeah, that's just that's the first death already. And it's not on a guy that sounds strictly evil, but you know, it, it's kind of that's the problem that we have with the these environments. It doesn't really matter anymore. It's whichever team you're a part of, uh, you'll go down accordingly. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, we don't know enough about him to know, but still, the family are now captured, and so begins the big old plan. Uh, uh, is the, the way it's going to work is to just like unlock the credits, get them loaded on a ship, and get out. It's actually relatively simple. The problem is, pretty it's much, take time. They're just doing it, yeah, because yeah, it's heavy, right? Um, the uh, sort of ticking clock, if you will, is the discovery of the communications being all fuzzly. And uh, the comms guy does eventually figure it out, and he grabs a bunch of soldiers to go down the area. And oh, that's... well, one it. It's interesting too, is I owe to their competence and everything. Like when he first notices it, it's you know coincidentally it happens when the eye is there because the reason I think it's the eye is because it's only where they are, not all of the other outposts and everything. It's just them, so they yeah. think it. You know, it's because you know interference from the eye. Um, and then as the you know jammer fails, he's like, oh, he's reported it once, and now he's like, nope, still still on it. Yeah, and he does a lot of uh, knob fiddling, right? So it's, it's yeah, he's he's it checking. It feels shit. like he has to put effort in to actually discover what is happening here. He's not just uh, the way they often do it in in shows, which is kind of annoying, is that if you disrupt communications, the communications guy just sits and waits until it's not disrupted. You know, he doesn't care to do anything himself to try and figure out what's happening, find alternatives, talk to people, which is obviously what a communications guy would do, especially for security. Um, yeah, he does discover it eventually. Uh, but, you know, because obviously we're going through it relatively quick, they, um, yeah. they get the gates open, and when they blast open, like, the sort of straps that cover all the the credits, the skein walks in, sort of shocked that there it is, all of these credits, and they're available. There's just this moment where he just goes, let's go! <laughs> like, it's like, holy shit, there's all the money, get it right now! They've got it so that um, all of the men that were down there defending it are now being told under threat of death, obviously, to actually carry them out into the ship. Which is done pretty cleverly as well, by the way. When they enter the room, they're like, Commandant on the ground, everybody line up. Yeah. That's a good soldiery move, and then it just converts into, all right, get on your knees. Who's like, hey, wait a minute. And then I think even the Commandant himself is like, uh, they've kidnapped my family, please cooperate killed, with them. Well, he said they killed, so they've already killed two? Or the one, he basically, they've killed, they've killed people before. Yeah. So they'll they mean it. They they mean it. They have killed someone, so which is you know, it's a good touch. It's like they mean business, they're being serious. They will kill. So uh as I was watching this by the way, something I genuinely had a bit of a concern of. They make the Commandant guy move things as well. Now he's pretty they've already showed that he's relatively fat, his clothes don't even fit that well, and he's pretty old. And he starts getting real sweaty, and I legit when I was watching it, I was like, that poor dude's gonna have a heart attack if you're not careful. Jeez. Like <laughs> Well, I got news for you. <laughs> so, like, uh, the the communications men, they finally come in. They're like, what the fuck's going on? And Gord is like, this is classified. Get the fuck out of here. Commandant, back me up. And he's, like, wheezing from all of the, <laughs> the shit that he's done. And then he grabs his arm, which is telltale sign that uh, 
that boy's having a stroke and he falls stroke. over. Which um, you know what? I'm not sure how I feel about it in terms of like, is that is that contrived? Because it's obviously a very negative. Uh, I don't think so. Um, because it's I think incredibly that high stress scenario. Very ex probably the most stressful mm -hmm. thing that's ever happening in your life. You're already of that age. It can happen. And plus, if they wanted to have a way to essentially have him die or look, you know, bad. They could. They had a lot of other options. It's not like uh, it, it relied on it happening this specific way. But I'm fine with it. I think. He's, I think it fits the scenario. His family are being threatened. His whole career is going to be potentially over. His life is being threatened. He's being forced to move extremely heavy objects again and again and again. He's quite old and he's quite overweight. It's like for me, it's like oh, that's a lot of factors that uh, to the point where I even thought when watching it, it's like you know you could kill that guy. You got to be careful. Who are the actor? Like, <laughs> Maybe <yeah>. even, yeah. <laughs> Going all the way. Um, but yeah, fight breaks out. And uh, by the way, Gorn is shot like almost immediately and he's just out. Yeah, that's it. Uh, it's really quick, really simple. He's like one of the sort of main orchestrators of this whole plan and he just gets shot and he's dead. It's like, well, there yeah, you go. That's how quick it goes. And um, not long after that, you get uh, Val is pinned down behind an object and she shouts out for help. And so Skeen does covering fire, and uh, the ex stormtrooper guy tries to help her, and he just gets shot dead as well. Um, and that's the end of him. Yep, it's, it's uh, a lot very of very unceremonious. Deaths. Yeah, a lot of uh, yeah, and to the point where I think it ends up just being Skeen, Val, and uh, Cass, and uh, Nemec left. Nemec. Well, and uh, of course, Cinta is off. You know, <clears throat> yeah, Cinta escapes because she's not a part of this portion of the plan. Yeah, she was uh, keeping the. Well enough, they had her keeping the family hostage, which honestly is probably a good allocation of units, because she's the one that's probably going to be willing to kill them. Yeah. Um, True. So yeah, they they rush in with the what they have, and uh, Andor basically blasts off, and he does the standard warning to everybody. Hang on, we're going to be launching pretty fast, pretty quick, and... You know, in all of Star Wars, and arguably all of sci-fi, possibly all of storytelling, they do a lot of strap-in, hang-on sort of stuff. I've said this to, um, I think I said it to either Fringy or Rags or some, someone when I was watching this, I was so surprised. Uh, I think this might be the first, there's going to be other people who could reference other times probably, but it's the first on my mind of a time where someone says like strap in or hang on and that person doesn't do it properly and they have lethal uh, results. Right. Yeah. It's uh, the ship goes real fucking fast, real quick, and they get blasted across the room and one of them gets slammed into a wall and then the payload slams on top of that and it just crushes yeah, him. Yeah, crushes Fennec. Wait, uh, no. Namek. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, and more yeah. specifically, it crushes his like spine uh, so he can talk, but he's lost the use of like the bottom half of his body. Yeah, it, he's in a lot of trouble. But I mean, that's the thing. It's like this, this, uh, this, this um, operation, pretty well planned. Um, they, they, and, and still things went wrong and people got killed and injured. Um, yeah. it, like it didn't go smoothly because it was always going to be a risky thing and it's kind of the nature of like saying that something is going to be risky if you say it's risky and then there are actually consequences that happen to the characters where things don't go well uh, people do get hurt and killed it's like it really feels like it was risky that it wasn't easy this was hard fought and there were casualties lots of blood spilled yeah <laughs> and of course it sucks for Namek as well because he's, uh, he's, he's young he's new to this he He's yeah, like he's barely lived a lot of his life, and and that's that. He's he's been seriously injured. Well, and the sad um, part as well is that they're trying to deal with that reality, but Andor is literally like, "I need my navigator, guys otherwise we're all dead." Yeah, or we're all dead. To, yeah. yeah, and Nemec, in like I guess what like a real sort of Chad move, gets his equipment and guides him through the eye. Which, by the way, the eye visually it's stunning. Awesome, just yeah. before that, it's, it's an awesome sequence. Just before that, that's something that's worth mentioning is that uh, they drag him across the floor ready to get him in position to start talking for the navigator, and she says, I gotta give him a med spike, and even Nemec says, no. Like, so I'm assuming... He needs to be alert, I would A med spike the... is probably a form of adrenaline for sci-fi. Um, oh, yeah, well, probably. maybe, like, kind of like morphine, right? That it's, it's I'm kind even, of like... Uh, my assumption is that uh, it got, it, it, like, pushed him to get him as, in, in, in as best form as possible, because... They need a, They need every last second they can get of right. him while he's away. My assumption is him saying, "Oh no!" Like, no is is that 
the characters here are realizing that he's going to die and they need to get him as as uh, right i say going yeah. as soon as possible so he doesn't seem too happy or on board with it, the the fact that he's like oh shit i'm i'm done aren't i like and this is my last move which he does come through on it though yeah, yeah. um to guide them through the eye and yeah uh, they do get through it but fuck yeah the eye is gorgeous um it looks bright and they are chased by tie fighters and the uh they just narrowly get through it while the TIE Fighters are like pretty much destroyed by the... Which they are warned about, like the nature of this this eye thing. It's not safe up here. Thing it can yeah. tear ships apart. Well, it's because he's got his equipment that he can give them their flight path through it. And I mean, they only just get through. It's, it's a dangerous job. Mm-hmm. Hence. Um, but yeah, they get out of it and... Uh... I think Cass says, uh, is he still with us? And uh, Skeen says, disappointed to, um, to Val. And I think this is a seriously interesting bit of character work we got here. She's sad he's still alive because he's doomed to die. Mm -hmm. her, her point being, it would be better to put him out of his misery. Uh, Skeen sees that as a, like, you are hoping more of us drop off so that there's more reward as, as part of the split. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he would say that? Well, yeah. Mm. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> that's what we call projection. But yeah. then that Andor is like, well, no, we got. Where's the doctor? Like, let's get him yeah, to the doctor. We're gonna yeah, go he there doesn't, now. It doesn't feel like he weighs that up. He's just like, no, that's the correct decision. We take him to a doctor. That's the decision. Which ain't that interesting that all of these guys judging him like, oh, you're just here for the money, huh? Well, and he's the guy who's like, no, we should get him to a doctor. We should help well, him. Well, where. Where do you think Andor learned it from? Yeah. Considering our, um, you know, what we know about him. Yeah. He learned it from Luke Skywalker. Yeah, no. Luke Skywalker would never abandon his family or the people he cares about. Okay. <laughs> he wouldn't dare. But it's just, it just keeps reinforcing that character, right? Andor has a, he's, he's got a heart of gold there somewhere. Yeah. Deep down. As we will, yeah, as we'll learn as we proceed in one particular way that I really like, but um, he's a good guy at heart. Uh, Hell yeah. Before it continues, like the, the Cassian sort of plot line, we just, we just get this shot of loads of the Empire and the locals enjoying the eye. Yeah, together. Yeah, yes. watching it together. It's so on purpose. <laughs> like, oh, of course it is. <laughs> Yeah. We're all fucking the same. They're all people. They're all people at the end of the day. And in the and in the wake of this incredible cosmic event, all of the, you know, the Empire, this uh particular tribe, like all of that just sort of uh fades away for a brief moment. We're all unified in the appreciation of something natural and of something incredible. wonderful. Yeah. And man, it's dude, the eye, it looks so great, and there's so many wonderful shots as well. Yeah, it's there's amazing. the one where it's it's the wide shot from the side as the ship is passing, like beneath everything through the sky. It's so great. It's well, such a wonderful about shot. The show looking really good. Oh, the just show looks general. fantastic. It, yeah, it looks um, really good. The show looks well, so great. It's not just. It's not. It's not just that, like the visual effects and the set design and everything seems to just be higher fidelity. That like it's all better quality. It's all leveraged incredibly. Uh, it, it's it's all very smart and interesting use of what they have. We've got some it really gives me inspired House of the Dragon cinematography. Vibes. Of just like really cool and inspired cinematography. Lots of good shot choices. A lot yeah. of good. I mean, it's it's everything top to bottom. You have the you know the interiors and the the environments that they're in. You have people just everyone's got different clothes on that's appropriate to where they are. It just all looks you totally yeah, the buy costume into design's it. really good. Um, nothing distracts you. Nothing is cheap and and, and distracting in it. Everything no, feels it's like it's deliberate. Belongs. Yeah, it's, it's all, all cohesive deliberate. and deliberate. Like, um, if the if if uh the show should probably win awards for uh for visual effects and for like production design, set design. Like, good timing too, right? Because we see a, a Maz Kanata person, but practical. Yes, that's right. Which he uh looks great. That's cool. four arms. Yeah, he looks he looks he looks cool. Uh, good job they did. I was wondering how they were doing that too while I was watching it. You know the way those arms move. I'm like, those maybe look like real arms, but how? Yeah, maybe. But 
I'd have to see it again because I was just watching it and thinking, man, that looks really good. That looks so good. It's almost like distracting how good that looks. <laughs> Stop looking so good. Like you're not, you don't look like CGI or anything. By the way, in terms yeah, of well, like, this is what I, you I'm can do. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go, go for it. I uh, uh, just, this, this is what you can do with CGI and all that stuff. If you give your people time to use it properly. And not crunch them a week before you yes. want to release. Like, can you no, put this, like this, these uh, this show in had there? A year. This show had a year in post production. And yeah, it was shot over the course of like several months. That's and how the it should be. Is going to have a year in post production as well, and about a year of shooting. Um, and something as well is that the the directors of the show each did like chunks. So one yeah. director did one, two, three. One director did four, five, six. Oh, um, okay. One director did. Uh, eight, nine, ten, and then one director did uh, eleven and twelve, and I think uh, seven Dare was some guy who made the first three. Dare yeah. I say they might have even talked to each other before they did? Well, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Harris the thought, and, and sometimes just because I'm still thinking about the eye. Like, how cool is it? You set it up and you talk about it, but nobody, you don't quite know what it's going to look like. Yeah, but it just keeps getting built up as this really awesome thing to where once it finally happens, it's really exciting. Yeah, and it's like, brand oh. new. It is it's also a brand new thing that was introduced in this show. A part of you almost starts worrying that they're not going to show us what it is. Just everybody <laughs> appreciating its beauty off screen. And you're like, I mean, I get it, but I kind of do wish I could have seen it too. I kind of want to see it, but then yeah. we do get to see it. I really like the structure that they've, and I mean, we'll be able to venerate it and like talk about how great it is more as we go on. But like having these pretty clearly defined arcs where it's like set up, set up, pay off. Set up, set up, payoff, and then you know, set up, set up, set, and then we lead to a payoff. It just makes those payoffs more rewarding. Instead of like in again, Book of Boba Fett, where you have these stupid action scenes, like a few of them in every single episode that are just nonsensical rather than ramping up to one big climactic moment. Yeah, it's a really solid structure for this show. So they try and get old Nemec healed up, and no, it I'm doesn't okay. happen, he dies. Yep. Yeah. But as, that sad. Is, as that's it's happening, good. yep. Andor and Skeen have a little chat, and Skeen is like uh, suggesting maybe they should knock out Val, take the winnings, split it fifty-fifty, since that's a lot of money, can make us happy for the rest of our lives. Forty million each, and uh, forty million mm -hmm. million each. And this remember, Andor enormous. was getting paid what two hundred k. Like, a lot, like thousand, thousand, yeah. Yep. So. And remember that what he was going to get paid for the Imperial, like the, the part that he got was 40000 So just a sense of scale in terms of how much money that is. Insane. Yeah, yeah it's, it, that's an important thing to you know, reiterate. The things he was willing to do for the 40000 40, So yeah. now you have an idea. So he says that that's kind of a, a plan they should float. And he says, I thought you were a rebel. And he's like, I am a rebel. It's me against everyone else. Yeah. <clears throat> He says, "Where does that put me?" And he says, "Well, forty million is enough for me to forget you." He says, "What about your brother?" I don't have one. So that that story Ian, was a lie. A lie. Liar! And liar! What I liar. really really like about that is that um, this show is doing its job, providing us all these different kinds of people throughout the world, and this is a man who took advantage of the fact that everyone has a story to just lie. Yep. He's not here because he hates the Empire. He's here because he wants money, but he's using he that money. to come across as self-righteous. Uh, he's yep. dirty little shit. And, and I think he, here and he's looking too, at Andor. But... He's like, yeah, we're the same, buddy. You yeah. and I. Well, exactly, And he says, yeah. like, you we leave them. Right? He goes, same. don't high road me. You're only here to save yourself. We were both born in a hole, and you have to climb over someone else to get out. And he says, uh, mm -hmm. we sat down, we split the winnings end, and... and as he's explaining this, he gets fucking shot dead by Andor. Andor shoots him. Mm -hmm. Yep, it happens and super like, fast, too. He just, like, does. whips it out and kills him. I think like, like, Cassie's just done the calculus. Is like, so this guy cannot be trusted by any of us. He can't be trusted. Like, if I even decided to cooperate with him anyway, he's going to stab me in the back. If he's going to do it to them, why wouldn't he do it to me? Yeah, if it, I hadn't like, have been the one out here, he would have been having this conversation. In a sense, with, it's almost like um, he, he screwed oh. up. He, he made a big mistake in, in terms yeah. of saying this to Andor. Because it, it's kind of funny, right? He identifies them as being the same, but fails to identify that consequently Andor might do that to him. Yes. That he might it's actually, a, yeah. like, shoot him and kill it's him. Pure and of course, 
He's the also the having... thing with Skin as well is he doesn't know what choice Andor's going to make after having done that. Of course, yeah. he can't know, right? He's dead. But like, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's just interesting that Skin made that mistake Cassian in identifying that Andor a... was like him. He failed to identify that Andor might do something he would do. Well, yeah, because he is like him, but he's got actual values underneath his he does. Uh, decisions. That's the big. That's these the big aren't made because thing, he's yeah. selfish. Yeah, one They're thing made through money is pragmatism. It... Yeah. Well, Andor has certain it's lines he doesn't he doesn't deep. want to cross, yeah, and that he won't cross. He's and aware is, of all and of the, as we're about um, to find out, this is one of them. Yeah, it's like he he almost not he the form of a people. thing; it's the nature of a thing. Okay, Andor no. looks a lot <laughs> no. like Skeen, but he isn't like him at all. Uh, no. and a lot of their impact on the world could be similar, but they're motivated by completely different things. Yeah, Andor's reaction to the, that makes me just feel like he's having like a, a fucking singularity going on in his head in terms of. Like, so, plan A, I tell Thingy about what Skeena said here. She would obviously want to kill him, and he'd kill both of us, so that's, everyone's dead. I go with him, he kills me. I don't do anything here. Maybe if I kill him, when would I kill him? Do I kill him when he's, like, not looking? Do I kill him at the, sort of, uh, while explaining to him I disagree? He's gonna want to kill me. When should I pull a pistol on him, then? Probably fucking right now. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's, now, it, to I'm, me, it's yeah. like, he would have, his brain is moving real fast in terms of, like, oh, shit. For every second that passes is a worse time for me to try and kill him. And it's the only choice I've got left now, because everything else leads to him trying to kill me. But, move. having killed him, now an opportunity has been presented to Andor, one that he's wanted to take since he had to start the Aldani-like mission, which is, I can... I can hmm, get away. I can get away, but it's how... Seen, and, um... and I think that's, you know, when you're watching it, it's like, he can get away, but how... How is he going to get away? And with what? Is he going to take everything? Did he just help them steal? What's he going to do? And, and didn't so he just, uh, he, he got like a information from Skeen about a place they can go to as well, right? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, um. Yeah, that's what Skeen was offering, yeah. But he does, uh, he does a Goodman thing. And kind of a, it's going to, it's been a lot for Val to think about. He pulls a gun on her and he says Skeen is dead. Which, if you're a reasonable person, you'd be like, holy shit, you're betraying us, you piece of shit. And he's like, no, he tried to kill you. Uh, I want my cut, and I'm going to buy the ship off Mr. Maz Kanatic Man over there, and I'm going to go. You can have what is yours, bye. Which is really strange from someone who's betraying you. Yeah, if anything, it's not typical but he would, betray your behavior. No. But it would take way less than he could have. He could have taken everything. He could have left her there. Yeah. Like, he could have stolen the ship, but he didn't. He only took what he felt that he was owed, essentially. And, uh, was something that really awesome that happens is that apparently Nemec wanted Andor to have his, uh, manifesto. Yeah. Interesting. In insisting. It's like, oh, Yeah. And he ends up taking it, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, he, he, he it. definitely it takes does. it. That comes yeah, up later. Yeah, he certainly does. Yeah, I just, while I asked the question, I was like, oh, no, that, you see that thing later again. So, yeah, no, <laughs> just being a little... So we got uh, two, well, some quick moments that I really like. Mon Mothma is making uh, another policy clear and objection to one of Palpatine's policies in the Senate, and she's basically being ignored. Nobody's yeah. paying attention. Everyone Pretty is, empty as well. is being distracted by conversation or whatever, and then she checks, I guess, her equivalent of an iPad for news, and yeah, the ISB are mobilizing pretty hardcore. Something heavy has fucking happened. Something yeah. inexcusable. Yeah, happened on Aldani. Yeah, obviously it's it's gonna have huge effect. And I love this moment where uh, Luthen is just doing his usual shit, and someone in the background says, "Do you have anything from Aldani?" And he actually looks fucking terrified <laughs> for a second. Like, why the hell did you yeah, just ask like, that? Oh yeah. god! And then he's it's like, over. <laughs> uh, uh, and he's like, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, why he's like, it's just in the news. And uh, yeah, he walks to the back and just has himself a laugh. He's like, yeah, "Fuck yeah, baby." This, uh, there's a lot of you can draw from his laugh, especially I think you can draw more so once you've seen future episodes. Yeah, uh, mm. this is important to him. Very important. They did it. The job is done, and so closes episode six. And I yeah. think at this point I was like, "All right, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. I, I want to see how this yeah. goes now." Absolutely. Yeah. I just kept rolling through four or five, six. I just watched them all. I was like, "Yeah, let's keep it going." Uh. It's kind of cool because uh, this is all going to build up to Rogue One, which builds up to A New Hope, right? Like, this is all just building more and more foundations for the grand story yeah. that began all of this. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, it's, it's so weird to think about, right? Because it's like, yes, the Rogue One is about all the operations that lead to the big operation to take down the Death Star. And then this show is all the tiny operations that led to the small operations. Um, kind of neat as an idea, and, 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 and it was always going to be... I think I said this to you, Rags, it was like a... When we when we would have been pitched this, it's it's like okay, you know, it is 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 this is why you shouldn't do it. This is why you shouldn't do it. This is why it'll fall apart. This is based on this, 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 this. But might be good. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and, maybe. And for the first time ever, our little it might be good has, has managed to. It paid to, off. Yeah, it's kind <laughs> of. Nice. Whoa. There's yeah. a reason we say it. Look, it's right here. It can happen, and was a Star Wars Disney show, no less. I know, See, there's I hope like... for anyone. Maybe. <laughs> What's the thing, right? Not like everyone when... could... I'll, I'll pull the Remy here. Not not everyone could be a great writer, but a great writer can come from anyone. Come from anywhere, yeah. Uh... In fact, that, that card feels pretty apt, actually. <laughs> See, we did it. We found we found the Remy <laughs> the Rat of Star Wars. <laughs> it was an Andor all along. You bastard. Well, it's kind of funny because I still have zero hope for any Marvel shows. Oh, no. They all seem to be made in the exact same way. I I think that the reality is that, like, maybe Star Wars, there's just more room for that to be possible because it's not as, it's not as, you know, enclosed, I guess. Well, yeah, did, did, well, we, I've talked about this before. You need an artist to sneak in, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah which, is what, which is kind of what happened with Andor. A whole team of artists, like, talented yeah. creators, managed to get their hands on a Star Wars project. That's the real heist. That's, That's the real somehow got inside of <laughs> Disney, but they're like artists who have a vision in their talent. I know it's incredible. Um, I guess that'll take us to episode seven. Yes, seven. which um, I'm gonna top off my drink, so I'll be right back. Very well. we, looks like my notes here are gonna put us through on. Uh, we're doing Cyril first. No, it's Out of the loud. Loud. Okay, cool. Then Deirdre. Dead of her, oh, his is quite long, actually. Then Luthen, and then Cassian. Ooh, quite long. Yeah, it's probably a good order to do it in. Let's see what everybody else is doing in reaction to the old Arnie stuff. Yeah. We've got some huge developments stemming from that. Well, cause, yeah, because the way this formatting works now is like seven is almost a breather of an episode in terms of. Uh, yeah. Well, the, yeah. The, we're recovering and then setting up the right at the beginning of the next arc, which. Obviously, the way this episode ends puts Andor in a very specific arc that everybody was talking about vaguely, at least. Um, yes. Because if anybody knows anything about this show, you'll have heard maybe the the prison part or something. People refer to it that way. Right. That's what I had heard about, and uh, the addition of a particular actor. I actually yes. haven't heard anything about it. <laughs> so- oh, that was that. People were gushing over it, but fortunately, I uh, I managed to avoid any specifics. Um. So I got to I got to watch it for what it was. Noise. Yeah, same. Well, same for basically the whole show. Um, managed to avoid a lot of uh, a lot of spoilers. You well, the the thing is, I guess I avoided a lot of spoilers because of the fact Wait, that nobody's really huh? talking about it. Um, I, and it came out weekly. It did it. It did its job, so to speak, as a show. It just uh, I guess I wouldn't have recommended it come out at the same time as. One of the worst Marvel things ever put out that got loads of attention for actively attacking its critics immediately and shitting on one of the legacy characters immediately. A show that is trying to claw back its reputation after it was destroyed by the previous like entry of the IP and actually impressed everybody. And then another show that was trying to annihilate what is one of the favored IPs of all time that hasn't been tarnished anywhere near as much as some other... You know, I'm trying to describe the three significant TV shows that came out at the same time. It's just like... Baby move yours. It's really weird to put for Disney to put out She Hulk and this at similar times. Like, wouldn't you want you guys separate them out a little bit? What are you doing? Right, I got you. No content. <laughs> Though, I mean, the disparate quality. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Well, um, so, uh, yeah, Cyril is trying to sort out his potentially new job. And uh, his mum says, what makes you believe the Bureau of Standards is in the market for individuals? And she's saying this because of the way he's dressed. That's her way of making fun of his uh, his choice of outfit. He just says, it's a brown suit. And she says, uh, it's your interview. <laughs> because perhaps you'd wish to come along. And she says, you're not just representing yourself today. And then again, he just goes, it's a brown suit. <laughs> like... <laughs> 
Seriously, I really enjoy their back and forth. I like I, their back and forth a lot. It's yeah, it's not even that much really of it, funny. but I get such a distinct impression of these two. Uh, she says, your collar is high. Every Everything says something. And he goes, uh, what do you hear my collar saying to you? <laughs> and she says, I'm desperate for approval and I don't believe in myself. <laughs> but, quite an impressive fucking mother to have, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for all this encouragement. Um, yeah, and, uh, it's on the news, the Aldani thing, and she says they attacked a garrison and they're gonna regret it. Yeah, that's yep. the vibe. Um, but yeah, he gets a he gets an extremely boring job in an extremely boring place, and he's doing it for very boring reasons, which is to gradually expunge his record of his failure yeah. in Aldani. And... Um, he says, I was punished for trying to uphold the law. Two men dead, co-workers. I, I intend to have my records ex expunged. And um, there's this shot so fucking good in terms of showing his life now. Uh, in fact, I'll try and do it without the... Cause I got oh, the yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about specifically. Yeah. The, the, this is him for the whole episode, by the way. This is... Like, all they're trying to do is show us that uh, he's trying to, once again, sort of climb the ladder or do things the proper way, but it's not something I don't think that he wants. This is not the the method he wants to approach, because where he was versus where he is now, this is not at all what he wanted. Mm -hmm. Yep, he is, uh, he is far from where he wanted to be. He's an absolute yeah. cog. <laughs> um... All right, we'll switch over to Deirdre, the ISB plotline, which is actually very significant for this one. Uh, we haven't seen them for a while, but they're going to be coming back in. And we open with everyone looking pretty stressed out and everyone gathering. And uh, a character called Euloren is giving a speech. And what's neat about this is that the actor is uh, hes not overtly stated to be this way, but this is the kind of... I'm not even going to call it fan service, okay? This is just how it should work. He's on the um the Senate or the council meeting in the original the New Hope meeting with um Vader and Tarkin. Uh this guy is on that table, one of the like super duper higher ups. Oh, it's, uh, okay. It's a different actor. It's they've recast him, he's playing the same person. Um and I've seen people comment on this, like, this is how you do it. This is the way it's supposed to do it. It's the little things. Like, how can we, you know, we have all these opportunities. How do we make use of it? How do we how do I mean if you're really doing it for you know, the fans of the people who, you know, really care, they might be the people who remember details. So when they find these details in the show, they might be like, oh, this show was really made, you know, kind of for me in a way. Yeah, for those who aren't paying as much attention or, you know, just normal people, they'll just be like, so he's just guy in charge. It's like, oh, they've managed to make it so that he's not just guy in charge. He's a significant guy that we've seen before, even vaguely, and that it makes sense he'd probably turn up here. This is... This is a significant thing that's happened. The ISB need to do something about this. This is uh, almost the entire point of their job. But as has been implied before, um, the result of this is he gives a big old speech and he says, um, the criminals responsible for last night's atrocity on Aldani think they've taken the Empire by surprise. We know better. We know the real shock will be when they discover how ready and eager we are to respond, to be prepared, to be here this morning, and to know the only question we need to answer is how tight do we close our fist? So, you can already get a vibe for uh, the Empire's response. And by the way, this is kind of like, dare I say, reasonable and expected. Other characters have commented on this, but what happened when, when you've got like an entire network of security that spans a galaxy and you've got rules and regulations in place, and then someone breaches them and steals from you when, as far as you're concerned, you're providing order and security, what is the response? It's like, well, we're going to put that shit to use. Yeah, it's time, I guess, to teach you a lesson, like why we're here and what the point of all of this is. You can't just steal shit from us. But it has the side effect, of course, of someone who doesn't even believe themselves to be that oppressive or to be dictatory and, and just whatever. Like they, they enact all these like closed down plans. It's going to have insane effects on lots of people that are going to be encouraged to possibly do some other things. But what would be his response to that? It would be like, don't fuck with us. We will put you in prison. We will take your money, we will take your freedoms, like, don't fuck with the rules, they're there for a reason. Things would be nicer and peacefuler if you just paid attention. Got these very, um, sort of stalwart and 
arguably arrogant uh, members of, of these these higher up areas, and they are insulted by the fact that any of this shit could possibly happen. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, obviously he's just going to push for uh, things are going to get worse. He says, um, this is why we work so hard when we're at peace. This is why we recruit so carefully and demand so much. The following measures will be adopted empire-wide as of today. A tribute tax equal to five times the amount stolen from Aldani will be levied on any sector harboring partisan activity. We'll make it clear that no one steals from the Empire. The use of any local custom, festival, or tradition as cover for rebel activity will trigger permanent revocation of Imperial tolerance. I really quite like that line, because it's obviously about the eye. Yeah. And, and that whole, like, event. And just the, it will trigger permanent revocation of Imperial tolerance. Like, we're chill with you. If you fuck with us, we will not be chill with you. It's very oh, simple. It's a worthy way of essentially saying, yeah, if, if you, yeah, screw with us, we'll screw with you. And he says, I spoke with Emperor Palpatine last night, and he's assured me that the ISB will be taking the lead going forward. No one in this room should have trouble accessing army or naval resources in future. Right, there it is. That's a yeah, big, big deal. Uh, it's obviously this event, he's expanding the power of the ISB so that it can make things faster and more powerful. The Emperor will be convening an emergency session of the Senate to propose a legislation package of bills and amendments that will free our hands in all matters of surveillance, search, and seizure. We will be invoking the Public Order Resentencing Directive later today. EORD becomes relevant later as well. Super relevant later, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All sentences to be reevaluated and all debts are to be paid. So yeah, this is this is huge. This has made an enormous impact. Stealing uh, one sector's quarterly payment. Yep. Unacceptable. It's, um, it's, yeah, exactly. It's just it's just really cool to see you have pissed off the empire. Yeah, they have to project strength and efficiency, and so they cannot. There's no half measures when it comes to that sort of thing. We cannot allow people to think that they can do it and get away with it. And yeah. they have to make sure that everyone knows that if you even try to do it, this is what happens. <clears throat> yeah, they're hammering down hard. Very Three. hard. Yep. Um, and so Deirdre is pushing forward, and in the next ISB meeting, uh, she's essentially, like, attacked by, I think it's Blevin, is um, the other sector leader. He says that... Uh, well, uh, he wants to go after Deirdre for acting inappropriately. And what's cool about it is he starts this all up, and uh, Partagaz, before he lets it continue, is like, do you think this forum appropriate? He just says, I do. Mm -hmm. He goes, okay, Supervisor Miro being Deirdre, uh, do you mind having your integrity ventilated in public? And she yeah. says, no, sir. I'm curious to hear his insights. It's like, I just like how it's it's it, he's basically like, do you really think it's like a good idea to do this what seems personal thing in front of everybody? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, are you okay with him doing it in front of everybody? Yeah, he checks both. Yeah, he makes sure, do you actually want to do this? And is this okay if we carry on? Because this isn't really the best place for it. Doesn't seem appropriate, I mean, it but like he, if you're both on board, you know? I mean, he, I guess he has some level of, like, he well, wants everyone both, to be working. They're both making a gamble, is what it is. Yeah. The two. This is a bold play for both of them, and the consequences are significant, you know, depending yep. on who wins and loses. And so, Deirdre has used the Imperial Emergency Act in the wake of Aldani to gather data across multiple sectors without official sanction. Um, and then she says, but that is the wrong question. I'd like to know if anyone here believes the Rebellion plans its actions around the artificially constructed boundaries of our sectors. Obviously, she's trying to say, like, the the way I will discover there's a rebellion forming is not going to be sector by sector. It's going to be grand because the whole point is that they don't want to be detected. Why would they follow our boundaries? Why am I having to follow our boundaries when trying to discover the rebellion? And uh, what's cool is um, someone else goes, Major Partagaz created those sectors. Um, and she says, as organizing principles, not personal playthings, do you think the rebels care about the lines we draw? And uh, Partagaz says, you think the relevance of my work has been supplanted? <laughs> like, like, is hey. it? Uh... <laughs> and then uh, she says, and she, she has a big breath before this, because I think she knows this is it. This is the big one. She says, uh, systems either change or die, sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looks like he's impressed, but he wants to know more. And he says, thesis, please. 
There's, there's a focused, yep. organized rebel effort to acquire highly restricted Imperial military components. By accessing unfiltered sector crime reports, I can now prove a link between the theft of our most secret equipment and its distribution to rebel groups across the galaxy. And she says, uh, this is hard, verifiable data she can present and that she believes Blevin is aware um, that she has the documented file ready to go and that this accusation in the morning is more to do with his self-preservation than any sense of urgency. And um, he says, well, what's more urgent than a renegade intelligence officer? And <laughs> uh, he said, imagine if everyone in this room played as fast and loose with the rules as you do. And Pardegas says, excellent suggestion, Blevin. I wonder where we'd be right now if everyone here showed the same endeavor as Supervisor Miro. Nah. Like, uh-oh. And so he says, I'm uh, reassigning Morlana Sector to her. Because uh, Ferex is clearly of great interest to her, and it's clearly become a distraction to you. Yep. The really cool scene, she worked her ass off. She uh, put forward quite a bit of... She basically said his system is old and useless, and there's loads of holes in it, and the, the rules she has applied to her as like a unit operator is restricting her ability to even trace the rebellion. And with all of the evidence and arguments she's making, all Blevid has is like, well, you're being a bit, you know... You're breaking the rules. But there's just no... Even if her motive were just to rise in the ranks, she's getting results. Yeah. And that's what Partagaz cares about. So he's like, look, if all you're going to do is sit here and complain that she's doing more work, I'm just going to assign her to your sector and you can do something else. And um, yeah, uh, to me, it comes across as really competent, uh, quick... And very much character driven. This is more than just the plot line of how everything's going to roll out in the other sectors and everything. This is characters that want to rise in their ranks of their careers. She is such a career the obsessed lady that uh, she's doing everything she can and she's found something, something very interesting. But now she's got the access and the authority to be able to pursue it further. She, she won. She's managed to pull it off. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Very good. So we'll rewind once again. Move over to Mr. Luthen. What's he up to? Just chilling. Big L. Um, Big L. So, yeah, uh, has a little chat with good old Mon Mothma. She's popping in, and I happen, this is one of the several scenes in the show that I love. Um, she said, because she's basically outraged that this has happened, the Aldani thing. She, she believes it's him immediately that did it. And she said, I told you I'm doing everything I can in relation to getting more funds. And he says, your everything seemed to be all about bringing in a savior to access your family funds. And um, he says, like, I explained the risk of new faces, but you seem to know better. And it's that attitude he has and establishing that she's not moving fast enough or smart enough. He, like, skips that criticism and just goes straight to, you realize what you've done? Like, she's, she sees him saying that as admission that he, he did do the Aldani thing. Yeah. Because uh, he's, he's pretty much assigned, like, a motive already. And, uh, man, this is just one of the several examples you have of this lady uh, really selling that Mon Mothma as a character is terrified in her current position. Um, yeah, the walls are sort of closing around her. She's becoming more and more trapped. Oh, yes. Um, she's clearly motivated by doing the right well. thing sort of thing, but she has a family. She has her own life, and she... Has probably it probably started as doing supportive things here and there, but she's getting further and further and deeper and deeper. And of course, if she yeah. were, if she were connected to Aldani, she'd be fucked. Oh yeah. Well, it's like she said earlier in the in the season, she'd be the first one to uh to to fall. fall. Yeah. Uh, what's really neat about this scene is that the driver is outside this time, and so every time Luthen faces her and thus the outside, he smiles and seems more yeah. like floaty and fun. Every time he turns mm -hmm. his back to the wall, he's stern and angry, and his face drops every time. Always making sure that little play is keeping up. It's, uh, it's not gonna go wrong. Really cool, really fun. Good job. Nice effort on both the actor and the character's part. It's character mm -hmm. building. Also just uh, giving Stellan Skarsgård stuff to do. Yeah, and ain't that nice. And, you feel uh, good that he could be in a you know, yeah. Like show that is utilizing his abilities. He says, "I warned you. You knew this is going. Has anyone ever built a weapon they didn't use?" 
and I assume he's talking about the construction of like plans and different tech and stuff, but I just feel like it's a commentary on uh, the Death Star, to be honest with you. Which, uh... Did you guys see the after credit scene in the final episode, by the way? No, I didn't. I didn't know there oh, was one. I, I didn't even expect there to be one. That's why, no, I have not. Bringy, did you see it? Uh, I, no, I don't think so. Well, you know what? None of you should. We should, we should check that out at the same time. Oh, okay. Oh, it's, it's pretty neat, I'd say. And it's something that if it was shown before seeing this season, we would have been like, nah, go away. But with this season, <laughs> it's like, ooh, okay, all right. Mm. That's interesting because it didn't strike me as a show that has an after credit scene like at all. So I think a lot of people missed it. Uh, I didn't even think to look for it. Like no, the episode yeah. was over. The last one was like, okay, right, good. I, I enjoyed that. Let's get out of here. <laughs> um, yeah, and so she's she's complaining basically, Mon, to him that this this has gone too far, and she's like, "You told me we were just building a network," and his response is, "What were my words?" Like, I, I like the a aspect there of basically, like, I never lied to you. Like, I may have done something that I knew you probably wouldn't like, but you should have fucking listened to what I said, because I was going to do this yeah. the whole time. And he's, like, angry at the idea that she would imply he's lied. Like, I haven't betrayed shit. Like, I've done exactly what I said I would do. Um, and he says, we need the fear. We need them to overreact. They've been choking us so slowly, we don't even notice. And she says, there, yeah. he says mm -hmm. people are going to suffer. And he says, that's the plan. You can't yeah. hide forever. So yes, uh, that's as over as it's going to get. Luthan wants the Empire to do more cruel, more harsh things. Yeah, because that's probably going to be the only way to get the, the masses to join in. And uh, a lot of what I believe Luthan's frustrations are is that he's been in this fight, so to speak, for a very long time, and he's had basically zero tangible results. In fact, everything is still seemingly just moving toward getting worse slowly, which is the whole thing he's trying to stop. Mm -hmm. And so the Aldani situation, that's probably why he was so happy, is that it, it means things are now going to change. Uh, and hopefully move toward the goal he has, because he's, uh, he's been pretty toothless, but this is like something that's super significant. And so it should also be seen as a victory, as far as he's concerned. Um, but yeah, his, his partner -y person meets with Val, and they talk about how the money is safe. And that Sinta is uh, he's on a job as well. Um, but that Vel wants to know where she is, and they're like, receiving messages is just as dangerous as sending them. She's doing what she was told. We have a loose end. The Cassian Andor. Mm -hmm. uh, she said, we need to find him. And she says, you mean kill him? And she says, this is what revolution looks like. But yeah, damn. So uh, because Cassian's just sort of unaccounted for they need to kill him now because he has too much information yep which if we rewind send us all the way back to the plot line of cassian in this episode what is he up to back oh. to yeah i think first thing we see him do i think is, is he visits his mum. he goes back to um yeah he goes back to um ferrix yeah and you yeah. find out this is where <clears throat> um you find out Tim Carlo is the guy who turned to uh, turn him into the thing, and like because of the stupid reasons, but also um, uh, the Mar Marvo says uh, she was coming to warn you when he found her or tried to stop her to catch her. I've heard both. The corpos killed him. Like I, I like the idea that it's unclear on exactly how or why he even died. Because who would like what what could even be said in terms of why he was there, what he was doing? Uh, she wouldn't know anyway. Bix, right? It could be that mm -hmm. he was just there trying to help it, but also, like, try to stop it from helping. Well, and how many people, you know, actually saw it happen, and what did they hear from one guy, and what did that guy say to the other guy? It's just realistic. Nobody quite knows what happened. We do, because we're the audience. Well, and, exactly. and the whole town would probably fucking hate him. Ah, uh, yeah, because, in a sense, he kicks it off, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and she says the Imperials are here to stay this time. It's all come undone. And he says, we can leave. We can get out of the cold and the dark somewhere easy. Uh, we'll pull out in the morning. I just got to check up on Bix. And then she's like, yeah, okay. Uh, morning, I guess. Um, mm. So I think he goes to see Bix. Yeah, yes, she's, he does. she says, uh, people blamed you for what happened. You killed two corpos and came here to hide. And he says, your crazy boyfriend tries to get me killed and I'm the villain. 
I, I, I find it, like, it's just awkward to me because, yeah, like, the boyfriend thing is so weak. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. It's pretty lame. Should have found a different way to do that if that's what you wanted to have in your plot. Um. Yeah, and he says to her, if you ever talk to Luthen again, tell him I held up my end of the deal and don't try to find me. Um. And we get a, a quick flashback, actually, of uh, how his dad died. It was that his dad recommends, like, just keeping your head down and don't piss anyone off, just just do your thing. And uh, he tries to stop two guys from having a fight in at a bad moment, and the stormtroopers basically execute him as an example. Uh, it seems like just super bad luck, super tragic sort of moment, basically. His, his dad seemed pretty chill. Yeah. Bad timing. Uh... Anyway, in the morning, he goes back to the mum. He's like, you're not doing any packing. And she says, uh, she's staying for the rebellion. Ferex has become, like, overrun and that she's been hiding for too long. And he's like, you fucking nuts. She says that, uh, for 13 years, she's taken the long way around Rick's Road so that she doesn't have to think about where Clem was hanging. Like, damn. You know what I mean? Like, you, you sometimes think oh, yeah, like, I'm watching just... Star Wars, by the way. Yeah. And I don't mean that in terms of more child-friendly content. I just mean, God, you were such a goofy nonsense bullshit for so long. I'm not used to the idea of a character saying they can't, res like, they, they don't want to think about their husband having been hanged by stormtroopers. Yeah. Damn. Um, Quite different. Then she says, I hear about this attack. If there are heroes brave enough to take on the whole Imperial garrison, I'm brave enough to stick it out here. People are standing up. Uh, I think that's just interesting in terms of, you know, a statement, right, uh, in universe that an act of rebellion inspires somebody else to, uh, to enact their own act of rebellion, however small yep. it may be. And he says, you can't beat them. And she says, not if I run away. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's like, well, they, yeah, exactly. You definitely can't beat them if you're not going to do anything. And then he says, I'll be worried about you all the time. And she says, that's just love. You can't do anything about that. Like, oh. Uh, she says, tell me you understand. And he says, I don't. And she says, you will. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, his his mum isn't leaving. He's not sure what to do about that, really. So, he has himself some fun. Uh, he... He's got his money and his gun and his resources all in this little, like, box, and I think he rents out some room in some hotel for a night. Uh, yeah, I think. And he's having a shower, and he uh. puts it at the top of the shower, like... Yeah, it's, it's like a little... Definitely... I'd hide it better. I would have hidden it better yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so to be fair, he doesn't need to hide it too well, because this is a place he's gonna return to in mere hours, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not too bad that he hides it, but the thing, but... It's a hiding place that's not going to work for very long, is kind of what I would say. More Probably on that no later. Uh, anyway, he goes for a walk, and uh, he sees that some guys, pretty casually dressed, are just sprinting away, and there's a trooper chasing them. So he sees that, and he's like, "Oh, geez, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna walk in a different direction, I guess." And he Get walks away. He walks past another trooper who's like, "Hey, what are you doing?" Um. In a, uh, this results in him going to prison. I hated that. I don't like <laughs> it at all. I was like, really? After all we've been through, you just walk to the store and some random Imperial guy is it's like, just, you walk just... funny, go to prison. It's like, oh. And it doesn't mean that that couldn't happen in that yeah, kind of climate right possible. now. But it's but so lame. So lame. I was like, really? Oh. I guess that would be like that's kind of like the point, right? Is that it's just it's just some bullshit. Yeah. Um, and he and gets random. screwed over, royally screwed over, and it's just total bullshit. But yeah. it's something that can happen. Like that. That's kind mm -hmm. of the point, right? It feels so. It's it feels so like unfair and ridiculous because it is. My yeah, criticism would be, I ridiculous. think you can achieve it much stronger, both the exact uh, same yeah. feeling, but with a, a stronger story, right? So, like, what is being complained about here? It's that our main character happened to walk past the wrong person at the wrong time, which 
It's like, how yeah, can we better justify is... that but maintain the point, which is that they're coming down so hard at the lowest levels that people are now getting put in prison for literally doing nothing at all, just looking the wrong way at the wrong time. How do we do it? Um, and it's like, well, we've got enough to work with already, right? He's walking through this place looking shifty because he is shifty because he wants to make sure no one catches him doing anything. So he's looking around all the time to find any possible threats. If you have a trooper watching someone for a while doing that at a distance... That's already enough to be like, I might talk to that guy. He looks so yeah. fucking shifty. But we don't get that. We get he crosses in front of a like a barricade type thing. And they showed us the trooper right before he showed him. He sees him for what's about possibly a second and a half before he says, hey. And it's like, how, how the fuck, man? There's so many random civilians here. What exactly clued you into this one in particular? And if you said that's the point, the trooper just randomly grabs people and says, I hate you, you're probably evil, and then they go to prison. It's like, okay, that's... What I like so much about this show is portraying what I believe to be an oppressive government well, not cartoonally. I don't, I don't like the whole, like, I'll just grab you and pop you in prison now, lol. It's, yeah. uh... It's really I, lame. I find it much more engaging to have it so that he's like... That, that one guy over there, he's looking a little weird, and he's dressed kind of similar to the, the criminals that are running around. And you just stop him and be like, what's your deal? What's what's your name? And you can have Cassian like be like, oh, fuck. I've got to actually like get my ID in place. I've got to remember my alibi. I've got to... Do it. And he can start like screwing it up, and the guy can be more and more inquisitive and then realize, like, we're going to take you in for questioning. And then he can be like, fuck no. I, I give it, like Because he realizes like if he is, it'll, it'll result in worse things. And then... Maybe tries to run and then trips up. Someone happens, blah, blah, blah. Like, much more than just literally, I don't know, man, you're sweating. So, and he's like, it's a hot yeah. day. And he's like, yeah, well, you've been rutted. It's so weak. Which it's I like, haven't it, been. But, but it's like, as you know, it. yeah, you could have you could have used the reason for his capture to be something related to his personality. Andor's, he got involved with something, or he partied too hard and hit someone or he accidentally did something or anything uh but this is just like i feel such a such a lame way to have that happen i would have thought it'd be a cool piece of like irony to have it be that he's so careful that it actually gets him caught whereas if he were just treating everything as normal he'd have been fine like the efforts to almost try and come across as nonchalant actually make him look a little bit less that way and um I was thinking one opportunity, right, could be that he has that interaction with a trooper, it goes okay, and then as soon as that trooper's like, all right, fine, you, yeah, you seem normal, Andal then backs up and gets behind, like, a wall to hide and peeks out of it just to make sure he's like, yeah, okay, they haven't spotted me. And then, like, you know, the camera can turn and there's a trooper looking at him the whole time. He saw that interaction and he saw what he did after it and he's like, what the hell? Like, wh yeah. what's, what's your... And what my point is, of course, he's like, I'm taking all these efforts to hide... And by doing so, I've got myself caught. Like, I think there's a lot you could draw out of that, and it's really interesting. And then it combos up with this oppressive system grabbing uh, anyone. And, and what the irony, of course, is that they've grabbed a big criminal by accident. They don't even exactly. know, yeah. One of the so, most wanted um, men in the galaxy, and they just don't even really know who he truly is. So yeah, I don't know. I, I think this is a case of that annoys the hell out of me. Um, but it wasn't mm -hmm. done because they had no other ideas. I think this was their idea. Like they yeah. were like, yeah. they want to make a point of like this can happen where you just get picked up randomly. The other thing I didn't fucking like about this was that he almost dies uh, for no reason at all. And I think it's supposed to be funny. Oh, he just gets choked by the droid, right? Yeah, because the droid yeah, somehow misunderstands the English of "hang on to this guy." He says "hang him." It's like no, we know droids are smart enough to understand yeah. "hang on to him," not "hang him." You're a robot. You're smart. You have a robotic brain. Don't be stupid. Then he's like, please tell him you didn't mean hang me. And it's like, what the fuck? Because um, something I kind of like was the way that he is uh, charged officially for all he did was speak. Like, it's like, um, you know, the public disruption, uh, it, it disrupting like the operations of Imperial Command. Like, but, you know, like, the kind of thing where all I did was speak and they've managed to give me like four significant charges as a result that sound mm -hmm. really like horrifying when you when you read them out that way. Um, I like all that stuff. I just I just wish it was more justified because I wouldn't be spending so much time on this if not for the fact that this decides the story for the next like fucking four episodes. Well, yes, the rest of the season. Exactly. Very important. Yes. This has enormous repercussions. Um, but yeah, all right. That's 
That's episode seven. Sure is. Good stuff. Except that end bit. Except that end bit, yeah. Well, it's funny. It's probably my least favorite episode, but I still I like all of them. There's stuff of value in each of them. Yes. <laughs> uh oh. What? I'm trying to figure out. Did I... Oh, did I miss out Mon Mothma? So sorry. Oh my it... goodness. We can't forget Mon Mothma. Yeah, I think you did. Wait, no, you didn't. You talked about the scene with Luthen, remember? With Luthen. That was yeah. Luthen's scene. She's got scenes of her oh, own. Oh, right. Because, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, she's trying to get help from an old friend, and she says, um... Oh, oh yeah, of course. I want to tell you something that very few people know about, and he says, personal or political? And she's like, political. And he says, uh, I suggest you hesitate. I've done more than grow weary of the Empire. Um, you're with these people all the time. And she says, what you see, what people say about me, it's a clear picture, isn't it? I'm a polite, sometimes indecisive senator who spends her days fighting and failing to protect separatist do-gooders and battle empire overreach and irritation. The lie, and uh, the person people think they know, I've learned from Palpatine. I show you the stone in my hand and you miss the knife at your throat. I'm being watched and I want that. If everyone thinks I'm an irritation, there's a good chance they'll miss what I'm really doing. So, uh, the pretty good seed to tell you exactly how much she's aware of her position despite the fear she holds she is using the fact that she's being surveilled to her benefit she wants them to believe she's an annoying little asshole who has values that are different from the empire when in reality she's actually a figurehead in the rebellion you know mm -hmm. uh, and yeah she wants his help to raise money and she's obviously doing this as a result of what happened on Aldani. She needs to speed up everything now. Yeah, time is of the essence. You've got to pick up the pace. Which means we can push on to the next Esipude. Esipude. So, uh, Cassian's on his way to the prison. That's, that's the, what we're going to be talking about. It's kind of nuts. Um... <laughs> But the thing is, like, the prison arc itself is, is going to be lots of fun to talk about. So, uh, oh, this yeah. is how it begins. This is an imperial factory facility. He's been assigned labor worthy, and the length of his stay has been predetermined. On program means they have to have feet down, hands on head, and stay still. Um, and he says, Now, those who have been incarcerated before will be surprised by the calm sanitary conditions and our minimally invasive enforcement techniques. Well, um, I'm sure some of you, if not all of you, are wondering how we risk standing before you without weapons. And he says it's a potent question, and hopefully one we won't need to have answered very often. And he just electrocutes all of them, basically. Yeah. The floor it, is... The floor is lava. Electrocuted, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of ways that it is used that is uh, psychologically crippling. Yeah, I guess we'll get into more of that as we go, but the, the, the intro is that... Um, all of the guards wear booties, and all of the prisoners are barefoot, and the floor yeah. will electrify at their command, basically. And, and there they have are tasers. multiple intensities, and what they had, which seemed incredibly painful, was only the first, the lowest level yeah. of the shock. He yep. is put into Unit 52D, which is level 5 of 7, room 2 of 7, 7 tables per room, 7 men per table. The seven tallies yep. are the running shift totals of all other rooms on this floor. You play against all other rooms in the table, uh, the, the, all other tables in the room, and I play against all the other rooms, which is what Andy Circus says. And uh, he says, play, and he says, call it what you will. The point of this conversation is you understand one thing clearly. I have 249 days left of my sentence. Uh, I have a free hand in how I run this room. I'm used to being on the top three of all the levels. You want to keep... Uh, you will want to keep that happening. I'm sensing you understand me. It's a, uh, it. I I can't like uh do justice to his delivery. Andy Circus is just a great actor. Yes, we, he we're is just, amazing. We yeah. are just going to be singing the praises of Andy Circus for the next <laughs> little while, giving him an opportunity to play a character in the Star Wars universe after after last all. time he was absolutely <laughs> squandered. Mm. But here he gets to shine. Uh, he is one of the standouts, He's, which is no crazy to say for how great the performances are throughout this the show. He's um, 
this the, the, the sort of specific and speedy efficient nature of this whole thing this factory prison and him and his introduction and how he gets everything in gives you a solid sense of like how he's a prisoner who's been molded to get all the other prisoners in high efficiency basically like what a clever idea on the empire's part to make use of prisoners and to the point of almost wanting them to like people to become criminals to just move them into these factories um, because a question may be asked, what are they building here? Um, and that actually gets answered. Uh, not sure if any of you three have figured out what the answer is, though. Uh, I didn't. I didn't even think about it. I was just, I was just some mechanical parts for stuff. Well, it's, uh, it's super interesting. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, it, it's like crafted to perfection, basically, and it's all... Yeah, it's a, a become... claw. What? <laughs> yeah. Are they not? They look like they're claw, like they have fingers, and the fingers grab things. Not a claw, but all right. Not a, no, I mean, um, I didn't think it was a claw because it's been very solid after they put it together, right? Well, I I think that they're they're just they're rigid when they're still, but they could be given power. I I because I thought they had like fingers. Um, uh, that's what I thought they were. That they okay. had like a little, like a, like a, you know, a little robotic Fair enough. claw. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, making everyone focus like on the game that is being played, so to speak. Like he said, he was almost offended initially by referring to it that way, but that is what it is. And uh, it's getting work done in the meantime, and it sort of solves the problem of the entire prison. It's this whole thing. I mean, I think we've explained enough of it to say what how representative it is of not a prison. It's, it's, it's like. It's an allegory for the broader, like, the Empire itself. Kinda. It's like this big system where all of the people are forced to compete against each other and consequently kind of, like, govern themselves to act in a certain way that is contrary to their interests, but uh, very much in the interests of the broader structure. Um, and the people who don't compete well enough are severely punished. Um, but at the same time, it's like they've created a system that is, in a sense, self-governing. All of, like, the prisoners, you know, it's prisoners who, like, govern the rooms and the prisoners essentially, like, abide by the rules and, and will compete against one another. When the reality is that, like, the prison probably can't, doesn't have enough staff to deal with all of them. It's like a really, it's it's this really cruel system that has them fighting against one another. Yeah. Instead of fighting nice. against the system that's oppressing them. Yeah, you feel like with this prison arc, you, you, this could be like its own show. You know, this own little mini show that you watch, like, a, you know, it, it just, it feels, you know, it, it's just, like, it feels like this story in and of itself, a story in a story. Oh, it's something huge that's been running this whole time, and it's a huge realization to those inside here once they realize more of what's happening. Because, yeah, it, as was said, it's like it's pitted all of the prisoners against each other, providing, like, rewards and punishments based on performance against each other, and... It's precisely why they don't need greater numbers or greater weaponry other than the the, the flaws and everything, because everyone's almost been convinced to focus on each other and sort of climbing over each other, like crab bucket style, uh, because of the mm. Empire has, has forced them into this position. They've sort of forgot. It's like, do you, when Andor arrives, it's like, he's like baffled by all this, doesn't really understand it, but it won't take long before he's super invested in getting each of these components ready so that he doesn't have to be one of the losing tables that gets fried and instead maybe can right. be one of the winning tables that gets flavor in their food oh yeah the fact that that's the the incentive for winning is you get flavor and if you, you lose flavor you get in shocked. your food it's like Jesus. And not only do you get shocked but you get shocked with all of the other people around <clears throat> to see it happen it's uh it's an incredibly cruel prison yeah it is uh, it's, it's a very it's a very um it's a very clever system in terms of maintaining control over the prisoners but it's like that's what makes it all the more just like reprehensible is like the extent to which they've basically implemented psychological manipulation uh to get the prisoners to act according to you know their goals they say red is hot and two men in a cell is an instant fry which i thought was kind of interesting that means that you could kill someone if you really wanted to and you were willing to kill yourself i guess mm-hmm uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, if you could keep them in there long enough. Yeah, you certainly could. 
Because it said instant fry. It's like it doesn't even get verified, I guess. It's just the detection of two and you're dead. Oh, I thought fried was different, I guess, levels of... Yeah, I suppose so. Oh, it could be. Maybe they are saying that it only fries them as in, like, it doesn't kill them. It punishes, but um, I don't know. Yeah, I would assume because else that almost sounds like something that would just happen all the time. It, um, well, we do see a suicide as well, don't we? We do. We do, yeah. Where a guy just actually steps onto the electrocuted floor to get out of there. And then the thing that's really shit as well is that some of the prisoners are like, oh, well, that just makes it harder for our table, like, yes. asshole. Now we're gonna get tried. Like, thanks, buddy, for making that choice, yeah. rather than Man, and this the, prison is really fucked up that it would have that as like yeah, a feature of their security. Yeah. I think even someone someone just yeah, it's like, oh man, he's gonna be I'm gonna be smelling him all night. He's like, yeah, man, yeah, exactly. you're like all like, over the shit, are you? Like, you just yeah. don't care. Well, it's just it's working, right? Well, the, yeah. the psychological manipulation of the prison is working. When he say, he says something like uh, killing yourself like that or railing yourself like that, I got no sympathy for you or something like that, one of them says. Mm hmm yeah like, uh, it, it's become so normal and so understood in terms of what you do when you do it that yeah they've all gone to a point where it's like ah oh, fucking idiot what are you doing when it's like a guy has killed himself uh that's how hard it's gotten of course um oh yeah and you find out that uh their their numbers their sentences all got doubled with the uh because of the new act and they're of really desperate to find out what andor knows because he's new right he's new and he's just got yep, yeah. from the outside yeah, they... it's the only way you get news is new people coming in and whatever exactly they, know. they don't know shit and uh melchi i think is his name he says doesn't matter double your number triple your number you're in here till they don't want you anymore mm -hmm. and uh he starts saying that and then andy circus is like hey shut the fuck up shut don't, the fuck do up that. And you get a distinct impression that Belchie is like this super cynical, almost nihilistic prisoner, and that uh, Andy, Andy Serkis, as part of his job of being head of this like sector, is to keep everybody from downing themselves morally. Got to keep everyone up. Right, nice because spirits. everybody's got to, exactly, but then they'll work. They'll actually, yes. you know. Um, which is interesting, because in a sense, he's got, well, jumping ahead a bit, in a sense, he's actually got it backwards. Elaborate. Oh, uh, you know, oh, well, if people believe that we're never going to get out of here, then um, that's that's going to completely destroy any willingness that anybody has to do anything. It's like, well, if they believe that they have no chance of getting out of, of, of the prison, that might actually prompt them to make a different choice mm. uh, about their status. That might that might actually uh, that instead of instead of making them uh, utterly hopeless, it might actually spur them to do something. Yes. Sir. Something uh, that they wouldn't do if they believe that there's actually a chance that things will get better as long as they do as they're told. They do have a couple of moments as well of showing a uh, guy on their team, uh, Olaf, is, is slow and. Oh, he's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not exactly. He's an old one. And... He's having a bit of trouble. Um, there's also, a, I think Andal gets done with his portion relatively quickly and they're waiting on Olaf and. Just sort of like chilling for a minute, and then the second he does, uh, Andy Circus just like, oh, just having a bit yeah. of a break, are we? <laughs> have a like, little bit of like, breather. Yeah. And he's like, we got a chance of winning the shift today. Be ashamed to waste it. It's like yeah. he is, uh, he is on you for efficiency. Like it's not even close. And yeah, uh, it takes the one episode, and Andor is pretty much fully in. He's a cog now in this prison machine. Yeah, yeah. I think it takes him thirty shifts. I think it's, it's like a little. Uh... Yeah, he's in there for at least Fade a in. month. It's like 30, 30 shifts later or something, and it's like, yep, I'm in here. I'm I'm a I'm a part of the machine, and he's he's working fast. So let's get to the also, other plot lines. Well, I, uh, there's just uh, just one one other thing in the beginning. Racism. But no, there's no wait. Is there racism? Oh, well, maybe a little bit. Uh, no, just uh. When they first get in, uh, you, you you realize that there's someone there that is not on his spot or in, in his place, and it, it takes takes a while to uh, get to the entrance where they all arrive. It's a little little thing to keep in mind. That's why I mention it. Hmm. Hmm. So we'll pop over to Cyril first, who's actually crossing over with Deirdre. Um. There's, uh, we both had our mornings interrupted because you keep requesting the Bureau of Standards Data Center to look for Cassian Andor. 
who've claimed he was a missing fuel specialist, an unresponsive engineer, energy engineer, a fuel purity field officer suspected of forging imperial reports. You've been here for less than a month and you've filed five false inquiries. Mm -hmm. And he says six, actually. And she says, I wasn't <laughs> counting this morning. What are you doing, Mr. Khan? Uh, yeah, and he says uh, Andor is a murderer and a threat to the Empire. And she says, yeah. uh, what isn't in Blevin's report that I need to know? And he says, I have no idea. I wasn't allowed to see the report. And she says, you signed it. He says, I was given no choice. Which is super interesting. Basically, yeah. Blevin's control over this sector was just done in the most simplistic and fastest way possible. Didn't even let the people who were part of the event comment on it. And uh, I imagine part of that was because heads needed to roll, right? He doesn't want him making waves. He'll just report it as it was all his fault. He made loads of mistakes, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so what's cool here is the Deirdre's like, Huh. Okay, give him the file. Yeah, uh, let him read it. He might actually have information that's useful that's not in the file. Mm -hmm. Smart. Very She's smart. To... She, she'll take that lead. She'll follow up on it. Um, and I quite, I, I do enjoy the actress. They cast her really well. She's got uh, what I would describe as sharp features for the role she's playing of. Yeah, she's got a very ruthless, distinct sort of look. Ruthless very... son of a bitch sort of thing. Um, yes. Uh, she, I, I enjoy her cranking the intimidation when she's speaking to Cyril because she believes he's like an idiot with no leads. Um, and she keeps like trying to, like, provide enough of an intimidation that it forces him to be honest about exactly what he has to offer. Um, and yeah, the uh, the report it doesn't have many of the details. Cyril thinks actually adds a lot of weight to the event, and um. He says, all right, stop filing requests and I'll inform the Bureau of your efforts and assistance to the Empire. And before she can leave, he's like, I was very good. I solved a double murder and found the killer in two days. I was overly ambitious, yes, but time was slipping away and the opportunity was real. Service to the Empire, you just said it. Can one ever be too aggressive in preserving order? Uh, gives you him, I guess. Uh... It was always the chance, because we, we talked about it, is that he could have been a character that is dissuaded from the Empire as a result of the events, but it looks like he's doubling down. Yeah. Looks like it, <clears throat> yeah. He wants the Empire to thrive. He wants everyone to... Well, behave, almost. <laughs> we have these rules, line, you better yeah. abide by them. Uh, that's that's and his belief, and he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's going for it. And he says, this is more important than the death of two corporate security guards. I could be valuable going forward. He says, raise the alarm one more time, and it's not going to be me you're speaking to. So, a uh, bit of a warning there. He's, uh, he's overreaching. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so she's in a meeting with the ISB, and she says the Starpath unit was stolen from Steergard. They didn't disclose its absence out of fear, and it makes it impossible to discover the time of theft. There are several examples of this taking place galaxy-wide. How interesting is that, considering the attitudes in episode one that we heard about from the, the lower levels of security, where they don't report their murders as, as they happened, they don't report this, that, and the other as they happened, because the record is much more important than the reality. Yep. And uh, it's now caused even more problems and exposed more almost corruption within the system. She needs information like that, and it's like, oh, we don't have it. It's like, why? It's like, because we didn't report it the way that it happened, because we didn't want you guys to know. We, we wanted, the official, we wanted to just, everything is fine, you know? Um, so yeah, it's just like, all over the place. It's kind of uh, neat, in terms of, it, it's believable. I could believe that's how everything is being run. Um, and she is told to drill down. Find the truth. That's what I've got for Deirdre for this episode, which pushes us over. Mon Mothma. She was having herself some parties that absolute loser rich person, gosh. Party loser. Serious business going on. Andor's in prison. How can you possibly party at a time like this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she's having a chat with the new friend and her husband. And uh, the husband wants a drink for everybody. And she says no. And he's like, ugh, Mon is working. And she says, well, there's loads to be done. And, uh... Um... So, uh, I think it's the friend that says something like, saving the Empire from the Emperor, are we? Like, and, and laughs. 
And uh, there's, there's like a casual comment about... Because the husband's named Perrin, I think. Like, do you remember him at 15? And he's like, oh, let's not. And he says, the Academy Firebrand, how things have changed. And he just looks depressed as hell, and he looks annoyed. And it's just this, like, the, the, they're adding what little details they can to try and imply, like, she saw him as probably a very different... He probably was a different person when he was much younger. Maybe even um, mm -hmm. more politically viable in terms of lining up with what she wanted. But at this point, like we've seen, he's mainly just chilling out, having fun. Doesn't really care about anything that's happening. Um, and then we get like uh, almost like a boilerplate political discussion. This uh, the kind of thing you could possibly hear fucking online these days. Let's, let's be honest. Is um, you have like Palpatine is frustrating, yes, but he's uh, is is he too easily provoked? Is he overreactive? And she says, understatement. Uh, and then someone else says, he says what he means, which I could totally believe people being a fan of Palpatine for. It's, uh, like, overtly honest, right? Mm -hmm. remember, remember his speeches in the fucking... Remember people he won't like, forget those. He won't let them forget them. No. Um, and they go, we're discussing legislation, not speeches. And it's like, what does he mean? What is public order? It's an awfully big box, isn't it? The Emperor's primary charge is to protect us, is it not? And that's what the P.O.R.D. legislation will do. And someone else says, well, how much protection is enough? Uh, they said, we know what too little looks like, which is super interesting. What does too little look like? They could be referring to all different kinds of eras, including the prequels, to be honest. Um, in fact, that's probably what they're aiming for, right? They would argue that the, maybe they're talking about the Jedi. Who knows? Um, they want more protection. Or say, Aldani? Uh, what do you... Oh, it could like be that as well. Yeah, I don't know how I how small a level or grander we're looking at, because I don't know if Eldani is big enough to have a sort of like a because uh, when they talk about the Palpatine's choices of um, raising or lowering security, the biggest one's probably his enactment of emergency powers, right? Unless they're not going that far back. I I'd like Maybe. to believe they want to incorporate a lot of this, especially with how many mentions of his name there are. And I mean, the, the timeline of how the Empire went from being more open to absolutely more closed would be from the prequels to the OT, right? That's like a fair yeah, of course. timeline to sort of judge it from. Um, but well, you're probably right. At the, end, at the beginning of A New Hope, right? That the, the Senate was dissolved by then. Yeah, because the Death Star was completed. Yeah, just so they dissolved the Senate. The it's like, yep, the Republic is done, basically. The remnants of the old Republic. Don't need it anymore. No, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I, I have a feeling that uh, part of that is they're going to possibly provide context with the seasons going on in this of like, it's getting more and more difficult to control everything. And so the Death Star provides that. Like, I, I would really hope that they can give us even more justification for creating and using the Death Star. Mm. Well, yeah, because by the time that we reach, because where we're at in Andor, there is not like a huge organized rebellion. But by the time of Rogue One and New Hope, they're yeah, organized. They got like a, resources. They got it's an army. And, it's and essentially armies. an army. Yeah, they yeah, attack exactly. on Scarif, don't they? They have a whole set of people. They have a whole, they have a whole, uh, yeah, like, um, fleet. But yeah, you have a line of, uh, if you're doing nothing wrong, what's there to fear? And Mon yeah. says, I fear your definition of wrong. Mm. Yep, that's about it. And uh, you got someone saying, these are dangerous times. And so it's dangerous times, are they not? And it's, do you feel under threat? And he says, here, yes, I'm at great risk of ingesting too much of this nourishing Chandrilin hospitality. <laughs> and then they all laugh. I thought that was such a great touch. They finally almost reach an, a substantive part of their conversation, and then they all just, like, chill, all laugh. And, back. Yeah, it's all fine. Don't worry about it. Whatever. Because that's as far as the conversation probably ever gets, is, uh, don't you think he's going a little too far? Don't you think that some people are getting punished where they shouldn't be? Ha ha ha, wine, wine, wine now. The mouth. Talking a little too much, too politics. Um, yeah, we find out that she was in an arranged marriage at 15, as is the custom of, uh, I guess, Shandrillans, which is what she is. Um, and of Explains course, why she's with such a great guy. Yeah, it's, it's, I, they keep giving us bits of information about her and her husband, which is not fun yeah. for her. Yeah. Um, so as for this sort of Bix POV back in uh, Phoenix, she's her contact for getting to Luthen Park. I think his name is. Uh, he's captured, and um, she is subsequently captured with information grabbed from him. 
And uh, I quite like, there's a moment where they announce that they want her, and she's there and she's like, oh shit. Uh, and the, the troopers start coming toward her, and um, I forget his name, you know his name, right, Fringy, the bigger guy? Uh, it's Brasso, I think. Brasso. Yeah, yeah he, he does a pretty good job of pretending as though he's accidentally yeah. gotten in their way. He's like, oh, whoops, ah, yeah. oh, gee. Oh, it's like, oh, oh, sorry, oh, gee, oh. I'm, I'm spinning here. <laughs> oh, gee, oh, gee, oh, God, oh, no. I'm so sorry, man, oh, gee, oh, yeah. Oh, whoops, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, but unfortunately... Uh, doesn't work, though. Yeah, Bix is captured. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that begins a real shitty time for Bix. Well, oh, what's, yeah. see, what's cool is we've had this buildup of Deirdre and who she is. Uh, she enters Bix's story as, like, fucking Palpatine, basically. She's, like, this really domineering and almost terrifying person. She's going to be her antagonist, so to speak. And it's just interesting to see that we saw her... Like, the, the first time we see Deirdre, she's just on her way to work, right? Like, she's she's just a person <laughs> yeah. who's trying to rise in the ranks. Her intro to... Um, the Bix is a person that's going to fucking ruin her life. Oh yeah, she is quite Very scary. Threatening. Because she, before they bring Bix in, she's like, "No, no, let the, let the, let Park Park was his name, right? No, let let him hear. I want her to see him." Yeah. And then as soon as she comes in, uh, she was like, "Oh, what are you doing? Get him out of here!" Like pretending like it wasn't supposed to be uh, like that. It's like, "Oh, you you bitch! <laughs> you know shit. exactly what you're doing." Um. Uh, so yeah, we see Vel. She's trying to hang out with um. Fuck, I'm trying to remember all the names. The 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 cold lady who kills people. From uh, the team, on Aldani. Oh, the Sinta. Sinta, yeah. Sinta. Sinta. Yeah. Sinta. She, um, I keep wanting to call her Vel. Yeah, she, uh, she she clearly wants to do fun things with her girlfriend style, but uh, Sinta yeah. is like. Hardcore on the mission. Um, she says she has a line where she says, "I'm a mirror, Val. You love me because I show you what you need to see." Mm. I was wondering if what she means by that is that um, Val, considering her values, would probably want to be someone who is like 100% motivated to do everything like Cinta is, but Val isn't. She's a little bit confused. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, swap over to the Luthen. Uh, doesn't she on. also say uh, a line uh, along the lines, uh, it's all the rebellion, we just get what's left over or something? Like in terms of like time to, uh, to spend with each other or have fun at all? I think was the implication. I don't recall the line exactly. You were along the lines. Basically, yeah. you've got a commitment to the cause and whatever is left to us that is available, that's what we take. Yeah, exactly. Above the rebellion. Um, so yeah, Luthen's getting a little bit worried and desperate because of Andor. He realizes he's a loose end that could really get him in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he actually uh, he goes to visit Saw Gerrera uh, in this episode, which is not necessarily something I really thought would happen, but it's kind of neat. It's cool to see Forrest Whitaker and his... Uh, this is going to benefit Rogue One intensely. So oh, Guerrero yeah, was like everyone always made fun of the fact it's like that guy seemed interesting. Pity he's fucking dead. <laughs> like, <you know. laughs> um, but yeah, it's like okay, so we could have him. I imagine he's going to become more prominent uh, by the time we hit like season three or whatever. He'll probably be in a lot. I can of believe it. that. To be honest with you, I hope so. Like I said, I really like him. Um, it's cool. Those two sit down as clearly two very careful, intelligent. Uh, leaders of rebel forces and the first thing he says is like so my friend the garrison at Aldani that was you and he's like I was about <laughs> to ask you the same thing and he's like you'd never tell me if it was you uh, somebody's sitting on some money and then he's like if it was you I'd hope you put it to good use and he's like would I be out here in the cold if I had just pinched a mil hundred million credits and he says that's exactly what you would yeah, do <laughs> that's what is what you would do which to be fair probably would be right you don't want to show yeah, off money don't want it and then he says, exactly. like, that's exactly what I would say if I were you. If you were trying to convince me it was you. It's working. And it's like, mm -hmm. let's just agree it was a masterpiece. Then he goes, well, now I'm sure it was you. <laughs> that's a fun interaction. I liked it. Yeah, I, like their little, I like their back and forth. Um, yeah, and so he tells him, you need to team up with uh, Krieger. And then he's like, I don't fucking know Krieger. I ain't doing that shit. Krieger's obviously just a new sort of 
Fist, and we don't really know much about them anyway. It's it's more so what they mean to these characters. Uh, yeah. And he's like, I'm not risking my people to join up with someone I don't trust. And he says, we've got to pull together. We need the Empire angry, coming down hard. Oppression breeds rebellion. He says, yep. neither of you can do this on your own, but together. And he says, Krieg is a separatist. My pay's a neo-republican, the Gorman Front, the Partisan Alliance, sectorists, human cultists, galaxy partitionists. They're lost. All of them lost. And he says, what are you, Luthan? I've never even known. And then Luthan says, I'm a coward. I'm a man who's terrified the Empire's power will grow beyond the point where I can do anything about it to stop it. I'm the man who says we'll die with nothing if we don't put aside our petty differences. He's, it's so cool how much uh, Luthan operates on his, his knowledge of the meta. Mm -hmm. It's uh, less to do with running on principle, more to do with uh, seeing what he says will have what result and where he should move different people in different words and different places and stuff. Because, uh, again, all of those different groups that are mentioned, Separatists is just one of one of the ones that's thrown in. Um, it makes you wonder sometimes, because they did it in the in the Battlefront game, but it's just like, could you imagine just a little a little group that's headed by one guy who has, like, an army of droids? It's like a small one or something. Yeah. That'd be neat. I would, um, it would have been a really nice detail if we saw, you know, all the, the blasters that the battle droids had. Man, you think the market would be flooded oh, with yeah. those things. You'd be finding those things. They'd be like AKs. You'd just find them all over the galaxy. Right, yeah. I wish we saw them constantly popping up. It would have been a great <clears throat> in-universe sort of reminder of the Clone Wars. This massive explosion of arms on the market, lowering the prices and all this, you know, cheap firepower getting out there. It just would have been cool to have, like, one of the, the bug people from Geonosia, or uh, Geonosis, sorry. The, the, and, and it could be, the implication being he's just, like, um one of the sons of one of the leaders or something, and he's got, like, two super battle droids as guards. Something like that, I'd just be like, oh, that's neat. You're, you're keeping everything up to date while also adding in a bunch of new stuff. Because it's like the, this is the transitionary period from the prequels to the OT, and you have that in the, you see clone armor turn up here and there, the technology can match, there's lots of remnants of um, the efforts and actions taken by events prior, and it's just, it's just cool to show an effort to mix the eras a bit more. Um, but that takes us to episode nine. 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 I thought to realize, like, holy shit, we've not got that many left. Nine, True. 10, Eleven, twelve. Um, That's oh. counting, bro. I know. Thank you. I've been working on that. Um. So we get. Uh, I think we can start with Deirdre, Deirdre, and and Bix. Uh, Deirdre's going full on torture mode. She says, um, "You cast a wide net." You, uh, the, the approach with um, the Empire is to assume everything is a fish. I take a more nuanced view. I will tell you everything I know of this case and presume you will assist us. Hark was brought in after being tracked through his radio. He was remarkably resistant, which only encourages further probing. When we learned hardly what seemed... Like, what we learned was hardly worth what he went through to keep it from us. And she says uh, he attended a separatist meeting in which he became the Ferex liaison and was provided the radio. It would seem uh, the interest in his connection was in generating an outpost to acquire stolen Imperial equipment. You're in my net. Are you a fish or a, f a thief? Which, basically her whole speech is, we're going to fucking find out the truth. What he stopped us from getting wasn't even that like amazing in terms of information. Um, you're our next lead. Give me what I want. Or, uh, gonna end real fucking badly for you yeah and, give uh, it to me or we'll take it from you either way and bix says uh, you seem to enjoy this and she's just like you're going to tell me everything and uh the the reason that they know that she knows shit is because parker's already told them and yeah. uh, part of what i really love about this conversation is she says like tell me stuff and she's like i don't know anything she says you uh you know the buyer we know that from park and then she's like okay but i don't know him and then she's like you've had six meetings She's like, okay, but I've never seen him. He comes, he buys, and that's that's it. I don't, I don't, I don't we don't have any interactions. And then uh, Deirdre says six face to face meetings. <laughs> like she deliberately held pieces of information back to wait for Bix to lie first. Just like a really good make her doubt about lying in the future. Yeah, yeah it's the kind of thing that just it makes you want to stop trying to lie because it's not working. Um, and it's just establishing to the two of them in that conversation, you're a fucking liar. Like, we we now have proof that you're doing it. 
Um, yeah, and she says, when did you last speak to Cassian? Because they believe that if they catch Cassian, that leads them directly to Luthen. Which, to be yeah, fair, he's... is why Luthen wants Cassian as well. Worried about that. Mm -hmm. um, and she says, the very worst thing you can do right now is bore me. Mm -hmm. And uh, she says, you're not going to believe me anyway. Says, eh, I suppose not. And then leaves. And, um... Well... That, that was already intimidating enough, but we get, uh, we get this Dr. Gorst, I think his name is. Gorst. <laughs> and it's kind of funny, right? We, we've come across this in so many stories, the, the torturer scene. It's like, how did you guys handle it then? What did you guys come up with? And he basically just starts talking to her, and he says, don't fear the restraints, they're there to help you. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, that's a good fucking start. And he says, um, <laughs> Dizonites were killed as a result of refusing Imperial settlement, and the missions were recorded for the sake of proof. The recordings had an incredible effect on the officers viewing the event. They basically went insane. Um, yep. And he said, like, they've got multiple tracks, and the sounds of these these creatures dying, it can, like, do serious damage to a mental state of a person. And uh, he said, we've isolated what we believe to be the children's sounds, and those have a very specific effect. Doesn't take long, but it won't feel that way to you. Um... That's really quick, and I was already just like, what an idea for, mm. uh, for a, a, an aspect of torture in sci-fi. What an evil bastard. Yeah, what a sick well, son of a bitch. Well, the fact that he's so nonchalant about it as well, just talking about it like, yeah, aren't these little fun facts? No, not yeah. at all. And, well, I mean, um, if, you, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's, it's all about the strength of the dialogue, right? Because then he says... Uh, let me know when you're willing to cooperate. Just shake your head if you're finding it hard to speak. Yeah, I was like, Jesus. Stuff like that. It's like, oh, you know what you're doing. Well done. <laughs> Good writing. Excellent job. It's the line about that, the line about the restraints, and then just how they've acquired this, this torture device that is obviously so new that it may not have uh, been given like the, the, the unethical stamp yet. I think they said like this is brand new technology that he's trying out, and it's like, yeah, because... Mm -hmm. I think that if this went through every fucking ethical board, it would have been denied. Um, and yeah, uh, credit to the actress. When they hit play, she like gives off a scream that's just like, oh shit. Mm -hmm. And it like happens the build up quickly. to the scream as well. It's just great. Um, yeah, and it looks like it's just got the power to pretty much break anybody. And of course, you've got to be careful with introducing a torture device like that, because that's, you know, there have been characters that were tortured in the future unsuccessfully, so. One of the ones that people reference would be Leia, right? When she tortured in a yeah. group, so. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the future of this, this approach would be, but it, it seems to have an effect that could uh, not be exactly what you require in terms of destroying the fucking victim. Um, but I suppose we'll see yeah, more of that at a later time. Um, yeah, and she says you got to keep her here and keep her alive. She's the only one that may recognize Axis, which is what they're calling what they. It's kind of what they're calling Luthen at this point because they don't know more about it. Yeah, because they don't have a name, so they just branded him Axis and it's, or named him Axis. It's done so casually, <laughs> but she just says. Uh, uh, I'd like to hang Park, show them who's in charge, and some other guy just goes, as you wish. It's like, man, he's just dead then. Like, it's as yeah. simple as that, that casual decision. They don't even show it to us, they just say it, and I, I believe it's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's gonna have effects, too. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, they say that the investigation was thorough, but they have no ID on Axis, which... Kind of makes sense. She's obviously seen his face, but she can't do much more for them, you know, in terms of information. Uh, she said that Axis runs a disciplined operation. We have a list on all of the gear coming through Ferex. He left and came back with money. Uh, he had a beard and shaved. Uh, sorry, in reference to... Um, they're trying to make connections now with, with the piece of information they would have gotten off Bix about Luthen. Uh, they know him as Axis, and combine it with the information they had from the Aldani thing, and uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to pin Aldani as a part of it, and I think uh, uh, Partagaz is like, that's a bit of a stretch, isn't it? That 
you know, this this new and big thing that happened that also has something to do with this other investigation we've had running this whole time. And uh, that's when her, um, her friend sort of comes in and helps. He's like, the man who did the job on Aldani was shaved and uh, uh, thing he had a beard, but he did shave uh, when he came back. So it's like, that's enough to sort of seem like there actually might be a connection and he says to look into it. Mm -hmm. um, but you may be asking, why aren't they torturing um, uh, Marva? And they actually do cover that. They say that she's way too old and frail. If they did any kind of serious torture on her, it would probably kill her. And so they'd rather use her as bait. Mm -hmm. so they're going to have men on her, uh, keeping an eye on her for a while, just in case Andor comes back to visit. Which, to me, feels like a pretty, again, smart That's thing. That's probably what I'd do, yeah. If I if she was uh, you know that kind of a lead, it's, yeah, just we'll lay the, it's a trap, essentially. If you know, there's a really, you know, real possibility, I'll come back. Take advantage of it. Um, but then something happens, and it almost feels like a like a quest event in a video game or something. Like it's just this thing has happened. So they've captured a the 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 ISB have captured a Red Bull pilot at a customs check. They uh, it happened to be like a run of the mill check, but it's eventually became something where they actually discovered he was he was a rebel guy and. Uh, through Dr. Gorse's torture, they've already discovered that um, he's a part of a plan to attack Spellhouse, led by Anton Krieger. So this is the guy who was mentioned earlier by Luthen, who uh, this guy's a part of. And they say, if we keep the ship, as much as we have this information, it's going to become completely obvious that he was captured and then that, that plan will not go ahead. So they suggest destroying it. And it's like, well... Doesn't that still kind of raise suspicion? It's like if this ship was destroyed, then it's going to feel like something may have happened. And she says, what if we sort of fuck with it to the point where the pilot died of like causes to do with like lack of oxygen or whatever and just let it float out so that they can find it. It can be detected like fully confirmed as an accident. And so the plan will likely go ahead. And uh, that's all like sort of sorted out as a back and forth between several characters in the ISP trying to come up with a good idea to keep the information they have while also coming across as though they didn't actually get that information at all. Kind of neat. Mm. It is. It really is neat. And um, there'll be more for that over the next couple of episodes. And it happens like on both sides. a little ongoing story. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, that, 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 that's the, the ISB portion of that episode. Good um, stuff. I enjoy that those bits a lot. It's, it's fun. Like, that you can... A scene starts up and it's the ISB sort of discussiony chambery thing, and I'm like, yeah, I'm like excited to see what they got. I'm just like, yeah, let's do it. It, it. it kind of reminds me because I've I've been going for Star Trek with Jay, right? And uh, uh -huh. we we when, when there's stuff like on the bridge that's happening and everyone is just doing their job and is competent at it and doesn't do anything stupid. Uh, it reminds me of this because everyone has like their job and they're doing it. And they're being competent about it. They get shit done. It's just, just good stuff. It's just good stuff. So over to Mon Mothma. Uh, P.O.R.D. of course is in action, and it's had effects on even the prison that we came across. Um, she says P.O.R.D. is the next step towards an unchallengeable authority. I stand here to speak with open minds. Those of you still believe that when we speak here, we are in a temple, and uh, I think she even get she gets booed. Yeah, there's it, some. It's boom. kind of a there it's some mixed people who are yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of mixed. There's there's plenty who are you know for it and they're not friendly to the empire, and there's some that are just really apathetic. There there's a mix. Yeah. Uh, your daughter shows her the dress she's got, and she's like, "Your father gonna let you wear that?" And then she's like, "He lets me do what I want." Like, oh man. Every every moment they get to spend on screen together, it's usually just like, this is it this is it healthy? This is a good. No, it really isn't. Um, and yeah, uh, she just talks to. So, so yeah, it turns out I guess this is a sort of reveal. Vel from the operation on Aldani is actually uh, on Mothma's cousin. They yeah, are a part of the same big old family, and it's like, oh, Schnizzle, and uh, Mothma clan. They sort of keep each other motivated. I think is. Part of the idea, but yeah, Mon Mothma's losing her, losing her edge a little bit. And she even tells Val, can you please be a spoiled rich girl for a while? Remind people that's who you are. 
which is kind of an interesting thing, right? It's kind of the Bruce Wayne Batman thing of like, yeah, you need mm -hmm. to do more shit publicly where you're not, you know, weird things. Yeah, disappeared and stuff, yeah. Um, and she said, we've chosen a side, we're fighting against the dark, we're making something of our lives. I'm going to encourage you to keep at it. And so, uh, yeah, that friend that she's looking to have some help with her accounts for, he says, um, essentially, like, her accounts are very traceable. And he said, we need them concrete. We need cash deposits to cover up, like, donations that don't have obvious sort of, uh, like, obviously she's given money to help the rebellions, but it's like, where exactly? The equivalent of, like, Imperial IRS are eventually going to catch up with it. He says, yeah, she um, has to be really careful that stuff doesn't get tracked and... You know, they they show some level of effort that this is a difficult thing to do. And he says, we're basically going to need help from someone who's going to be able to give us a loan that uh, we can then deposit back and sort of have the money accounted for. So they need to rely on the help of Davo Skulden. He says he's not a banker, he's a thug. And he says the wealthiest thug. <laughs> um, Which I and, liked. I was like, oh, yeah, and, yeah. And, and she says he's going to know something is wrong if, if we want a 400,000 loan off him. And then uh, he says he'll assume you want what's yours. Like, basically, he won't ask questions much beyond it. He's just, like, it's, it's, it's plenty of people want money for all kinds of reasons. It doesn't have to be rebellion or anything. Um, so, yeah, uh, we can move over to Mr. Cyril, see how he's, uh, he's up to this episode. He's, uh, he's having a bit, of, a bit of a chat with his mum again, as goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, you've been searching my room again. And she says, it's called cleaning. And he's like, you searched my box. I guess he has, like, one box that's private. <laughs> <laughs> um, Everyone has a private box. Yes. Um, and she says, I found you a job. I press your uniforms. I prepare your meals. I move mountains to scrape you off the floor. And what do I reap? And uh, she has, like, that whole response, and then he just goes, I was talking about how you were spying on me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Such a real sort of, like, reaction. And she, sh she says, a shadow of a son, a tenant, a stranger. And uh, when she finishes that, he just lifts up his cereal and loudly sips. <laughs> 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 just funny. Um, and then he says, I've been promoted. And she just goes, I knew they'd recognize your promise. Like, <laughs> after saying he's so shit. Like I said, I enjoy their conversations. I think that's it for them now, but it's still... You wonder if it's just like, you know, does she really, you know, deep down, she really does want him to do well and be successful or something, but all the while, there's this, that they just have their personalities clash. Yeah. Um... And so, yeah, uh, uh, Deirdre's heading out of the building, and he cuts her off, and he's like, I want to thank you for my promotion. And then she says, I gave you a clean bill of health, it, it, the equivalent, like, uh, sort of bureaucratically. Um, and she says, have you been waiting for me? And he just says, yes, I'm not going to lie to you. And she says, are you stalking <laughs> me? And he says, I come sometimes to see if I could see you. I thought I had ruined my life, but after meeting you, being in your presence, I realized life is worth living. Which, by the way, really not a good thing to say if you don't want to come across as stalkerish as hell. No, no. Kind of, um, uh, please, uh, this is, go away. This is his, uh, established level of charisma, so, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, he says, uh, I want what you want. And she says, you're out of your mind, try this again, and I'll have you in a cage on the outer rib. Like, ooh. <laughs> Which, um, I would say takes us to the main old plot line for closing out episode 9, which is Cassian's. So, uh, one of the first things we see is uh, Olaf, one of the team members. His um, his fingers are not helping him out. They're uh, no, they're really slow. struggling. He's having a bad time. But Andor's jumping in to help him out. Yeah, well, I, I quite like the one of the team members says, "Come on, old timer," and then one of them corrects him and says, "Short timer," as if to say, you know, rem remember he's he's on his way out. He's nearly served his time. Um, yeah. Then. Uh, uh, Andy Six is like, what do you owe, Olaf? Uh, and they check it. I think, how many shifts has he got? Something like 40 or something? Uh, yeah, it's like, 41? it's real close. I think yeah. it's 41. And, uh... Almost there. I think, um, when they realize that, it, 
But you know, like the the guy who killed himself. Sorry, uh, the one that zapped himself the previous night. Um, Andor looks at Andy Serkis and says, "So, uh, new man for them today, right? It's always the next day, right?" And it's it's so great because mm. the, the the way this show does it is that they're telling you something, but they're not making it obvious. So Andy like fucking glares at him, or his name is Kino in this. And it's like, yeah. why? Why is he doing that? And it's like, because he knows why Cassian's asking that question. He's trying to learn about the system. It's, uh, it's, and, and of course, Kino is like, no, just do what you're fucking told. You don't need to know how many men may be on this floor. You don't need to know the specifics of when people come in and out. Just do your fucking job. It's like, because uh, again, he's been molded by this system to make sure everyone else is following the rules. What's part of what's so clever about it is that like it, it's limiting any and all work the Empire have to do. Exactly. And he's close, relatively. He doesn't want to screw it up at this point. Yeah, Kino's got 217 days, something like yeah, that. Yeah, 200 seven. something. Under, yeah, just about under a year. Um, and something they discover is that the elevator that brings in new people uh, and anything that moves is likely not friable. Um, just by paying attention to how everything is uh, working. And of course, uh, the elevator, as it's coming down, can act, at least at the halfway point, as a way to step up to the higher level. Um, and we see Andor is slowly trying to sort of uh, saw at a pipe in the bathroom. Yeah. I'm doing that the whole time because it's pretty thick. Um, and then uh, later scene, we see that there's a conversation being had by everybody, and they establish something. I can't quite remember what the information is, but uh, Olaf asks, like, a, he has like a, a, a Rags Biden moment, basically. <laughs> uh, he, something is established, and then he asks for that information. They're all like, wait, what? Yeah, he's... Uh, Except when I do it, it's just a test to make sure that you guys are still... Of course. You know, oh, on track, course. and, you know, I, 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 you know, it's a good thing to do for people. Yeah, Olaf's having a lot of trouble. Um, looking like he's absolutely losing it at this point. Um, and yeah, just, just as more examples, uh, Melchi says, they could keep us here forever if they wanted. And every time he says something like that, Andy Serkis is like, shut the fuck up! Stop shut saying that! So this is the thing. Um, Definitely nothing he wants to hear. He's just like, no, 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 I'm getting out of here. I've been working very hard. But then something happens on level yeah, two. On level, level two. two. It's like, oh, it's and, going uh, on there. They start speculating and panicking and stuff until there's enough pressure that uh, Keto is just like, you haven't got a clue what they're saying. You're panicking about something on the other side of the building and it takes days for any messages to reach us. Is your mind melted or something? Like, he's just absolutely pissed off at them for even coming close to suggesting that anything is out of order. Yeah, I love the way that it's all conveyed, though, where they're standing in their line and they're just looking across and it's like sign language from different levels. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, yeah, I don't know. There's like some commotion up there. And then and then um, I think because uh, like the power goes out and it comes back on like five seconds later. It's like um, something's huh. not right here. And, and then there's the, the one guy who's like, you know, like so uh, uh, like there's probably just, you know, some whatever going up up top. And it's like so they cut the power. And then um, Andy Circus. I like we just keep, keep calling him Andy Circus. It's Ki it's uh, Kino. Uh, Kino Loy. Loy, yeah. And he's like, well, "What do you think is happening?" Which is like, that's the answer, right? What do you think is happening up there? And then it's straight away, it's like, "No, there's something wrong on two. And and it's it's going so fast that they can't even decipher the information. And it's coming yeah. around on the other side as well. Like something happened on level two, but like nobody knows what it is. But it just doesn't seem good. It all just seems really it's just, off. It's just creepy. It's a really There's a creepy element to it. Speed. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah like, it, the, it the is, power goes out and the lights come back on. And like later you find out what story. happened. Oh, yeah. Well, this, yeah as you said, this dystopian. feels like it could be its own thing. Like this whole environment. It feels like a whole story is happening yeah, here. Yeah, finding the truth yeah. of this like, weird facility, you know. The overall tone of that scene is just that the lights go off and on. That alone is just like, that's something's going on and i feel like we, the answer is going to be very concerning yeah um but you're in you're as much in the dark as the uh as the the prisoners are you don't get any extra information you're right there with them um he asks kino how many guards are on each level and he says you want out alive turn that part of your brain off and uh he says why do you think they care what we're talking about do you think they're listening do you think they they, they don't need to care 
as long as the numbers are rolling, as long as we're cheaper than droids and that we're easier to replace. Which, um, yeah. I mean, they're literally slave labor, so... Yeah, yeah they probably cheaper. are cheaper than, than droids, yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, as prisoners particularly, you know, you get work out of them, you know? But yeah, uh, they, they eventually discover more implications of what news may have happened, and, uh... You, you even get to the point where they're all panicking so much that uh, Kino punches Melchi, um, trying to get him to shut up. And uh, yeah, uh, we get to the point where they, they're working hard again, and they find out that uh, you know it's end of shift, someone's getting zapped sort of thing, and they all need to uh, stand straight sort of thing on program. And uh, it fucking sucks, but Olaf has a stroke in the middle of it. Yep. Well, yeah, and, and the other prisoners are trying to like hide him and hold him up, keep him upright. Yep. to protect him, but he's he's collapsed and he can't do it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and the, uh, so they're, they're heading home, and of course he, he can barely, they're just trying to carry him until they just they can't anymore, and uh, uh, Kino comes in. He's like, come on, you've only got a few shift left, so you're going home. Uh, and uh, the doctor comes in, and he's like, he's, he's only got 40 shifts, he's, uh, he's tough as an old rock, and those lines, to me, I was just like, man, it feels a lot yeah. like he's talking about himself uh, while looking at Olaf, like, trying to keep himself thinking about, like, how I'm, this is me, like, soon enough, I'll be, I'll be close enough, I gotta, we gotta, gotta keep everything going, keep everything, we, we, the, the, there's that goal, there's that light at the end of the tunnel, it's all gonna work out, alright? So, for the more men that get out under his, sort of, control, the more, it, like, makes him feel like his eventual end of getting out of here is, is to be realized, sort of thing. Um, and yeah, when the doctor comes in and he says, <laughs> uh, can you hear me, brother? Like, to the to Olaf, and, and Andor says, uh, his name is Olaf, and he says, I don't want to know his name. And it's Oof. like, oh shit. Because, like, the, the whole aspect with that is, I do not want to get to know any of these people. Like, uh, Yeah, personal with everyone, yeah. Um... Yeah, and he says he can't save him. Uh, and, and then he says, what are you doing? He says, I can't save him. I can't save any of us. It's like, oh, jeez, what is yeah. this Duma doctor we brought in? Like, what? Almost yeah. like, I'm not really a doctor so much as the... Um, I'm the guy with know. the syringes in his yeah, little pocket. And, uh, I, don't, I don't even know what to call it. He's like the guy who just puts people down. It almost I comes know, across yeah. as though he's it's, uh... a prisoner that got made into the... Quote unquote oh yeah, that's right. I mean, he is yeah. a prisoner. Yeah, he, he is, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, and he says, uh, you know, they ask him, "What does he mean by what he's saying?" He says, "Soon enough, you'll wish you had what he's having." And uh, yeah, he says, yeah. Uh, "A man was released on four and ended up back on two. It got out, and they killed everybody on two. So it was like a hundred prisoners. The yeah, assumption like, would be." Oh. That the way it's supposed to work is that when you complete your sentence, you go out and you get delivered to a different, probably place, or they just Shop execute them around. You. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, um, if, if, yeah. I mean, when when they when they flew in, you see there was multiple facilities pretty close to each other. I think. And so yeah, they obviously there was a misallocation, and he got cycled back into one of these places, which these places are built on the knowledge that you will get out eventually. And so he would have been like, "Holy shit! I just came." From completing my sentence and they've put me back in and that spread like wildfire throughout the whole level and so they just killed everybody there getting out yeah they killed everybody um, um yeah and the episode ends with andor saying how many guards on each level and kino answers it this time never more than yep. 12 and more than 12 it's 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 over in terms of him even trying to like it's it's done um if there's no hope of getting out they're gonna escape. They're gonna try. Yep. Yeah, Kino is is, is a character though. It's uh, all of his actions and decisions were based on an eventual freedom. He's just found out it's a yeah. lie. So mm -hmm. and so, of course, he's gonna yeah, he's gonna help him. Uh, oh yeah, and that, I guess that that rounds out episode nine. Wait. It's just. It feels like, weird because, like, it's, it's just—it's almost like you're watching a completely different show for a little bit. The prisons portion, of yeah, the prison, the prison thing is yeah. like really cool. I find it very interesting, and the yeah. fact that it really constructed deliberately to be like a 
a sort of microcosm of the broader world. Uh, it's it's really interesting subplot, and of course, having Andy Circus, that's real nice, ain't it? Getting it's to this, act, yeah. and try a character. In Star Circus. Wars, that another, a lot of things, but like in Star Wars, he was robbed of that opportunity. Snoke is a character. Got... He's a goofy, goofy goofball. Yeah. Who is like the center of? I think that Snoke is the personification of the sequels. He's this absolute bullshit clown character that implies a lot more than he actually is, and just dies. That's that's, that's the summary of the sequels, pretty much. Um, and yeah, and he does a great job with what he's given as as Snoke, but it's uh, you know you, you still get nothing of what the powerhouse that is Andy Serkis is, and you get a lot more of it with this one, especially in this episode, which we're gonna talk all. In fact, I think the majority of this episode is more so the prison side of things than yeah, it's not. Yeah. But something happens on Luthen's end, which is super good stuff. So, Oh, it's that thing. Ooh. It is that thing. But yeah, we'll start with Cassian, Mr. Andor. Uh, Andor. Um, actually, no, we'll start with Fenix, because this is a quick thing. Uh, we've, uh, As we know now, there's a couple of people who are very shiftly keeping an eye on Marva because they believe that Cass will visit her at some point, and that can be used to capture. Um, the whole town are a bit more aware of things than the Empire even realizes, but the one thing we find out is that the Doctor is being brought in several times to Marva, and we mm -hmm. catch a line of dialogue saying that um, he's refusing to take her medication. Uh, and I think that'll be interesting to talk about as, as we develop. However, over mm -hmm. to Cass. He's trying his best to convince Kino Loy of what to do next. He says, they're afraid. And he's like, afraid of what? They killed a hundred men to keep them quiet. What do you call that? And he says, that's power. And he says, power doesn't panic. Which, uh, it is interesting, because... <laughs> You know, you'd think of if a hundred men found out about the truth on a on a level, is the correct decision to kill them all, or is the correct decision something else? I guess the worry is that, especially with those waiting areas, that the word can go further than just one level. And yeah. If everyone doesn't believe in it, everyone stops working. Yeah, it could... Because uh, you'll eventually just turn it back into regular slavery. You'll just be like, all right, fine, you know the truth. Work or die. <laughs> you'll be like, oh, yeah. shit. Oh, uh, okay. But, um... Obviously, the system they have going right now is much more efficient, so that's probably why they they that way. But yeah, um, then Andor says another thing that again just characterizes him as a smart boy. He says they can't be surprised again. They need to, uh, they need what we're making here. Tomorrow will be the lowest the gods will ever be because it's only going to increase from now on after that. So this is our chance, basically. Um, and he says you don't even have a plan. And he says uh, when they replace Ulaf. That's 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 when we enact the plan. Because I'd rather die trying to take them down than die giving them what they want. So that, that's pretty good for motivation, you know? Because, like, the alternative is you just work till you die and you give them shit tons of resources that they wanted anyway. Mm-hmm. Obviously a line that can expand pretty hardcore into other systems of goobament. They, they were sort of thing. Um... So, uh, they head back to the cells, and everyone's kind of panicking about the reality, like, Olaf is dead, and Andor's not doing a very good job of explaining exactly what's going on. And, uh, uh, Kino's just panicking until he manages to sort of settle up a bit and gives him a bit of a speech. Uh, he shouts out, no one is getting out. Uh, man, just the fucking face he has on when he says it. I don't yeah. know if you guys remember it, but, um... <clears throat> it's... That's so it's a great. It's not performance. having a great day. Not having a great day, and he sells it. This is oh, this yeah. is the kind of thing that makes actors, as far as I'm concerned, is like you know that he would have read the script. He understands the role he's playing, and he has to come across as though his whole life has just been upended. He's having an existential crisis, and he has to gain the passion to uh yeah to encourage himself and his, all the other men to basically kill themselves in the hopes that they don't get killed. This is this is an incredibly difficult portion of his life, and having an actor to be able to portray that is what makes this believable. Man is uh, is having trouble. It's um, it's pretty much all of this is killing him, but he's got to lead them because that's that's kind of his role. Uh, the the one thing I'll say about this, uh, I th there's a couple of things I think worth trying to highlight. It might be for you guys. Uh, I'll try where I can mm. as well, but. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everything that happens here is reliant on the fact that there's no audio surveillance or video surveillance of any kind. And as much yes. as the system is built with that in mind, that they don't need it, that's not usually reason enough to not have it. 
No. It's um, I would count it as lucky they don't have it because obviously everything would have fallen apart if there were surveillance of any kind. And does it hurt to have surveillance? It's just it does. It surprises me the Empire wouldn't have at least a couple cameras. You know, this shit is that's some low tech. Yeah, stuff. the audio stuff I can sorta of buy. The video though, that's the big one. It's um, the kind of justification I could expect. Let's say there was audio and video surveillance. What Andor could argue is like, yeah, of course there is for everything. They're not listening to it, though. It's not like they've got people scrolling through every last conversation that happens here. And if someone said like, oh, you know, you can knock out the, the idea of an AI filtering through for keywords, but even then you can just speak normally while giving off blah, blah, blah. But, you know, that's something I guess I could find somewhat believable. But even then, they'd probably keep an eye on people after the event of the 4-2 thing to see what people are discussing. See if and unrest. if... I mean, if the way around it would be to just have them speak quietly and show discretion. Yeah, I, I actually yeah. think I would almost enjoy it more if they were like, listen, everybody, just behave as usual. And uh, and everyone speaks a little bit more in code, but not not like exclusively. You don't necessarily need to. It's just that um, I'd find it more satisfying in terms of how this plan is run and completed if they actually subverted surveillance as well, which is more than possible. I've watched a lot of... Uh, prison break type shows they do they do all kinds of cool cool and crazy plans in fact have any of you guys seen prison break the show no i have not no i, I, think I, might seen a couple of episodes. I would not mind watching season one again sometime because i remember enjoying the fuck out of the uh out of that season but i can't remember if it's bullshit or not that always seemed to me like one of those shows that had a high concept that could get you a season but the more you tried to drag it on the more absurd it would get yeah there's a lot do of shows it. like that Season two is all about what they do next. It's not like they break out of a prison. It's just that they each of them have to survive now that they've all, you know, they've got the police chasing and stuff. And then you find out there's more going on than just what they did and stuff. Season three, they all end up back in a prison. They have to break out. And it's like, oh. <laughs> of course. That's a bit silly. They got a prison break again. I remember season four gets really fucking weird in terms of it's like a completely different show that's desperately trying to stay alive because of its IP. <laughs> Yeah, that could be an interesting sort of case study. Anyway, they seem to have engaged. They're going to be doing a plan. They're going to have to wait until the person's replaced, and then they're going to be doing things. Um, I, I I suppose I'm not sure how to do this. I guess we should explain it piece by piece, and then people can come in with anything they want to talk about. But the mm -hmm. plan amounts to Andal's going to break a water pipe in the bathroom so it spreads water across the whole floor. Uh, the intention there is that when they activate the fry of the floors, it'll short circuit and basically destroy the system and it won't be friable anymore um that i think isn't based on anything they know they're just guessing that that's how it works um obviously it could have been that that's not how it works it could have been that it just turns on and off and that the water if you're standing on it will make it so that it's a bigger shock i guess i don't know yeah i assume that it would short out things and they wouldn't work yeah it's, so um, that's this is the thing. I I think I would have maybe preferred it being based on more solid knowledge because it's it's kind of you don't know that's going to happen. It's a good guess, but it could be something else happens. You know, like and it mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily work that way. Um, or someone mentions it and they say, "Well, we got it's our best chance." Or it's our just, best all you need is the some it. guy is like, "Oh yeah, once someone uh, spilled a bunch of shit on the floor and it and it stopped actually being functioning as a as a short suit." You know. You know, just it's happened before in a small way, and it's like, ah, we can use that. That's the sort of way you usually build that sort of thing. Again, I have no problem with it. I just would have preferred it was based on something they knew as opposed to the whole plan centers on something we don't even know will necessarily work. We just kind of hope it does. Um, but it does work. And, uh, yeah, when someone is being brought down as a replacement, they... Uh, and or jams one side while the other side is like still trying to operate and so it like tilts the whole thing once someone stamps on it and uh, uh, that works as a sort of platform to be able to reach the higher up level and then um, that's pretty much it in terms of uh, at that point it's just overwhelm them yeah and uh, a lot of people much. die <clears throat> oh yeah it's not a great time no oh. um so, yeah, I, I guess what happens then is that they, you know, several characters we've met and understood this time they get killed, but several characters manage to get through it a lot, including Andor, of course. They move through the facility and get to the command center at level 7 or 8 or something, and uh, 
uh, basically power down all of the the floors and open up all the doors and tell everybody to get the fuck out basically yep um i think highlights for Andy me would... to give the big speech yeah the speech is very cool yeah it, it, Kino Loy being the uh, the guy who guided them through being subservient is now the guy who's encouraging them desperately to fight back, to rebel, to get out, to yeah. and not only that, but One to help out. each other. Exactly. Yeah, if you <laughs> see someone like falling down and needs help, pick him up. Pick him up. Work together. Yeah, he says start climbing. They don't have enough guards and they know it. If we wait until they figure that out, it'll be too late. We'll never have a better chance than this. And I would rather die it's trying to take way, them down than giving them what they want, which is Handel's obviously quote. a broader statement about the the whole uh, conflict. Oh, absolutely, the empire yeah. doesn't have the power at that point to govern the whole. Like, if everybody decided, if everybody who felt that they hated the empire decided, like, no, enough of this, they'd win. It's kind of um, <clears throat> it's kind of the reason why they're building the Death Star, right? That's their ultimate contingency. Um, but until that happens there was an opportunity to actually stop the Empire if everybody were to realize that they had that power, that there aren't enough of them to stop them. Yeah, and I think it's really awesome. But it, at least in the prison, yeah, it works super well. Uh, what Andor said to encourage him uh, to start fighting is what he uses as part of his speech. He put it in there. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, he says they fried 100 men on level 2. We know that. They're making up the sentences as they go along. We know that no one outside of here knows what's happening, and we know now... Uh, that when they say we're being released, we're being transferred to some of the prison to go and die, and that ends today. There's yep. only one way out right now. The building is ours. You need to run. You need to climb. You need to kill. You need to help each other. See someone who's confused, someone who's lost. Get them moving and keep them moving until we get this place behind us. There are 5,000 of us. If we can fight half as hard as we've been working, we'll be home in no time. So yeah. it's, a, it's just a great speech for everybody to get ready to fucking go. And so... Um, and the performance, man, oof, real yeah, good. So, Especially so, how he changes, how it's not that great at first, eyes. and then he gets into it. Yeah, even even Cassie's is like, come on, man, you got to have more than that, and then uh, delivers yeah. more and more. Um, yeah, and so they get to the the big old exit, and uh, that's when the keto says, "I can't swim," which, uh, yeah. It's, I suppose, more of a possibility in that world than it is in ours, because you could have come from a planet that just doesn't have, you know, big sets of water, I guess, or much of it to the level of I mean, swimming. lots of people can't swim on Earth. Um, <laughs> like, lots of humans yeah. can't swim. Well, yeah, it's just a lot about likelihoods. It could be that uh, when you're on Earth, it's a little bit less likely, I think, when you the selection of people in prison is just someone can't swim, especially because you can just be like, is it is it easier or harder to float when you're, like, really fat? Uh, I think if you're fatter, you got more buoyancy, right? Probably easier, right? Easier, yeah. Yeah, okay. I think it's easier. Um, well, it's not like he's fat or anything, but like uh, the 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 part that I because I'm fine with him not being able to swim. I was I was less fine with like the whole Andor can help him, right? It could be like, okay, well, you can't stay here, so you got to drop with me, and I'll I'll stay with you and you know give you you can doggy paddle, right? Isn't that like the thing that anyone can do when when you, when you can't swim? Um. I think it's probably one of the most basic semi-natural things you could do if you're trying to not die in the water. So that that would be my automatic like thing. It's like you know you're gonna have to again can't stay here. So jump with me, and then we will uh, we will get you in a position where you can at least not drown. Because uh, yeah, you can like yeah, if you've got a couple people who are just helping them, you know, kind of lift them up, they can they can keep them up. Um, but of course, they just as the people who care about him realize he can't swim, they unfortunately get booped off and can't help him. And I was just like, lame. Yeah. But I'm hoping that the repercussion of that uncertain. is just going to be that we'll see him at another time. We're not going to see yeah. him now. I, yeah, I, I feel I like he's so, got enough I, drive I, to I say, hope. yeah, he, I, he, well, he dude, can I'm, say, like, help me. I'm at the point of being like, please make Kino Loy join the Rebel Alliance. Please, 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 please. Yeah. Please. That'd be really cool. Keep him around. Give Andy Circus. <laughs> give him. Give him more time. And uh, uh, then we get the vision. And then we have a really excellent shot of uh, the prison. The symbol, like from up top, looks like the Empire, but it's leaking. You got all of these. Uh, you've got oh, all shit, the prison. Shit! I didn't even make that connection. The, uh, You're right. Yeah. Yeah. All of the people swimming out. It's leaking. It's bleeding. Good shit. It's good shit. 
Well, that's the thing. When you've got great writing, it can service your cinematography like this really well. Well, um, I was reading, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but Bear McCreary released like a blog post on his inspirations and choices with the music in Ragnarok. And there is mm -hmm. this moment I was reading it and he says um, he wasn't 100% sure of what his plan was for, I can't remember if it was like Alfheim or whatever place. And he says, um, and so I did what I often do. And I, I went to the script. I went to the story to find inspiration. It's like, I knew it. <laughs> so I think that's, of course, that's how it works. Because you, you couldn't do it for Rings of Power. You were like, let's look at the script. What is this sludge? What am I supposed to do with this? I don't know what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're right. Writing is foundational. And it can inform and inspire so much beyond just the words on a page. Oh, yes. Um... So, let's have a look here. We got, that's, that, that's obviously Cass's part of that episode. We got Deirdre. Um, we find out the ship that they were talking about in the previous episode has been towed. And um, I think they say, like, they're going to stay away from the whole situation, just keep an eye on it. And funnily enough, there's a guy who's in the room and he says, well, no, we should inspect the ship as that is the least suspicious thing we could do. We should come across as interested in it, but leave it alone. And uh, I think even part of guys is like, yeah, good, good, good shout. And what's cool is the guy who suggested that is actually a mole. Oh my goodness. He's working for Lenny. none other than Luthen. Bum, bum, oh bum, yeah. Bum, bum, bum. Oh shit, here we go. We'll get to that in and a minute. And he's heading down. To... Oh, well, yeah. No. <laughs> right. right. We're going to knock you. out we're going to knock out Mon Mothma <laughs> first, which is she has a, a chat with that uh, thugman as she was called it. Oh yeah. And I yeah. quite like this conversation. Again, her performance is fucking top notch. She's so uh She's so harsh while being incredibly civil. Yeah. She fucking hates this guy, and he knows it too. Uh, and he, he opens with saying, one of the indulgences of great wealth is freedom from other people's opinions. And her response is, you've made your point. Like, it, it's so uh, rude, <laughs> basically. <laughs> He's just like casually having a chat, and she says that. And then he says, yeah, everyone says you're very direct. Um... <laughs> And she says, uh, yeah, he says, I can get you money pretty much invisibly. The money is yours. And, uh, you know, it shouldn't be something that tarnishes your reputation. Like, thumbs up, woohoo, yay, ha ha, la 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 la. And then she's like, okay, what's the fee? He's like, no fee. No fee. Charity, I, isn't it? And then she's like, I insist. And he says, I refuse. Well, yeah. It's like, if there's like no fee. next line a lot, though. Is what you want. Um, she says, I don't want to owe favors. He says, yeah. that might be the price. Yeah. Uh -huh. So cool, there's uh, the, the, the acknowledgement in the matter of uh, when I don't pay for something, that means I owe you. And he's like, yes, yeah, so that's what it'll cost. It, it almost feels like the words are folding back in on themselves in terms of following the conversation, but it all makes sense. We know what's being said here. And uh, she says, come on, what's the price? And he says, I want to come here again. He was like, yeah, that's fine. And he says, I'd like to bring my son. And she fucking like, she's looking like she just saw a ghost. She's like, you can't yeah. be serious. Yeah. She's already skipped to the part of what he's getting at immediately. It's just, it's, I like that shit so much. At first, much. I was like, wow, he must be a little bastard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he says, I'm just asking for an introduction. Our positions sometimes make decisions for us, don't they, Senator? I love how much threat can be in a sentence that's so simple. Yeah. And she says, Is that your only offer? And he says, Yes. Then she says, All right, bye. And then he goes, yeah. okay, okay, lots to think about, huh? And she's like, I'm not thinking about it. <laughs> and it's like, all righty. And I think he says, like, that's the, the first thing you said that's not true. I'm true, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, just seriously excellent acting throughout the I whole like, scene. Um, I really like him a lot. He's got this... He, he, he looks like a... Um, he reminded me of Homelander, just the way he looked. Hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I just really liked his... Uh... And, uh, and also... When when uh, Mon Mothma is talking to all the people that she talks to, typically they're a very you know high class people. Just the outfits, they're all so luxurious and rich people looking. Yeah, uh, and I I think this scene more so than many we've seen with her before. This felt like she was really um, fighting. Uh, she's trying. This is her version of it, right? Like trying to uh, make deals and move things around the way that she wants, but also. Having to come across as pretty strong. It's, uh, I'm hoping to see more of political, powerful Mon Mothma, I guess, as time goes on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. She's, come on, she's kind of running a Game of Thrones type situation, while Andor is more of a action packed smuggler, thief type stuff. 
yeah, uh, good stuff on both of their parts. And it was like I said, mm -hmm. it was it's a cool conversation because there's like two running at the same time. Um, but yeah, back over to Luth and his, and his partner basically says there was a mark on the fountain and I checked and the the thing is broken and he was like, oh, I guess we're having a meeting. The implication being that that's how it's signaled that there's a meeting to be had with his informant being uh, Emmy from. Mm. The ISB. I just, I just think that's a cool way of doing it. It tells me that they care a lot about staying secretive. You have to make a mark on some fountain that she walks by each day to check, and then once you check that, you need to find out whether or not some object in some area near there is broken or not. Um, and she says, what if it's a trap? And he says, if it's a trap, we've already lost. Yeah. That's pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> and what's cool is uh, when Lemmy actually meets with him, the first thing he says is, if it's a trap, press 215. Like giving him one last chance to get out at the, at the time. Now, the problem with this is that I like the entire conversation. All of it. Every last piece of thing that's said I back really, between each other. I really, really like this, yeah. This is uh, good um, stuff. Mm -hmm. when, uh, but... when breaking down why dialogue is good and stuff, right? Like, it puts the thing in. He's first established whether or not it's a trap. Then he doesn't press anything. And then he just goes, first of all, congratulations. Your daughter, healthy and beautiful. You must be pleased. Now... Because I'm so clever, I was like, oh, he's saying that to let him know he knows and that best not be fucking me over because I know you have a daughter and I can do stuff. And then uh, his first response is just, is that supposed to scare me? Like, like even, you know, the, there's no, you're not necessarily having to dig much out. Like, even the characters are smart enough from the writer's point of view that they would pick mm -hmm. up the subtext of sentences yeah. as well. And that they've been doing this long enough. He knows how this works. Um... And he says, like, you become a father. Is it not worth mentioning? And he says, it's not fair. You knowing, watching me. Do you ever think how it might feel from my side? And uh, he says, I think about you constantly. It's why we're here tonight. Oh, so he said, why are we here tonight? But I, I was thinking about the whole I think about you constantly line. As, um, Lo Lonnie's as talking asset. about how, um, how you have view on me. You are watching me. You're judging me. And it's like, I don't think Lonnie realizes, like, you understand that every second you're doing anything, my neck is on the line. Like, of course I'm watching you. Like, it's... Yeah. Uh, the, the relationship we have puts me in constant danger. Like, as much as it's annoying that I'm watching you, it's like anything that happens to you affects me. The rough relationship they have to have. Um, but yeah, he tells uh, Luthen about Deirdre. Like, he, he pretty much highlights her as, like, a, a problem because of how passionate she is. Um, he talks about uh, what happened on Ferex that, 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 that leaves as a link, how she's registered uh, Luthen as Axis. Artigaz even likes her. And um, it's funny, uh, Luthen's reaction is, oh, this is good, encourage it. She's um, She's not even on the right track. She won't find shit. Like... Mm. Um, and then he keeps uh, at the end of every sort of part of this he says uh, this can't be why you're here and he keeps giving him more information so he's like um, rebel pilot was captured they know about Krieger's plan and uh, Luthen just says well that's 50 men but you're worth more than that so we're going to have to let them capture them or kill them and uh, yeah you get a moment of this, this Lonnie guy realizing like holy fuck that's 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 awful. And it's like, well, what are you going to do? Uh, the reality of we've got... How do you take care of, like, a mole is that you've got to be very careful about what information you end up using, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was... Uh, Game of Thrones actually came up with something that was cool for this, right? So the when Tyrion was in charge of a lot of things in um, King's Landing, he, he his plans were getting subverted. Um, he didn't know how or why leaks were getting out. So he had three people that he would tell the plans that he trusted, and so what he tried one day was to come up with a plan, and he told the three of them a different plan for who was going to be involved, and then when the plan leaked, he then knew who was the leaker. Stuff like that is just really fun. Oh, yeah, cool. Um, well, this is what, um, in World War II, this is what the Allies had to do when they finally uh, solved the Enigma Code. They had to use it in a very... Uh, intelligent way so that the Germans wouldn't catch on that we'd crack the code uh, and then, you know, change the whole system and everything. We had to keep them thinking that we didn't know um, the code when we actually did. Uh, just intelligent writing instead of being like 
Mole, give us all the information you can forever. It'll be great. Um, and yeah, Luthan just sees it as like a, it's obvious calculus. We can't change the plan at this point because we need yeah. to maintain you. You are a great resource. And the reality is that this Lottie guy is like, I really can't keep fucking doing this. I've got a family. I can't handle this anymore. And uh, Luthan basically tells him, you've got no choice. You're in it now. It's too late. Yeah. You're in. I mean, you're kind of like Mon Mothman away. It's like, you're, you're in. Is, uh, even as you say the words, you know it's impossible. We can't let you go. We can't spare you. We've been grooming you for too long. Yes, you've been alone, but your career has profited greatly from information we've provided. He's like something they've created at this point through sacrificing. It's like, it doesn't matter that he's a person. That's, that's done. You're an yeah. asset now. Yeah, and he says Krieger's men will die to make sure your daughter has a father. You're trapped, Lonnie. There's no pleasure in saying it, but you're not going anywhere. And uh, Lonnie says, my sacrifice means nothing to you, does it? Um, and then he says, uh, what, what, what sacrifice have you made? What do you sacrifice? And uh, Here we go. Here we go. Yep. Oh, so good. He it's has a again. speech that's pretty intense, and it yep. gives you everything you need to know about Luthen as a character, and it was impressive. Uh, not just, again, for the writing, but also the delivery. Can't go wrong with uh, with, with Stellan Skarsgård, of course, but uh, this kind of speech made me think, like, I could understand why he would be passionate about this character at this point, um, in terms of... It's a shame. I thought he would have preferred running around naked at Stonehenge, but I oh, suppose... Yeah. I suppose this is this is all right, I guess. Or know. the Dark World reference right there. I didn't even. I don't even know if you knew that's what that movie is from. That like, clip, I mean. Nope. Um, <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. Nope. I, I. I. That that movie is so forgettable that you can watch scenes from it and not know that it's from <laughs> Thor: The Dark World. Yeah, I guess uh, he's probably sad he can't do that anymore compared to this. Um, oh, what a shame. So yeah, uh, I guess we'll go through his speech first, and then try and talk maybe a bit about what it means. So, he says, um, uh, What do I sacrifice? Calm, kindness, kinship, love. I've given up all chance of inner peace. I've made my mind a sunless space. I share my dreams with ghosts. I wake up every day to an equation I wrote 15 years ago from which there's only one conclusion. I'm damned for what I do. My anger, my ego, my unwillingness to yield, my eagerness to fight, they've set me on a path from which there is no escape. I yearn to be a savior against injustice without contemplating the cost, and by the time I looked down, there was no longer any ground beneath my feet. What is my sacrifice? I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. I burn my decency for someone else's future. I burn my life to make a sunrise I know I'll never see. And the ego that started this fight will never have a mirror or an audience or the light of gratitude. So what I, what do I sacrifice? Everything. You'll stay with me, Lonnie. I need all the heroes I can get. Oh, um, fantastic. We didn't even begin. Uh, he's basically explained he's not even a person really anymore. He's like a, a player on the board. He doesn't get to live a life. And that's the sacrifice you have to make. You're no longer... Yeah, able to do anything human, you have to do everything according to reaching that ultimate goal, which makes you sacrifice literally everything. Honestly, when he says like calm, kindness, kinship, love, I think he's just talking about literally everything you enjoy about living. He can't do anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only can he not do it in terms of uh, like that, it won't allow him to achieve his goals. He, he's kind of incapable of it. How can he be calm ever? Like with yeah. the life that it's, well, yeah, it's like. This... All kinds of things that come into it, right? Like starting relationships. You can't be doing that. That, that, no. that. that drags someone else in that's leverage against you, and it makes it so you have more people to take care of. Just don't. It's not a good idea. And it's like making friends. It's like, well, it's tough because you can't trust anybody. And it's like Yeah, because if you if you look at the scenes we had with him this whole time, he's either playing a role in Curasund, uh as the, the, the antique shopkeeper guy, and has to keep that up. And when he's not doing that, he's somewhere in space doing uh, rebellion shit and needs to put on another face, basically, which is like, ah, oh, I'm that hard ass that, that needs to get shit done. Like, I think he's like the only character we don't really see, like main characters that we don't see having like an actual like home, like a room where he chills in. 
he's always like on on the clock. Always job, yeah. It's always, always on the job. Yeah, I think he's you're right. He, he pretty much just always doing something that in, in yeah. the empire of uh, the rebellion. It's um, a quite stressful situation, I would say. Well, and he said uh, it's an equation he wrote 15 years ago. So he started up 15 years in terms of uh, trying to subvert the empire in different ways, and. There's so many lines in here that are so interesting to me, like his, who he was then set him on a path that that person would never have to deal with the results of. Yeah. Like, exactly. That's a different person. He's gone. The, 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 um, the course that he set upon has, has turned him into somebody that is totally different from that person. The person just doesn't exist. What they wanted in their goals. It's, it's kind of like sowed the seeds for his own destruction in a sense, but he didn't know it. Until it was too late, and now he's stuck. He has to stay committed to this path. It's all he's got. Uh, it's everything now. Mm -hmm. He got rid of everything for it. That's another reason why he has to continue. And uh, yeah, just the the that that very ego will never have a mirror or an audience or the light of gratitude. Like a lot of what would even yeah. make him praiseworthy is already gone from all of like the horrible decisions he has to make, including but not limited to what he said about Krieger right now. It's like fifty one men are dead. Just because, and I could save them, but I'm not gonna. Yeah, like it's that simple. And yeah, like wh when he says, "I burn my decency for someone else's future," it's just like he's gonna be making all kinds of horrible decisions, using the tools of his enemy, destroying his own soul, so that there can be a better world for better people, uh, people that yeah. have the chance to be better than he is. And it's, I mean, it's a few. He's not even gonna see that future. He probably won't make it. And what's weird is um, I actually saw this, uh, there was a post, I, th I think it was the the Mola subreddit. They were like, I hope they talk about this speech in Andor. And I was just like, oh yeah, obviously. And I checked oh, one of the like totally. comments that was against it and it said it was really hard to listen to considering he's talking to someone whose daughter is in the crosshairs when he has nothing like that to sacrifice. Uh. Um, the whole point is that he can't even generate a life to sacrifice. It's all gone. Nothing. It's already gone. There's nothing left. Except for him to continue to be alive to achieve his goals, that's it. If anything, it benefits him to try and remain as detached from anything emotional or, or human as possible, because it makes him better at his job. And uh, that's part of the realization. He's destroyed everything that made him human, and the whole goal is to create a world that's better for humanity. So, um, this is what makes Luthen probably my favorite. It's, it's, it's... He's a result of trying to make things better. This, like, almost fucking ghost of a person. And, uh... Yeah, he, he represents the element of grey that exists in this conflict. And the, co and the cost. Like, the real embodiment of the cost. Not just in terms of, you know, like, I guess more overt, obvious things, but his soul. That it's just like, yeah. He's had to sacrifice every aspect of his being for this goal. Um, and I mean, he's, he might not even get to even see his good work or, or like when I say good work, I mean the, the positive outcome of the, uh, of what he's doing of like trying to free the galaxy. And it's like he said, nobody will remember him that like that. Nobody's going to sing songs about him. Nope. He's just going to be forgotten. Um, it, it's a total sacrifice of everything that he could ever have or be, which is <clears> almost of this goal. Something we know to be true because, yeah, Luthen's not brought up in any of the future content. Obviously, he's a nope. new character, but they're going to build it, presumably, so that when he dies, it's going to be... I, I would consider it quite an important moment, however they're going to kill him, because he's obviously not going to make it, uh, oh, ultimately. Yeah. But, like, what what exactly... How do you spend a life like that? You need to make it so that he does something incredibly significant that has just no coverage at all, and no one will ever know about what it was, yeah. probably. That's probably the kind of death you'd give a man like that, but... um. Yeah, the, uh, I share my dreams with ghosts. It's like... Uh, that line, yeah. Mm-hmm. Dreams with ghosts. Uh, and, and of course, the I burn my life to make a sunrise I know I'll never see is just a, a different version of the plant the seeds to tree you'll never see the shade of, sort of. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, if it was unclear, he basically feels like he's already given up everything and he knows he's doomed. Yep. But, uh, He'll do what he can, and and I just love that it finishes off with him saying, "I need all the heroes I can get," because uh, he needs every last piece of element to make all of this worthwhile. Um, that's that's how the episode ends out, pretty much. And that's ten out of twelve. Ten.
And it is one of the one of the best episodes of the of the show. Yeah, it's good stuff. There's too many payoffs. Too many really awesome payoffs. It's um, it's the kind of thing that revs you up too. For like, all right, how the fuck is this gonna end? Because uh, mm -hmm. it's you know, you just got the prison escape. We've got ratcheting up with the I, uh, ISB. This thing with uh, Krieger and then Luthen making this whole speech is just like. What exactly is our two episode finale going to do to sum up all of this? And, um, well, I guess we'll be about talking about it. But since this seems like a natural point, we're at six hours, 20 ish minutes. So, nice long fap since we've got two more episodes to go. But I'm afraid Mr. Fringolius won't be able to maintain this, uh, this little chat. Unfortunately, because <clears throat> uh, I do really like this show, and there's still a few things left in the last couple of episodes that are. Uh that are worth delving into, but alas, that won't, I don't, I don't get to. Well, uh, um, before you go, do you want, is there anything you want to say in relation to this show, or maybe how you, uh, what do you think of it overall? Because, I mean, we're, we're ten episodes in, so it's not exactly going to be shocking to anybody how yeah. you feel about it now. Uh, well, like I said at the beginning, I really, really like it. I suppose the more interesting thing is, it's, it's just one of the best, it's one of the best Star Wars stories. One of the best. Like, in general. Even taken, you know, like, away from just the Disney Star Wars framing. It's one of the best stories that they've told in this universe. It's super interesting. And it's well realized. Like, the, the script is so... It, the script is very strong. Even though, obviously, there are some plotting issues here and there. But, like, the work and attention that's been given to characters is, is really refreshing. Um, it feels like it's been a long time in Star Wars where we've got to really delve into characters. And especially tying in the arcs that all of those characters are being sent on, all of which are very disparate, into some central themes that are really compelling. Um, I'm just very impressed by it. And having now finished the show, you know, the the whole season, I'm uh, I'm like I'm looking forward to more Andor. Like that's that that's like a corner of oh, this yeah. universe that I'm at least looking mm -hmm. forward to. Because elsewhere, I don't care anymore. Like I don't expect Ahsoka or Mando season three or any. Like I'm oh, not. No. <laughs> no, I don't, I, it's just but this this is in a league of its own compared to all of those other um it's inspired it's, it's, it's like a, it's a real story that you had a bunch of creators who were passionate and talented working together and using all of the resources that are available to them with like an ip like star wars the money the talent um visual effects set uh like cinematography that they were able to leverage all of those tools um and great actors as well. Like, it's worth emphasizing. The performances across the board are really great. And there are a few people who were excellent. Uh, and all of that's been leveraged in service of a story. Because they had an idea. Like, that, <laughs> they had a story that they wanted to tell. And wouldn't you believe it? It was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's the most interested I've been in Star Wars in a long time. But it's mainly just here. Like, it doesn't... It don't extend elsewhere. Mando mm -hmm. Season 3 is up next. And I'm... Pff, whatever. <laughs> It's gonna well, but I mean, it'll be terms, back to that other yeah. form of production where we'll be like, oh. Yeah, uh, we'll just have to wait for another couple of years, just waiting for Andor. Fingers crossed that they are... And this, I mean, the fact that they've said so many times that they have a plan for the course of, like, several seasons, that's the kind of thing that gets me optimistic, especially given how deliberate uh, so much of what happened in this first season was. I'll go as far as saying as well, this shows the lack of bias, I think, in a lot of people that... Andor had everything against it, everything possible, and yet it's, no it's slithering through Andor. a lot of people yeah. saying, like, well, no, actually, it is good. Like, like you know, like, the, the idea that there's just no standards, you're just hating on Disney Star Wars forever. Like, there's so many people who have said, like, well, no, Andor's different, and it's clearly different. Like, yeah. it's, 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 so, clearly it's so different. evidently different. Even in those first couple episodes, we're sort of there. Like, even before the first episode was done, it's like, you are, you're different. Like, there, there's just, like, a, a caliber of writing that's just better. There's the subtext. Scene. There's subtext. Like, that alone puts the buff <laughs> man yeah. on Book of Boba Fett. Um, and it goes beyond that. Like, it's worth emphasizing that you have this huge ensemble of characters, and they all feel distinct. And it's, 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 um, it's the script giving them a voice, and then the, the actors being able to take that and to forge all of these characters who are distinct. Like, Cassian is not Luthen, who is not Mon Mothma, uh, who is not Kino. Uh, like, it's, it's, it's just, everybody, everybody feels distinct. They all feel well characterized. Everybody obviously gets a different amount of time. But nevertheless, we get to explore a whole bunch of disparate perspectives on the Rebellion, on the Empire, the state of that galaxy. 
it's it's just so refreshing. I'm I'm a big fan. I really really enjoyed it. Um, it's the best Star Wars thing in a long time. In a long time, <laughs> longer than longer than Disney Star Wars. <laughs> oh yeah, and the best said, Star Wars we've had in uh, forty years. Well, does careful it, rags. That's does, uh, does, it beat, <laughs> does it beat Return of the Jedi? The question. Ooh. That's the thing. Return of the Jedi hinges so much on the the last of Yoda and Luke Vader. I mean, I don't well, that, that's that's worth a lot. Um, it is worth a lot. That's the thing. I think the thing that like it's like Empire blew the doors open on like Star Wars as it exists right now doesn't exist without Empire. Yeah. Um, um, and Return well, of the Jedi delivers a lot of really great payoffs. Re and there's also the fact that those are films and this is a TV show. There's more time. How do I yeah, factor in I'm, the scale of what they achieve with the time that they have in a show versus a film, you know? Hmm. I'm not yeah, sure. I, I have to think about to it. Say. I don't want to... It, but we're, it's actually <laughs> something to think about. Like, it's not uh, a yeah, question that we yeah, have. It's, it's better than the previous, Disney by the way. It, so. Like, pretty obviously. Um, and the fact that Disney made it. But it's like a thing that emerged in spite of being Disney Star Wars. That's I think that's the only way I, I can describe it. It is so different in terms of how they made it clearly and what it is compared to Boba Fett mandalorian and obi-wan kenobi it's so different that it's this it's it's this outlier am amongst disney star wars it doesn't give me any indication of any like optimism for any other projects that they work on and the hope is that there is enough recognition at disney that people like this and that and that this is quality that they're not going to interfere with it and be like yeah man like you could have had more viewers if you threw in like you know if you threw in um like some recognizable jedi or some other character because, you know, like, imagine... Ah, oh, damn, I can't talk about it forever. I, uh... It's, um... I'm, I'm just really happy with it. Um, uh, I'm glad it exists. It, it just... It puts a smile on my face that we've got something that's actually taking itself seriously. It, there's a story that they want to tell. And it provides us with a lot of great characters through which we can examine this universe. Big ol' fan. Uh, I would recommend it. Yeah. Easy Absolutely. recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would too. Well, we will talk more about that once we get past the next two episodes. But... We'll have to see you the next time, Mr. Also, Free. By the way, you need to talk about the really cool touch. That there's a video that talks about uh, the opening title card and, and the theme. Because we haven't talked much about the music, but I really like the music in this in this show. Um, I do too. Like if it's I like, uh, theme. I'm a big fan of that one. Well, I mean, you can um, I... say it now if you want. The the the, the thing. About uh, the music. Well, so there's a YouTube video that compiles that if you every single title card for Andor has it's it's the same theme. It's just, it's still his theme. But it's always different, different instruments, different intensity. Yep. Um, there's a video that compiles all twelve of uh, the intro themes together, and it, and and like all of them slot together to create this brand new sound. It's it's so good that it had to have oh. been deliberate. It's so good that it had to have been a deliberate choice. Um, but it's like mm. that. I can believe that that attention to detail exists. Um, but yeah, like it's it's just attention to detail across the board is is just like a way to describe Andor for for whatever flaws that there may be. Well, um, that's neat and everything. But did you know in the last episode of Boba Fett they go Boba Fett? That's uh, true. They, they do just name. name Boba Fett at the end. Um, yeah, that's, that's true. Boba they did do that. That's cool. Um, it's like a Pokemon. Uh, Boba Boba Boba. Yeah. But yeah, Andor, alrighty. good. That's it for me. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody out and there, and yeah, I'll catch you next time. Have a good Merry chat bye. about more of the See and or stuff. Feel like it. No, hey, bye. Cheesy. it goes. And now it is on us to, it's on to us. bring it home. All right, so well, I don't know who's going to be tired Ford. tomorrow. <laughs> Nobody going to be tired. You got the power of Andor behind you, or something. That's right. Um, you that's... have to sacrifice everything. So uh, again. The order in which I'm trying to do the events of episode 11 are sort of a little bit jumbled, but we'll start with, uh, we find out Marva is dead. And uh, yeah, the droid is sad. just freaking out. He's super sad and super affected by it. I don't know. I, I actually felt kind of bad for him if he's like... It's like the yeah, equivalent of... Um, the the droid, he's, he's not able to handle any kind of stress, really. You see that throughout the, the whole show. He's just constantly upset, and all he ever wants is for people he likes to be around. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, as we'll soon find out. And so he's fact, not handling the idea that Marva's gone, since he's probably with her every single day, forever. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I thought it was pretty sad. And they say to him, like, you know, you gotta, you gotta pull together, B. The daughter of Ferex require your assistance. Uh, that's gonna regard something soon enough. We'll find out what that is in the next episode. 
Um, but anyway, Cassian's plotline, uh, he's running from the old, uh, the prison, and they come across two aliens who are fishing, and his friend says, if we just sprint for this ship, we can steal it, because they'll be too slow to get to us to stop us, and Cassian's like, that's kind of an insane plan, <laughs> and he's just like, let's just do it, and so they're like, okay, and they start sprinting, but unfortunately for them, these aliens have... Uh, devices that are designed to capture things that are running, I guess, and it's interesting. They're like slimy nets, basically. Yeah, yeah. Kind of gross. It's it. It's just it, it's just slimy nets. There's no there's no other comparisons that we should even have to make <laughs> as to what they might Come. be about. Oh my goodness! <laughs> They're coom nets. Coom um, nets. So, uh, yeah, that's really fucking unfortunate. Then, and then the aliens are like. They come close to seeming as though they might kill them, but then they're like, nah, you chill. We don't like the Empire either. In fact, wherever you're going, we'll help you get there. Kind of I weird. don't know, man. I was just like, and okay. moving on. Yeah, that... I don't know what it is. Like, uh, I think there's enough references now to be like, you know, wheel building? Really loving it. Character? Top-notch. Theme? On point. Plot? What are you doing? What are we doing now? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they don't know how to connect the larger set pieces to each other in terms of the stories, do they? Like, how do we get the how do we get to, into the prison arc? It's like he gets captured. Okay, how does he how does he move from the prison arc back to like the main arc in Ferrex? Uh, aliens just give him a ride. Yeah, after he gets okay. captured, but not really. And the funny thing about this is that it's not that hard to write, sort of, you know easier to digest and more consequence level writing for the connecting pieces. This feels a lot more like a cop-out, just, um... Because these aliens are kind of interesting, especially the way they speak is very unique. Uh, but they just... very like it, it, For a moment there, it's like, oh, you made a really bad decision, almost die, but then it turns out you're not going to die, you're in fact going to get everything you need. And you're like, okay, alright. Cool. Yeah, it's the connective threads for some of these little plot lines that need the work. Yeah. Um, and then he, uh, Cassian goes back to that little apartment y place he rented out, I guess. And there's two people in there, the two aliens. Yeah. Just and sleeping. Uh, he sneaks in while they're sleeping and grabs his little care package. Nobody found it, I guess. Nope. And it's kind of crazy that they didn't find it because, yeah, it's, uh, there's loads of credits in there and the gun. And I imagine, like, maybe even fake IDs or whatever, but just, yep. It, 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 I was like, man, that's lucky. I mean, this is uh, just, just, just a cleaning person just going around. It's like, I'm going to need to clean up there today. It's like, oh shit, what's that? It's super easy to find, too. Um, yeah. You can see it if you walk in the room. It's not as well hidden as you might imagine. I'm trying to get a good shot of it, actually. Uh, yeah, anybody renting that place out or person cleaning it, you're right. Yeah, they would, they would find that shit. Um, and he's yeah. not... Hasn't been here for a while. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I just thought that was awkward and very lucky. Uh, uh yeah. Can't disagree. So then he, uh, he contacts the guy in Ferrix that controls transport and stuff, and that's where he finds out his mum's dead. Rather unfortunate, of course. Uh, he tells the dude he's with, he's got, like, some stuff to sort out, but that dude says, like, you know, we have to tell people. People have to know about this. Uh, People just don't know what's going on in those prisons, but they, they seriously need to. And he says we should split up, double our chances, and uh, uh, Cassian gives him a bit of the credits, I guess, to help him out. Credits and a gun. And a blaster. Off yeah. they go. <clears throat> I thought it was interesting, by the way, there's a shot of Cassian staring out into the, uh, sort of the ocean with the sun, and I was like, I'm pretty sure... Isn't that what he sees before he dies in Rogue One? Looking out to the beach, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty remember. sure that's the, the visual. And so I wonder if the idea here is that this is the moment where he's committing to being um, a rebel, basically. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, everything he's, he experienced in the prison, and then his commitment to go back to, to Fennec. And, and, and his goal is obviously to see Luthen, uh, as he does at the end of this show. So I imagine that's the idea. That visual being the book ending, the start and end of his rebellion sort of thing. Not sure. I'd have to. I'd have to look into it further. But I could believe it because this show kind of does that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's deliberate. You know, that probably is what they're trying to do. Um. All right. As for Deirdre, she says they're asking for a, or someone tells her that they're asking for a send off for Marva. They want a funeral, but they already know that they won't be allowed. She says, "No, no. 
allow it, put it in a box and keep it full coverage. It's uh, she sees it as a big opportunity to <clears throat> bait, putting yeah. out a net, so to speak, which I quite like. Again, I think that's a good idea. If I were her, I'd be like, "Yep, that's probably what we should do." Big smart. Um, as for Bix, uh, her mind has basically been scrambled by the torture, and she looks awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's not having a good time. Feels super bad for her. Uh, I can't imagine just getting session after session of torture of the manner of listening to children's screams of a variety of alien that makes you insane. Not fun. And uh, she's entirely expendable. They don't give a shit about her. Can't help but feel a little bad for it. And they ask her if uh, Anton Krieger is the one that uh, is Axis, and it's not, it doesn't even look like she gives a clear answer, but of course there's not much they can gain, because mm -hmm. either she says he is, which is a lie, or she says he isn't, and they just continue looking for Axis. Yeah. It's a lose-lose either way for her. Yeah, it's not like she gains much. Uh, yeah, Val <clears throat> is asking for... Um, uh, Luthen, because she has information, which is that Cassian's mum has died. And this event, like Marva dying, is making everybody realize, like, who wants Cassian, that there's a good chance he's going to be showing up for her funeral. Mm -hmm. so it's a decent bet, but there's a lot of people around. Um, and then over to Mon Mothma. Her, uh, her daughter's doing some weird cult flaminess. Um, nice. Or I guess it comes across as cult flaminess to us because we're not familiar with the culture, but she says it's something to do with the Elder, a traditional cultural thing. And uh, Val is like, what the fuck? She's like, I don't know, she, she's taken with it. She wanted to do it, so there you go. Um, and she explains that uh, she was essentially like fueling Luthen's different operations, but that uh, one of her ledgers was off balance, and so she needed help. And uh, after Aldani, her accounts have essentially been frozen. Um, and so Tay is the guy she hired to get help. And he's discovered in her accounts that there's way more that's a problem than just like one account in terms of uh, what can be traced. So she's basically explaining to Val why she did what she did, that she's found a solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there's just another, because there's so many examples of it. Uh, the daughter turns up and she's really excited to see Val. But she like gives a little glare to on Mothma as as walks up. You can see like there's this just happy environment. She loves her daughter stuff, but yeah, this uh, even even it's cool when you could have because I, I did it with Andy Circus just now. There's a couple with plenty of actors, but um, when you can get an evidence of how good the acting is from still frames, I think that's when you know you're in a really good position for their uh, performance. Yeah. But, um, yeah, this is the face of a woman who knows that she's going to have to use her daughter to benefit her position politically as well as avoid catastrophe. A daughter that isn't exactly in favor of her very much as it is. So. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, we get Cyril's plotline. It's a small update, but basically um, Minus has contacted him. Says that uh, his friend that he still has contact with in, I guess, ISB or whatever security thing is aware that uh, Marva's died and that he believes there's a good chance that um, Cassian would show up and so that's their chance to capture him to make up for the mistake that they made. So as you can see, this episode is basically everybody sees that Marva dying is a chance to get Cassian. Yep. Uh, Big old setup to get everybody to, to place. But one of the things you notice about this is that he's uh, not looking too fantastic. Um... He's, it seems he's been completely demoted. Obviously, they all were, but he's uh, he's in like a steelworks type place. He's not as well yeah, shaven. Yeah, some kind of foundry. Mm -hmm. um, the connection is really shit, and but he's like trying to remain positive and give him this information so it's useful. And just, I kind of feel bad for the guy, right? Like he was only trying to enforce what he thinks are good laws to maintain important order for a society that's protected and. Uh, uh, he did He did his job, he, and to be fair, he did it the best out of all of them there, and he got uh, as harsh a punishment as anybody. Yeah. He's still trying to keep it going. Like, I don't, I don't know exactly what story they're going to tell for him going forward, um, but I'm interested to see how it all goes. I'm not exactly going to be surprised if they have suffering in line for a lot of the Empire-related people. Yeah. And so, that takes us over to Luthen's plotline, which uh, we have a super interesting conversation between him and Saw. 
uh, you basically it's established pretty quickly that that uh, Saw is in line with joining Krieger. He's on board with the plan, but of course right. we don't want Saw joining Krieger anymore. No. Uh, and so he's like, well, what's going on? And he's like, well, he's about to get screwed over in court. And then he's like, why is this something we're not going to save him from? And he's like, because that would give up my source. And then uh, he says, how do you know? I don't, I won't tell him. And he says, I don't know what you'll do. Uh, it's, it, it, it's just this incredibly awkward position that's developing between them and, and something that probably happens a lot in these kinds of environments. How much are you willing to give up? But the, this is something of a weight that Luthen had alone. But at this mm -hmm. point, he's essentially going to share it with uh, with Saw. But there's um there's a part where Saw gets super paranoid, and he's like, "So you already know about this because you had someone in the ISB. Like, do you have someone here? Do you have someone everywhere?" And then he's just like, "Can you please pay attention? Like, we're talking about what we're going to do next with Krieger." And then he gets so paranoid that the only way Luthen thinks he can get him to listen is to actually like play into it for a second and be like, "Oh yeah, it's that yeah. guy over there." <laughs> and that guy's like, "Hey, no, like, well, no, it isn't." Lying, um, <clears throat> and yeah, so he, he gets a gun on him, and he says, "The only reason I'm doing this is so you'll fucking listen to me." Um, says basically, uh, he he just passes the choice over to him once he's explained it. And uh, what's interesting, of course, is that Saw basically com comes to the same conclusion as him. Um, Riga goes down. Betty says. Yeah, he says the ISB will feel invincible. They'll feel untouchable. We'll have a clear field of play. The alternative, Krieger pulls out. We wave him off. They'll know that they have. Uh, they'll have to wonder. They'll trust nothing, just like you're doing right now. If I were ISB, so why wouldn't I just send you out there with him? I didn't want you to have to make this choice. Thirty men plus Krieger for the greater good. Call it what you will. And Saw says, "I call it war." Yeah. Rough. Um, it's a rough decision to have, have to make, but it's got to do it. <clears throat> yes, um, and it's tough, rough, and yeah, just that many men's lives just sitting in your hand, and that's the decision that's made pretty casually. Yeah, and they don't even know. They'll never know. So anyway, uh, Luther on his way back, he has a conversation that I found super interesting with his uh, his partner, and of course, they're always worried about being detected, and so he says, um, of course. Uh, he wanted to reopen the offer and uh well so so I guess to properly set this up, right? They they are talking about everything that's happened with Saw and what's gonna be happening next with Andor. But they can't be using any names like that or even specific locations or really any specifics at all. They have to come across as though they're talking about what their store is, which is trading antiques and it's like yeah, artifacts. antiques and cultural artifacts. Um, An anthropology store. Yeah. Um and so uh, she says, did you close the sale? And he says, I did. It was more expensive than I'd hoped, but I wasn't in a position to bargain. Probably talking about how, you know, it went as good as it was going to go with the Krieger situation. Yeah. Or, but it's uh, yep. yeah, not fun, but it's done. And she says, you're coming home? And he says, depends. I'm most curious about the other piece, obviously being Andor. And she says, you should come home. And he says, it's no longer available? And she no, it's very much on the table. The negotiations are ongoing, and our representatives, being Cinder and uh, Val, are involved. There's other buyers involved, being the ISB. Your presence would complicate the bidding at this point. It's like, yeah, there's not much reason for you to be there as well. Everything is fucking there. And he says, we need that piece. We lose that, and we'll have to close shop. And he's obviously talking about how that's the one big loose end, his Cassian, for him. Um... He says, there's nothing more you can do. And he says, that's never true. This is a crowded mm -hmm. market. You need to think of the consequences of losing that piece to another collector. I just, I, I like it. It's so much fun to listen it's to. It's really good, yeah. Yeah, it's so much code. Uh, yeah. It's, and what's interesting good. is um, their yeah. conversation is cut <clears throat> off by him being uh, bumped into a patrol. Yeah. It was probably good that he's talking that way. And then we get an action scene. Ew. Um, I guess I'll summarize it first. It's the Luthen bumps into this this ship. They use their tractor beam on him to hold him in place, and then they start asking questions until they decide they're going to pull him in for a full inspection. He enacts some countermeasures and escapes. Where would we like to begin talking? I feel like I end up summarizing a lot and talking a lot, so I want to give some people another chance to a little chatzeruni, you know? 
Well, basically, it's like it's like a big old uh, big old ship that has three satellite dishes that point well to the front basically. Uh yeah. And uh they they get him into a little tractor beam. And he's like playing along. It's like, "Oh, hey, yeah, I'm just uh just passing by, I'm I'm a salesman or whatever. And while while this is happening, he tells the computers like, "Hey, get me, give me like a like an ID that I can use." And uh, he gets the ID, passes along. It's like, "Hey, what's going on with the ID?" It's like, "Yeah, the ID is good." And the guy uh, that checked the ID is like, "Oh, so we gotta gotta get rid of the tractor beam." It's like, "No, we could we, we could use the practice." He says. So even though everything is fine, he still decides to. Uh, check his cargo. And, uh, yeah, he's like, hey, we're gonna get you in with the tractor beam. Uh, so don't, don't do any, any shenanigans or use your thrusters or whatever. Because we're gonna get you now. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay, no problem. And, of course, he, he starts, uh, doing some thruster stuff. So he, he's not getting piped, uh, dragged in to the, to the spaceship immediately. And also, on the side, he, he prepares some countermeasures. So, he's just wasting some time. He's like, oh, I have some overheating here, blah, blah, blah. Just kind of talking bullshit until the, uh... Because they have, like, tiers of tractor beam, right? Like, one, two, three, yeah. four, five or something. Yeah, like levels, like. yeah. And so when they apply the first level, you can, like, fuck with it just by, like, half launching one of his thrusters mm -hmm. and, which is a really weird thing to do because if you're trying to escape you wouldn't do that but if you're trying to cooperate fully you wouldn't do that as well so what's going on and he's like oh whoops that's just my thruster being a, a bitch don't worry about it i'll sort it out yeah what it does like, do uh, is delay everything yeah he's like i'm a one-man crew here this is gotta take some time sorry about that it's like yeah I have a little overheating issue uh but again because the empire is not stupid it's like scan his his heating, his kind of thrusters. I don't believe him. So they do. It's like, oh, it's all bullshit. But before they can do anything, he starts his countermeasures, which I'm actually not entirely sure what they are. So he basically has, like, they look like rocket pots, but they point to the back of him. They almost look like, um, Altrops, but in space. Yeah, something like that. And I think the idea is that he uses the, the, the tractor beam for extra extra speed, and they basically crash into the middle. Yeah, that uh, would make sense, that they're being launched into the tractor beam and the tractor beam's pulling them, so... Yeah, and then it just destroys the... Uh, that part, and he gets away. Well... <laughs> what about you, Rags? <laughs> Do you have any commentary? So, this scene was <laughs> hit and miss for me. Yeah. There was elements that I liked about it, and there's elements that I didn't like about it. Um... What I like is this sense of the, the idea that, um, that, that, that Luth, Luthen's done this before. Mm -hmm. He has a special, a particular set of skills. Oh. He has a ship that can do things that is, that is also special. Uh, he has a shipboard AI that seems really good. He has a, you know, his countermeasures, which are obviously a, a surprise weapon, essentially. Um, he has a very good laser cannon on it. He has the silly fucking lightsabers that come out of the <laughs> side. But oh, at least pretty, right. Oh. Pretty safe to say that this ship and him are both not typical. No. Uh, I like the way that the Empire goes about asking him for his business, readying up a loading craft, telling him, do it anyway, we need to practice and stay in shape. Um, I like how they don't escalate too fast, too quick, but at the same time, they don't let them just get away with doing things or saying things. Um, and I, I like um, uh, Luthen's. He, he he's done this before. You get that feeling, you know. I need to get a distraction. I'm gonna give an excuse. Power up this. Power up that. You know, keep your cool. So there's a lot of this I do like. What I don't like is the execution and how some of it's done. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Everything after he uses the countermeasures to destroy the front radar array or tractor beam dish, I kind of don't like too much. Um, the way that he's very e these these uh there's it's like three Tie Fighters and a bomber 
come out. He instantly kills the bomber and then shoots another TIE fighter without missing. His cannon is really good, but we'll chalk that up to it being a special ship and he would invest in that. Oh, okay, okay. That's not typical, sure. But I don't think he gets touched a single time by the fighters that are chasing after him and you think they'd nope. be more maneuverable. Um, and, uh, and I think the biggest offender is how at the end when there's two TIE fighters mm, left, mm -hmm, he's heading mm -hmm. at them and they are heading at him. He has these little blade lightsaber blades stick out of the side of his ship and he does an aileron and it just slices this, the TIE fighters both and they blow up and it's stupid. It's yeah. so <laughs> dumb. Like, no, this doesn't belong here. Get this out of here. Stop. You were doing so good. Before you started doing things, it was so good. <laughs> um, and then he hyperdrives away and leaves the Imperial commander of the ship kind of speechless, in fact. Uh, so, yeah. But as much as I, I didn't like the execution of some of the ideas, and I did like a lot of it, what I did notice is that they're clearly trying. Um, it's not all stupid. It's pretty much just him at the end, pretty much. Um, but everything up to that point, you're like, oh, okay, so they're, they're doing a little thing to show how Luthen's competent, how he, you know, gets away from a situation like this, that he's prepared for it. It shows that he's really on track. He has a plan. Um, you know, that, that I like for a ship to be able to get away from essentially a star destroyer or a mini star destroyer would be a really, really big deal. It's not something to take lightly. It's a ship that has lots of cannons. It has tractor beams. It has TIE fighters on it. It's got lots and lots of personnel. The idea that you can just get away from it is not a just thing. You, you got to be, you got to come up with a reason and a writing reason why mm -hmm. it's possible for you to get away from this ship. And they knew to make that a thing. They went through the effort of at least trying to, even though not, all of that, you know, not perfectly, we'll say. Mm -hmm. They knew that they had to do that. They couldn't just have him get away through something completely stupid. Yeah. I don't know what they were thinking of those lasers. I saw them and was like, what the... What? What? what why? It is felt like someone only. snuck him. Just give him another uh, auto turret. That's cool. I, I think auto turrets are pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. That's the whole reason it's there is to be cool. But it's shit. The, obvious, <laughs> the fun result of it is it's uncool to us. We're like, boo. Yeah. Because you can't, you don't even see the ends of it. So as far as I know, they just span the unlimited amounts of time. I, I don't know. Just an ever extending laser. <laughs> They're just going to slam into a planet one day. And it's like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Um. I completely agree. The scene is 50-50 for me. There's so much I like and yeah. so much I don't. But, but they um, knew to try. Yeah, there's much more effort in this than there is usually. Such as, Absolutely. do you have a face? Or, you are a higher rank, <laughs> therefore it's okay. Uh, the face. I do have a face. I really just, yeah. I really enjoy his delivery of just like, oh, <laughs> Oh, so this is, these things are screwing up, and you know, oh, there's piracy in these areas. Thanks for the warning, man. That was weird. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, just like the thruster, and just there's, there's lots of good ideas and stuff. Clean it up a bit. What is this stupid laser bullshit? <laughs> what yeah, are you doing? It's so dumb. It's so Stop dumb. It. Put it away. Put it in a little laser box. Yeah, get out of the show. You don't belong here. You're clearly trespassing from somewhere. We else. don't. We don't like your kind here, laser. Which, um, by the way, that leads us to episode 12. Oh my god, that's the last one. Here we go. Literally the last episode of this. I think the longest Literally. one, too. Literally. Uh, the last I can't one. remember. They all just... The pacing was so good, I never really it thought about it. It is a 54-minute yeah. episode, my dude. Oh. Wow. Well, let's get through it, because I'm tired. Wow. I'm sleepy. And there's me being. You're talking about all this Andor. I'm also that. I have, I have many complex emotions right now, like is, hunger. Yeah, <laughs> like I, hungry. I am. Um, you know, just let me. I'm, I just need like an extra minute to complete the consumption of this particular item. So can you guys like discuss is, the weather, maybe? A minute. Uh, okay. The well, what's the is, weather like in the the Germany land? Uh, in, it is currently the outside the weather. It's a uh, dark. 
Which has nothing to do with the weather, I think. So uh... weather is dark. That's what I'll start saying. Uh, yeah, <laughs> weather's gonna be pretty dark tonight. I'd yeah. be, uh, you know, watch out. I hate when it's uh, dark weather in the day. Yeah, it's like an eclipse. Stupid. No, nah, just like when dark rain happens. You know, rain that just makes darkness everywhere. Yeah, it's really annoying. It's a sad, sad day for dark rain. Actually, it was kind of weird. It went like from minus ten degrees Celsius. Uh, a couple of days ago to now, like, plus 10. Like, shit's weird. You shit weird? I just sometimes. Oh. Like, Depends what, do you what, mean? I, what I ate. Oh, I thought you meant, like, your posture or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, and do oh, a little hat, weird headstand. Position, yeah. Little hat stand. Talking about weather, tomorrow for me, uh, this, this isn't Fahrenheit, but uh, uh, the low for tomorrow is going to be 6. Mm. Sounds perfect. So over overnight, it's going to be uh, precipitation. Yeah, looks like we're going to get showers in the day. It's going to be 47 uh, Fahrenheit during the day. And then that night, six degrees. So what's going to happen is all is everything's going to get all wet. Uh -huh. And then overnight, it's going to fucking freeze. And it'll stay frozen because Friday, it only gets up to 23. And Fahrenheit 32 is freezing, so mm. it's gonna be now that is a one two punch of weather. That's the old Arkansas one two punch. Normally, it just showers for a little bit, like in the summer, it'll shower for a little bit, make everything super humid, wet, and then boom, clouds blow mm. away, and the sun comes out, and you're like, oh shit, now it's super hot and insanely humid, right on schedule. What? What? Yeah. Um, yeah, what, what, this what, this finale. What? You got all kinds of things being built up here. You got you got all these characters coming to barracks. They're, they're doing the thing. They're like, oh, this is everyone's coming in to get Cassian. He's a bastard. We got to stop him from being alive. Bastard. Um, or in some cases, just want to give him a cuddle or something. I don't know. Um. Anyway, this this one's a little tougher in terms of like trying to break it up in terms of. POVs, it's mainly a single plot line, kind of. So, um, do our best. Yes. Talk about it in that direction. Uh, so, got transport guy is telling a bigger friend guy about how he contacted Andor, and, and he happens to be overheard by guy who wanted money off Andor. True. It's kind of like a starting point, and I was just like, eh, that's a little bit disappointing, yeah. but all right. Just, uh, you know, you're going to want to keep the information that you heard from Cassian fucking quiet, especially when you're occupied this hard by the ISB. Yes. Don't just be talking about it randomly so that people can hear. That's a really bad idea, because you might have a repercussion of that person telling on you, which is what happens. Everyone. Yeah, everyone yeah. shut the fuck up. Um, hey, let's go home before we talk about this very important yes. thing no one should know about. <laughs> yeah, or let's just speak quieter. Mm-hmm. He's, to the point where he goes, hey, what are you guys voices. whispering about? And you go, nothing. Nothing? Not, not nothing. What are Come you whispering on. about? I don't even know how to whisper. Um, uh, Bix uh, is Bix. fully destroyed and ready as, as bait, I think is the idea. Uh, or potential <clears> bait. <throat> and that uh, Deidre decides she's going to take a walk around the town to get familiar. And uh, we get into cutting of little things of um, good old, I forget his name. It was something it was like two A's in his name, but the guy who was killed who gave up Bix ah. in the first place. Um, his son is crafting something, and we discover it's essentially a pipe bomb. Um, yeah, you could tell it's a pipe bomb. A sci fi pipe bomb, space pipe bomb. Uh, and yeah, and we find out that Krieger was annihilated along with his entire crew, and Deidre's actually annoyed at this. She's like, why the fuck didn't you capture any of them? And if they really were 30 or 50 plus men, um, you'd think at least one of them would have made it, but uh, apparently it was like designed to be a wipeout from Padagaz, and he said it's what the Emperor would have wanted. Like He says that the idea is to wipe the taste of Aldani out of the Emperor's mouth. I think the idea is to just report that as a great victory, and that... Um, Essentially blame Krieger's men on Aldani, I guess. Um, or blame Aldani on Krieger's men. But he says, or yeah, at least uh, make sure that, you know, we're, we're hitting them back very hard for Aldani. Yes. And 
that he says uh, you just got to find Axis. Got to do. Yeah. Then we get a scene, an interesting scene, you might say. Yeah. It Lord begins up. with uh, little, little Mon sitting in a little car with a little driver. And, and then a little husband gets in and he's like, hello, little wife. And she says, you're gambling again? Like, what? No. Allegedly. And then she says, I've been shamed enough. Can you not live without a fucking casino? Like, fine, just do it in Canto Bite. Then he's like, seriously, what the hell? Someone's lying to you. And then she's like, oh, on that we can agree. Like, what the fuck? What's going on? Gaslighting me. Um, the scene itself may come across as a little bit weird to a lot of people, but it's very deliberate. And there's lots of, uh, in it that's super interesting. First of all, she's talked throughout the season about how she's being surveilled, primarily, possibly, by her driver New having been driver. replaced. Yeah. Uh -huh. This scene, she opens by saying, hey, you mind giving us some privacy? And he presses a button so that he can't hear, quote-unquote. But we already know that she believes that he's hearing no matter what. Yeah. So uh, she obviously then wanted him to hear all of this. Why might that be? Well, if she can tell that her husband has been gambling and he's been doing it under the radar to the point where he's lying to her about it, quote-unquote, then maybe that can help explain the missing numbers in her accounts. Oh, that is very likely what she is up to. And if she can further sell that he is doing sort of dubious things, it might just get more attention on him than her, and she can sneak away with mm -hmm. doing all kinds of things while he has to suffer for it. Uh, she clearly doesn't like him, but she doesn't care how much he's going to suffer as a result of this. He lives quite a cushioned life anyway. Mm -hmm. but, um, this is one of the first sort of subversive Game of Thronesy things that I think she does, and I think that's probably going to be a role going forward in the rest of the show. Seems to be fitting in with the theme of this show that in order to achieve larger good things, you might have to get your hands dirty along the way. Yeah. Can you? And I heard a theory. Talk to Rags about this because I don't know if it's true. Yeah. It's kind of hard to necessarily spot, and there's probably little exceptions here and there, but. She, uh, at the beginning of the scene, she opens up her collar from being tight to open. Uh, get yourself mm -hmm. a little bit more breathing room, I suppose. And I saw someone say this, and it wasn't said as a theory. It was said as a fact. So, I, again, I was like, maybe it is just verifiable. But apparently, all of the rebel characters, or the ones that are very much in subversion sort of elements to the Empire, are wearing open-collared shirts of all different kinds. They're always opened up. But then all of the Empire affiliated characters, or even ones presumably that are under the Empire's thumb in some way, shape, or form, or in a significant way, they all have closed up collars, tight, mm. all different circumstances. And she begins this scene by opening it up as if to imply this is the first big subversive move she's doing of oh. her own will. Uh, Interesting. Not sure how much credence there is to that as a theory. Like I said, I'd have to check back, but I find it would be super cool if it were true. Yeah, it would be neat. Um, I always like shit but Yeah, like that. I, I have no idea. I did not pay attention to that stuff. Wow, loser. You didn't either. Shut up. Uh, uh. Uh, we even see um, good old Cyril and Linus arriving, and uh, uh, Luthen is there as well. And he says, basically, the plan is that the bad guys will find Cassian, and then we will kill him. So, Cass is just, he's having a great time. Having a great time. Everybody is obsessed with him and either wants to kill him or grab him for whatever reasons. Going great mm -hmm. for him. Um, he has a little flashback. He remembers his dad who says to him while cleaning up some old parts that the man who sees everything is more blessed than cursed. They'd rather sell you new ones of these, but if you fix up the old ones, they're worth like 500 credits just sitting around. Eyes open, possibilities everywhere. I think the idea underneath the rust, he says. Yeah, his um his dad instilled in him a long time ago that you need to pay attention to everything. There's a lot more under the surface that you can easily miss. Which is obviously gonna be the Empire's failing, is that they can't quite make out what is going on. You pass the surface, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um and then we have a big old sequence. I think it's just to build up the finale where he's listening to the manifesto. It's being read out as like a voice recordery thing. He was given back in uh, episode six. 
and it's uh, it's Nemec saying freedom occurs spontaneously. There are battalions already enlisted galaxy wide, and even the smallest actions push the war forward. Tyranny requires constant effort. It leaks. It breaks. The day will come when these moments of defiance will flood the Empire's authority. One single thing will break the siege. Uh, mm. I mean, it's, it's got to be mentioned. What do you think he's talking about? And this is part of why I find there is value to this show in its existence. It's justified its existence more than anything else that Disney Star Wars have come out with. Easily. That speech, uh, that, that point of view, is trying to describe how the Empire will eventually be destroyed. And I quite like that he says tyranny requires constant effort. Like, you, it's not easy to be tyrannical in terms of just controlling fucking everything when everyone... You've got so many different sectors in which it can break, you just need people to have the willpower to do it. And what was said earlier about these different acts of rebellion encourage more and influence more and inspire more... Um, and, and that's when he said freedom occurs spontaneously. Like, it's it's almost happening without necessarily being uh, constructed and organized. Meanwhile, tyranny requires that. You need full-on systems with many working parts constantly doing high effort. Sort mm -hmm. of, uh, different things, right? The prison was an example of a lower effort form of it because of how they managed to crack a system, but even that fell the fuck apart. Um, and so, yeah... One single thing can break the siege and can flood the empire. And it's like, what could he possibly be referring to? An action that counts as almost just one. Maybe one one shooting of proton torpedoes into a particular location. Mm -hmm. Something, I don't know. Just, uh, it's really cool, right? Because this whole show is going to build up to Rogue One and that's going to build up to A New Hope. That's how that works. Yes. Uh, it's cool to get to a point where you've described and explained uh, a tyrannical sort of fascistic government that's closing further and further its grip around these this innocent populace that are getting further and further punished for things they don't deserve it's cool that you can get me to the point where i'm almost once again back in the position of like yeah good guys beat the bad guys mm -hmm. um while recognizing <clears throat> there's nuances in all parts of it uh it's just that this yes. has come to happen the way that it is and now i want freedom for the for the galaxy because the first order are jokes like in in, in in the sequel <laughs> trilogy, they're so stupid. Like it, it's it's such an absurd little collection of idiots. When it's it's just like a trying to fast track getting back to what they had in in the OT. Meanwhile, Andor has like worked its ass off to justify how you can actually have tyrannical results from a system that involves real people trying to make real decisions about you know, law and order. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's it's night and day in terms of earning what they're going for. But Star Destroyers, lots of them, up. Yeah, you know, did we talk about this earlier? Um, I, I forget it was so long ago. Um, after the Aldani uh, heist gets pulled out, and we see the Star Destroyer come in, uh, above, and it actually feels like it's got a lot of like it's like a real oh shit moment. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, it's in the sense it right. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. She's, she's I, making her way, uh, making her way to I don't know wherever she gets off the planet. I guess. Yeah. After uh, when she's still on her way out and she's on the planet after the heist gets pulled off, um, mm -hmm. because the uh, because the empire is really starting to crack down, and of course this is ground zero for you know things going down. Uh, you see this star destroyer come in, uh, flying relatively low in the atmosphere, and it goes over her head. And you get that sense of, oh, man, things are going down. The Empire oh, yeah. is not messing around, which is what it should have. Whenever yep. a Star Destroyer shows up, whenever one gets sent to your planet or you see one, you know that this is serious. You can't mess around. This actually yeah. means something. This isn't Disney, Star Wars, you know, the typical stuff where it just doesn't matter. Like, you could have hordes and hordes mm -hmm. of stormtroopers, but they're just worthless and competent buffoons, yeah. and you could do whatever you want with them, and they're not a threat. I'm Here gonna, they clearly are. I'm just gonna land in this Star Destroyer and then get someone out and then leave, and it's all yeah. no problem. I hate it when there's repercussionless fucking events like that. Um, when you're building small scale, it's much more freeing almost to create repercussions because it's a, it's almost like it's a description of itself. Like Adol could get away with some of this stuff because it's so much smaller scale and nobody's paying that much attention to it in terms of its weighted position in the Star Wars IP. Like, uh, you know, everyone's looking at Kenobi. Fucking mess. 
ad doors managed to smuggle in good writing. How did it do that? Yeah. Incredible. How did it they? Um, but yeah, uh, the friend gives him a message from his mum before she died saying none of this is his fault. He knows everything he needs to know and he's felt everything he needs to feel. And when those come together, he'll be unstoppable. Uh, I love him more than anything he could ever do wrong. Yeah, it's like, aw. Yeah. Like a mother would. Stop making me feel, media. I already had enough of this this year. Oh, I had another big <laughs> feely moment when they start start up the sort of funeral song. They, they're playing it and stuff, and then it just shows Bix listening to it while crying. Mm. Like, damn. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost like a, a reprieve for her, being in that cell, not having any, like, actually interesting or fun things to do like listening to a song that represents like someone's died and yeah. listening to yeah especially because her you know torture is sound related yeah a, a nice fucking sound um so yeah everything's coming together there's a big event that's about to pass and uh everyone we know from basically the whole show is about to start up but uh the big thing is Marva recorded a message part of her funeral to play. Yeah. And of course the Empire were allowing all of this to happen as part of a sort of bait. So they will allow this too, but as the speech goes on you can tell they were like, oh fuck. <laughs> this oh, is not a speech much. we want to play. I don't think she's going to say anything nice about us. Um, and yeah, the speech is absolutely excellent. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it is absolutely. Super awesome to listen to and it feels super honest as well. Um, you basically, well, I guess I'll just read a lot of it. Um, sure. She says, where you stand now, I've been more times than I can remember. I've always wanted to be lifted. I've always wanted to be eager. I've always wanted to be inspired. I remember every time it happened, every time the dead lifted me with their truth, and now I'm dead, and I yearn to lift you. Not because I want to shine or even be remembered. It's because I want to, uh, you to go on. I want Ferrix to continue. My waning hours, that's what comforts me most. But I fear for you. We've been sleeping. We've had each other and Ferrix, our work, our days. We've had each other and they've left us alone. We've kept the trade lanes open. And they've left us alone. We took their money and ignored them. We kept their engines churning. And the moment they pulled away, we forget them. Because we had each other. We had Ferrix. But we're sleeping. I've been sleeping and I've been turning away from the truth I wanted to not, uh, not to face. There is a wound that won't heal at the center of the galaxy. There is a darkness reaching like rust into everything around us. We let it grow, and now it's here. It's here, and it's not visiting anymore. It wants to stay. The Empire is a disease that thrives in darkness, and it is never more alive than when we sleep. It's easy for the dead to tell you to fight, and maybe it's true. Maybe fighting's useless. Perhaps it's too late, but I'll tell you this, if I could do it again, I'd wake up early and be fighting these bastards from the start. Fight the Empire. Um, yep. It's obviously her last gasp, but actually inspiring people. Part of what happens to her in this season is that she gets injured, and that's why the doctors are the into her. And she got injured because she was trying to open a passageway that she said... If they can figure it out, it could be a way for people to sneak in and out to subvert, like, the Empire people mm -hmm. here. And she literally, apparently, was trying to just open it, fucking fell over and hurt herself significantly. So, like, she's desperate to make a difference, but she's just too old. Like, yeah. lost the chance to do so, and that's obviously weighed heavily on her. Um, and so then, she knows that she's almost being kept alive as bait to get her son, basically. So I wonder if she denied the medication on purpose as to basically die right. and to use her death as a way to send this message out to everybody to prevent herself from being used as a way to capture her own son. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly if that's what they're going for, but it's uh, especially sad if it is. Yeah. And um, yeah, the actress did an excellent job. I love the speech. Yeah, it was good. Sh I good agree. Shit. Absolutely. Uh Super inspirational, and uh, I just, yeah, referring to the Empire as a rust that's spreading into everything. Yeah. Uh, it's a wound at the center of the galaxy. It's great stuff. 
Really is. And uh, you can tell, like I said, everyone's here for different reasons, but Luthen is clearly moved by this speech as well. He's just like, who the fuck yeah. is this lady? <laughs> like, this is <laughs> good shit. Yeah, of um, course, the, 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 the Empire dude, he's, he's not happy about no, that speech. Oh, he's like, shut the fuck up! He gets his grabs his coat, I think, and then just kind of puts it over over B two, and then Doesn't just quite goes like it. fight the empire, it, um, and then he just yeets over B two. Kicks him over. What a dick! Which and is clearly people, why Chungus man got angry. He's like, "You fucking nobody the like that. Nobody like that." He just, be, I think he he just knocks like three of them out with with her stone, <laughs> which is. Uh, quite ironic, yeah. I guess. Uh, yeah, she finally, you know, she got to hurt the Empire. <laughs> she got to hurt the Empire. That was kind of cool. Yeah, like, he just hits three of them with a brick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why the fuck and... not? They're well-made yeah, bricks, apparently. Yeah, that's... <laughs> he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was hitting them with. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, all, all hell breaks loose. People are swarming the Empire people, and he's like, Ah, oh, formation, duh! And, and that kid throws his pipe chaos. bomb. He sure does. And man, it has an effect. There's something I liked about it, kind of. I, this is going to sound disjointed in terms of liking it, but uh, one of the Ferex members kind of sells him out. He he tries to get the location of uh, Cassian given into the Empire in exchange for money, and even says, give me double the reward and get me off this planet. Yeah. He knows that he's fucked if he does this. He's curious about what's happening, and he's next to a window, looking out, seeing what's going on. The pipe bomb goes off, explodes, breaks the whole glass, and smashes into his face. And we, the next we see him, there's just blood all over his face, and he's on the Yeah, he did. I just felt like it was a good repercussion. If you're right next to a window, it explodes, you're probably dead. You can get seriously oh, hurt, yeah. Yeah, or you'll, you'll, you're, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And the explosion itself wasn't that far away as well, so you got a good, good chunk of force there still left over. Mm -hmm. Even if it goes through a window, because of course it propels all the glass in your face, and that's not a good time. Yeah, um, the guy who sorted out the transport stuff in Ferex, he, uh, he casually gets killed in the middle of the fight. A right, lot yeah. of people get killed. It's, uh, it's pretty yeah, rough. Because at some point the guy just says, "Open fire, fire it well," yeah, and yeah. the troopers just start blasting the the civilians. It's like, ooh. It's uh, it's kind of unfortunate, but the reality is they're not going to win this. Um, no, they're going to do the little rebellion and it's going to die. But of course, word will spread, and this yeah. is going to generate some extra bits and bobs that are going to happen. But while it's happening, uh, Cassian rescues Bix, and they even have uh, the fucking the bell ringing guy. He's he's going at it, and <laughs> it's just the one of the dudes is like, stop him <laughs> from ringing the bell. And he, he goes up there, and it's, just, it's such comedic timing. He's like, he just comes up there that Stormtrooper does, and he just immediately kicks him off the tower, and yeah. he falls down. Uh, I had a laugh. It's almost like that. I, I think like, they just wanted oh. to give the bell ringer a moment, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of great. As if ringing the bell wasn't cool enough. Exactly. Just kicks him right off. He's, He's calling like, yeah. it a bell. It's like a metal table. No. Um, something that I noticed, and I'm not sure what to make of it exactly, but Sinta was quite aware of the guy, the main dude who was keeping an eye on um, <clears throat> Marva and that whole sort of situation. And it looks to be like so. Th those two cross paths a little bit because she she poses as a. I think she actually like, gets a job at the local area so that she can yeah. get on it all as well. Works in a bar or something. Yeah. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looked like she wanted the guy to find her. So that he would be like, you, I know you, like, what are you doing here? And then she drags him just out of the way, and then she kills him. Yeah, yeah. she pulls out a knife was that, stabs him. Was that all on purpose? Did she just want to make it, like, did she uh, I don't allow know. herself to be seen by him? It was kind of weird. I thought the same thing. It's like, oh, you killed him. Well, but I mean, it's okay. not exactly out of character, right? Like the, it, It's not, but I can I, believe I, that I she basically just fucking hated that guy. It's her ability to execute that plan, because yeah. he has yeah. to be the one specifically to see her, and then follow her, and yeah i wasn't sure i wasn't because she's following him is it that she's waiting for him to turn around because he eventually does right and then she's like oh no you've got me and then weird. uh and then she uh, kills him i like my initial impression was that she just wanted to kill this guy yeah i think so because she figures out he's like a spy or something 
So now she wants to kill him. Well, it's also just that, remember, she's, be her. she's the Stone Cold character, basically. We get little yeah, on her, yeah. but it's pretty clear that she's just, she's like a rebellion zealot. She'll kill anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, once, once the explosion's gone off, the Empire's just unloading and loads of people be getting shot. They even show, like, just some old lady gets shot. It's just like, ugh. Yeah, it's rough. They're all going rough. down. Um, and then Deirdre gets grabbed, pushed, and punched, and dragged through the mud, and she even starts cr like trying to claw at it, and it's, for a moment, quite satisfying, because she's such a horrible bitch. But, like, yeah, die! Die! <laughs> um, uh, it's obviously very deliberate, right? She spent the whole season sort of climbing in power and getting more and more control and mm -hmm. intimidation, and then while she's trying to shoot people, she gets a fucking rock thrown at her head, and then everyone's just crawling all over, and she's terrified. That's the kind it's of shit you want to see because it, it, yeah, it really helps sort of let you know that what's beneath a lot of the more intimidating and horrible sides of like government's yeah. gone wrong. I did laugh at her face though. She makes a very funny expression when she falls over. Just, I don't know. He goes like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> ow, my head. Yeah, as um, as this all happening, we get logistically. A little bit weird. Uh, Cyril obviously wants to save her. He likes her. Thinks she's doing a good job. She mm -hmm. looks like she's being grabbed by about eight people. And then Cyril yeah. grabs a gun that she had off the floor, puts it to her back, and then says, right, this way with me, and drags her off to safety. It feels like we, we missed something among all that. Yeah, kind of. She's like on the floor, and then we're standing up. Was there a scene in between? Or something? Or is it just in one go? I don't remember. It you looks strange. Back. It looks like they've collected yeah. her to do something horrible to her, like <laughs> tear her apart, I don't know, but it just gets weird. Like I said, there's a shot I'm pretty sure they show where like several people are grabbing her all at once. Oh yeah, they're like and piling up on her. I just don't know that you're going to be able to yeah. grab her yourself at that point. Doesn't look likely. Yeah. Um, but kind yeah, of he, he does. And what I appreciate about this is that uh, She's panicking and like completely overloaded, but he got her out of there when it feels like it could be an echo of what he went through in episode three. Mm -hmm. um, and he's more prepared for it this time, or he's doing better because it's not just him. He's, he's trying to take care of someone else, someone he cares about. So he's able to sort of get that, right. that, that gumption that he needed. And I guess it's pretty cool too, because this is her at the weakest and most vulnerable we've ever seen her. And she's absolutely terrified and he yeah. saved her. And this is probably going to make it now so that he's got a career again. Yeah, that's what I thought as well. That's going to uh, get him back in to some degree. <clears throat> Clearly, those two are going to work together going forward. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they set up some kind of weird romance thing between them two as well, because they're both kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, kind of crazy. That's one way to put it, yeah. Yeah, we'll see what happens with that. Um, Fucking crazy people. Then we get a really decently long shot of Luthen just... Looking at Phoenix, uh, Farrick, sorry, and and just listening to the screaming. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so lots of people discussing what this could mean in totality. I think there's loads of things going on at once. Being that, um, first of all, realizing how little control he actually has. Um, yeah. He thought yeah. he had all of that under his thumb, and he knew exactly what was going to happen. And yet, and something some that he had no random... fucking clue about happened. Yeah, some random kid going for his revenge. Almost probably, probably lost his life, one. and loads of people have actually lost their lives. Yeah. And it put a big fucking stink in his old plans, so it's just like, what the hell is happening? And yeah, it's a form but... of rebellion. After that speech he just had, that's what stoked all of it. Exactly. Kind of the thing he wants, but at the same time, he had no idea this was even a thing. Yeah, um, that's, not, that's not how he planned to do it, but it happened. But then, of course... Because his whole, his whole plan here was to kill Andor. Yeah. Didn't even plan to do anything crazy rebellious here. But it happened here, so, yeah. But yeah, it also just goes far as saying it's clear that uh, it's getting to him a little bit, having that many people die in front of him. You listen to all the mm -hmm. screaming, this is what it costs. It's a... Yeah, is there a like saying... it. I can't remember who said it. It could be fucking Stalin or something, right? Isn't is it the... um, what One person dying is like a death when it's like a thousand it's a statistic. Single death. A single death is yeah. a tragedy. You know, a million deaths is a statistic, essentially. Yeah, being that Luthen deals... At a distance and in numbers and reports, this is the first time probably, you know, I imagine possibly ever that he's ever had people die right in front of him as a result of rebellion actions and stuff. Uh, so you Very got possibly, yeah. 
how much that is likely affecting him combined with his lack of control and understanding of the situation combined with the utter shock that yes this world is actually possibly more ready for rebellion than you even realized mm -hmm. uh, a lot can be conveyed in a face I just I, I like that they let us think about it it's good stuff um yeah we see that uh Mon Mothma is is setting up the daughter to meet the 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 son so that's going ahead and um we have our uh uh Linus is having a little drink probably deciding what he's going to do next I imagine we'll see him in season 2 mm -hmm. and our team being uh Bix the son that threw the pipe bomb the Big old Chungus friend and B2 are all on the ship uh, about to escape because, of course, they're all in big trouble. Pretty much everyone here is in big trouble. And Cassian says, you know, tells him where to go and where you'll you'll find him again, but he's going to go to Luthen. He does. And uh, he basically says to Luthen, kill me or let me join because yeah. I'm, I'm in rebellion happening. I'm doing it. And that's, uh, I guess, closing out, that's what this season was all about, was how did Andor no, go man. from a guy who just wanted to survive to someone who's a diehard rebellion person? Yeah. And all it really took was him seeing enough people suffer. Including himself. And uh, that's Andor, season one. Yeah. What a show. Uh, what a tale. What a, what a story with so many... I, I think I'd said... That it was kind of like um, it felt very Game of Thronesy. There's all these, you know, there's, you know, consequences for what people do. Um, there's a lot of people, you know, talking and acting well. Different personalities, people trying to get different things. Um, so in a sense, it kind of reminded me of that. It had that kind of vibe to it, and it just felt so weird that I was watching a Star Wars show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is this is completely out of left field. This is not at all what I was expecting. Uh, to be honest with you, I feel really of... bad that I gave it such a unfair treatment. Almost. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it. I kind of did too. I, uh, yeah. I don't blame anybody for any of this. There's a serious problem with uh, Disney and their allocation of resources. They yeah. are absolute idiots in terms of how they're constructing their stories, and it's so bad that even the one good story they fucking made got like scuttled because nobody cared. Like it was yeah. it's just like. I... I watched five episodes and I was just not getting into it. That's probably because I watched all these other shows and was just like, uh, I don't know. I mean, Didn't really concentrate on it, I guess. I don't know. I just definitely... There's so little discussion on this. Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's insane. The the tw I remember hearing like when the first three were out, I think we all tried to watch them. And then it felt to me like two weeks later, the whole season was out. It's like, no, it's just that I just, I've just been busy. I didn't even know this was happening. And... Like I said, so little discussion. It's absolutely fucking ridiculous. But you know what? We're not even done yet. I just oh remembered. Uh, if you guys... Oh, the after credits thing. Oh, the end credits scene, right. Yeah. yeah, if you want to go to... You all have the finale episode, yes? Uh, oh, yeah, I do. Three, let me... One uh, second. Let me oh, second Jesus. Here. The yawning. It's getting real. Yawning is real. Real. Real yawning. Hmm. You can go to 5328. Please and thank you. One second. Eh. Get out of the way, Disclorms. Whoa. Uh, oh, VLC has a little Santa hat on now. Ah, cute. Uh, was it 53 what? 5328. Are ye both there? I am. 27, 28. Alrighty. 3, 2, 1, play. Da! Well, why don't you give that a little look see? Looks like. Oh, the components! Oh! We know them, so what's going on here? Oh, oh schnitzel. Is the, this is the shield on the planet? Or White? first parts of the Death Star, I reckon. Oh, it's go. the Death yep. Star. Oh yeah, my go. god. How? Oh shit, there's already a lot of Death Star here. How fucking cool is the idea nice. Andor was building the parts of the machine that's going to kill him? Oh no. 
Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> it is awesome. It's really like, cool. Like I said, as a reveal, normally it would suck. We'd just be like, whatever, fine, the death stuff. But after that season, it's like, no, because strip away all the bullshit that Star Wars became. That's a pretty awesome payoff. This whole season is about raising that rebellion just to be enough yeah. to actually make a difference. And meanwhile, what are the Empire doing? Constructing a thing that will end rebellions. Damn. Also, man, Jesus Christ. You know, you can imagine how many of those have been built. I was just thinking about how uh, how impactful that would even be as well, without any knowledge of any other Star Wars outside of this season. Mm. Imagine that it's ending. Like, You'd be like, what, what the fuck is that? It's like, holy shit, what's that? You know, like the Empire is building something <clears throat> that will make it so that you're not going to be able to do shit. So, holy shit, the fucking Death Star looks crisp. <laughs> like, it just looks awesome. Uh, and yeah, I just think it's a really fucking great little payoff that a core component of a seriously large part of the laser portion of it is those little yeah. things they were making. Good shit. Yeah, I think it's really neat. Good shit. Uh, yeah. But yes. Big old re Asian recommend. And or, uh, I do indeed recommend, yes. Um, yeah. I don't know what's going to happen with Star Wars going forward. We did that preamble at the beginning for a good reason. Like, it's 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 mm -hmm. a disastrous journey that now has this little thing in it. It's like, wait, what is this? And the big problem is that um, everyone kind of hated Andor or didn't watch it. A lot of people will tell you it was boring as hell, and a lot of people didn't get past episode three. They gave it a chance up to that. I don't blame anybody for doing everything they want in terms of how much they watch, but the problem is, got to talk about what's going to happen as a result. Everyone watched and talked about Boba Fett and Kenobi. A lot of yeah. people said Kenobi was incredible and amazing. Barely anybody watched Andor, and that includes us, and uh, the, of the people who did even give it a chance said it was lame, badly paced, and they didn't really yeah. care, who cares. What does that say to, to Disney? It's like, oh, well, we should probably make more things like Kenobi, yeah. then, not like Andor. I'm actually was... upset now that we didn't watch it earlier and gave it a proper treatment. <laughs> well, to be fair, we have now completed full coverage of like all four of those TV shows within the same Absolutely, time frame. Absolutely, yeah. EFAP is it's rare that we're at that level of proficiency with covering things. We we tend to take a while, and we got other things to do, you know. So uh, yeah. it's just this one. This one was the one that lost out on those four. The other three got coverage first. Um, That's true. Yeah, but. You know, it could be like like Fringy said that they'll pay attention to critical acclaim and that Andal actually has a more enduring legacy than uh, Kenobi and stuff. I don't know. One can only hope. I think we're gonna go into Mando season three with a glimmer of like, could the oh, and it won't. It'll be shit. I'm sure of it. <laughs> so we're like, yeah. oh, what, what? Oh. almost certainly. It's it's made by the same exact fucking team that have been making the Bad Dose Season 1 and 2, and it's it's gonna rely it's got Baby Yoda back and it's already promised loads of cameos. It's like the same Ugh. shit. Mm. Always the same schnitzel. So yeah, we'll probably cover that and then I don't even know what the state of Star Wars is post that. I know that the the Ahsoka show is happening at some point. Oh um, good. That's gonna be a felony thing as well, I imagine. Uh, yeah, like I said, uh, Gilroy is the one that's making this. Please give him the freedom and power to make what he wanted to make over the three seasons. If that's the full story, please, I beg you, let me have it. And then, and that's it, fine. Tell the story. Can we at least have one complete story in Star Wars that isn't shit? Come on. Yeah. From Disney, please. of course, because they... It's like they refuse, and it would just suck if we had one solid season of uh, uh, Andor, and then the next two are like... I don't know shit, I guess. I'd really hope the that's not the, the mandated crap, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it'll be easy to tell. Please don't. Just give people time. Just give them time, please. <laughs> give them time. Um, but yes, uh, <sighs> I heartily recommend. I really love yeah. the dialogue. It hit me so fast in terms of the, the, the strength of these scripts. Um, yeah, I think that's something we already saw when we watched the first three episodes. Like, the dialogue yeah. was pretty solid throughout. We were getting something. We were being delivered things to think about. As we've gone over, there's so many quotes I like from this show that... Overall, obviously, what what is Andor doing as a show? And to me, it's just like, it's just making points about oppressive systems and how they affect everybody at different levels and what mm -hmm. one can do in response to them and how one can end up either supporting or being against them through no necessary fault of, like, a character flaw of their own. But uh, more so focused on 
uh, what they like can how you can be indoctrinated or how you can have a value that actually slots into it or um you know what's her name Deirdre she's trying to pursue a career that's why she's getting excessively uh almost venomous in in the way that she's conducting her job mm -hmm. but uh you have people at all these different levels even like Skeen right like a guy who took advantage of the aesthetic of being a rebellion person when really he just wanted money. I think that's a really interesting set of stories to tell. And you've got all these people at such different levels of, uh, like, someone in the Senate, someone who is just a shop owner but uh, probably has the most power among everybody in this rebellion isn't conducting the biggest uh, operations out of all of them. Yeah. And then people on the lowest levels, just your average guy who's like, I fucking, I'm an ex-stormtrooper who wants to help you out in this mission, then just gets shot during it. And it's like, that's just it. That's done. That's gone. Yep. All these lives that will be spent all to just hopefully get to that ending of we finally topple or at least cripple the Empire. And part of what I think frustrates me more and more thinking about it is the fact that this, if it's really good, will act as a great supporting piece to Rogue One and by extension the OT. Hell yeah. And it'll reach a point where you're like, thank fuck, we beat them. It's so great. The, 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 the Empire, they are down. They are gone. And then it's like, now what? And it's like, now it's the sequel trilogy. It's like, no, it's not. It ain't that shit. That's not what happened next. The dead speak. This show is trying to argue this like really grounded and realistic series of massive amounts of components that it takes to not only generate rebellions, but also topple empires. Meanwhile, like the sequel trilogy was just like, nah, they're just back. Fuck you. Back. Nothing matters. Nothing you did matter. They're just still there. You know what I mean? Like, imagine building up so hard all of this stuff to support the big, spontaneous, and spectacular events of the OT. And then it's just, just flip it, because fuck it. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a little bit annoying, but, you know, it doesn't mean we shouldn't advocate for hopefully having good stories. It's like, no, nah, just give up and make bad ones. I don't know. <laughs> but it's like, no, no, no. It's something. And, uh, like I said, I'm glad that you guys got a little bit obsessive and kept asking us to cover it because, you know, we were yeah. just waiting for that opportunity. It came up. Here it is. And uh... I had people telling me as well, it's it's really good. After I said, yes. I don't know, I'm not into it. I was like, I don't know, I just don't want to go back to it. <laughs> and then, and then like Ragnarok happened, all the other stuff. Well, now here we are. We watched it, and it's uh, it's really good. Yeah, very Thank glad you. that we uh, watched it and finished it. Yeah. Easily the best thing Disney have produced for Star Wars, and it's the best thing Star Wars has had in a long time, and we should hold on to this Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Easily, and it's not even close. Put Unfair. it in your little little nice box and put it on a shelf. Not look fair that this is the situation we're in, but yes, this is the situation we're in, and there's not much we can do yeah. about it. Um, so yes, check it out if you want to. If you've given up on Star Wars entirely, I don't exactly blame you. Um, Me neither. <laughs> but this is the thing. We are not hating on it for the fun of it, uh, Star Wars. It's stuff that we're really not enjoying, but this this one, as you can tell, uh, it surprised us, and then we committed, and we were like, holy shit, this is actually okay and good, and if not, at times, fucking great. Yes. Um, and that's, so to speak, the report, if you will, if that's what we do here. <laughs> it's like, we're just deciding to tell you the new Star Wars thing was actually not cringe. Let you know. Uh, yep. Can't promise that that's not going to be the case for the next thing, though. All I know is that Andor is going to keep going, at least for now. Hooray! Fingers crossed. Hope they get all the time and the money that they need. And on that note, I suppose, well, is there anything else you guys wanted to say about Andor? Oh, nothing that's already been said, I don't yeah. think. I really liked it. A great cast of characters, awesome acting, a really impressive budget that just... um. Yeah, that makes the whole thing look incredible. Easily the best Star Wars we've had in ages, decades. Agreed. Hope it does yes. well. Hope um, it does well. It's uh, the only department that seems to be lacking a little bit is plotline uh, with connecting the bigger pieces. Yeah, the connecting tissue is really uh, weird. You get some tweaks in there, we could correct it up, and uh, I'd be more than happy to say, like, yeah, there's not much I would change at that point. It's pretty solid. I'd be curious to what, see what they do with season two. We're obviously leading into having a rebellion team forming, um, a much bigger one that probably going to do much more significant action. Uh, like I said, Mon Martha probably going to be doing more Game of Thrones shit. I imagine Luthen has got a big old clock on him. I can't imagine he's going to be able to live for too long. Mm -hmm. I'd like him to though. 
he's a he's my fave. I want him to do more things. Um, Damn right. And then, of course, the simultaneous concern, but also, you know, it could be cool, is involving more things that we recognize. I don't know if I trust Disney to do it, but, um, you know, you could start involving more. The thing is, Vader could show up at any moment. That's the thing. You wonder if they're going to... There's always that voice at the mm -hmm. back of your head that's like, man, the, what, what if, like, he shows up? He could show up at any time. This what if he showed serious. up and it was good? What if he showed up and it was good? And, or if he showed up and it was really subtle? Like, he was in the background of something, or it was... I, I don't know. Or he, he was just sitting in silently on a meeting for the ISB or something like that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But what we do know so far is that you don't need all of those cameos in order to make a good show. Oh. That's the lesson. That is the lesson. It's getting to the point quickly that I'd love to see Partagaz and uh, Luthen have a discussion, you know? Can you imagine well-honed like moment where those two exchange their like or beliefs? Get something good going. And yeah, uh, it would be cool if Vader was used more as a force of nature that they have sectors they're operating in and they find out Vader's near one of them and they just want to avoid it. Something like that, but hey. Yeah. Who knows what we're going to get? What I know is that it's a very Merry Christmas today. Merry Crimbo. That's right. It is Christmas. I hope everyone, I guess by now it's to, it's been a while. It has. But who knows what they'll be doing. Seven and a half hours of Christmas. Uh, yeah, when you hear this, I'm probably drunk with friends in a bar. Yay. It's great. Um, I don't know what I'll be doing exactly. I think family fleems, they call it. Um, it will be for me. And like I said, it's for those out there who didn't have necessarily anywhere to go or anyone to talk to, they got themselves a whole chonker of an EFAP Christmas episode talking about Bonky. Star Wars of all things. It's funny, we had a lot of Star Wars episodes back in the day, and then it sort of broke up into not having many at all, because what we're we going to do? Talk about Kenobi? I don't think so. Ew. Um, but hey, Mando Season 3, that's the next stop. Ah, uh, buckle. It's not fair, is it? It's like... It's well, not fair. Did, no, it's I the roller coaster. And this Can we just talk down. about Ragnarok again? Nope. Okay. Instead. Nice. <laughs> um... Yeah, that's about that, I suppose. Thank you all for Hell tuning yeah. in. Uh, more fapping on the way, of course. We'll likely see you for New Year's Eve. Yeah, yeah. But until that time, you have yourselves a good morning, noon, or night. Do yeah, have a now. good Christmas all have, day. Have a good creme bye, bye, everyone. Merry Christmas. Goodbye. See you oh. later. Toodaloo. Crimbus, no.